Chapter One of Somehow Good. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Somehow Good by William Friend de Morgan. Chapter One A Returned Traveller, Nemesis in Livermore's Rents, 1808, Extravagance and No Cash, A Pawned Watch, and a residuum of fourpence. An exceptionally well-built man in a blue serge suit walked into a bank in the city, and handing his card across the counter, asked if credit had been wired for him from New York. The clerk to whom he spoke would inquire. As he leaned on the counter, waiting for the reply, his appearance was that of a man just off a sea voyage, wearing a suit of clothes well knocked about in a short time, but quite untainted by London dirt. His get-up conveyed no information about his social position or means. His garments had been made for him. That was all that could be said. That is something to know, but it leaves the question open whether the wearer is really only a person in decent circumstances, one decent circumstance at any rate, or a duke. The trustworthy young gentleman in spectacles, who came back from an authority in the bush to tell him that no credit had been wired so far, did not seem to find any difficulty in affecting confidence that the ultimate advent of this wire was an intrinsic certainty, like the post. Scarcely, perhaps, the respectable confidence he would have shown to a real silk hat, for the applicant's was mere soft felt, though it looked new for that matter, and a real clean shirt, one inclusive of its own collar and cuffs. Our friends answered this description, but then it was blue. However, the confidence would have wavered under an independent collar and wristbands. Cohesiveness in such a garment means that its wearer may be an original genius. Compositeness may mean that he has to economise, like us. "'Did you expect it so early as this?' says the trustworthy young gentleman, smiling sweetly through his spectacles. "'It isn't ten o'clock yet.' but he only says this to show his confidence, don't you see, because his remark is in its nature meaningless, as there is no time of day telegrams have a penchant for. No doubt there is a time, perhaps even times and half a time, when you cannot send them, but there is no time when they may not arrive, except the smallest hours of the morning, which are too small to count. I don't think I did, replied the applicant. I don't think I thought about it. I wired them yesterday from Liverpool, when I left the boat, say, four o'clock. Ah, then, of course, it's a little too early. It may not come till the afternoon. It depends on the load on the wires. Could you call in again, well, a little before our closing time? All right. The speaker took out a little purse, or pocket-book, and looked at it. I thought so, said he. That was my last card. But the clerk had left it in the inner sanctum. He would get it, and disappeared to do so. When he came back with it, however, he found its owner had gone, saying, never mind, it didn't matter. "'Chap seems in a great hurry,' said he to his neighbour clerk. "'What's he got that great big ring on his thumb for?' And the other replying, "'Don't you know em? Rheumatic rings?' He added, "'Doesn't look a rheumatic customer, anyhow.' And then both of them pinned up cheques and made double entries. The chap didn't seem in a great hurry as he sauntered away along Cornhill, looking in at the shop windows. He gave the idea of a chap with a fine June day before him in London, with a plethora of choices of what to do and where to go. Also of being keenly interested in everything, like a chap that had not been in London for a long time. After watching the action of a noiseless new petroleum engine longer than its monotonous idea of life seemed to warrant, he told a hansom to take him to the tower, for which service he paid a careless two shillings. The driver showed discipline, and concealed his emotions. He wasn't going to let out that it was a double fare, and impair a fountain of wealth for other charioteers to come. Not he. The fare enjoyed himself evidently at the tower. He saw everything he could be admitted to the Beecham Tower for sixpence, and the Jewel House for sixpence, and he gave uncalled-for gratuities. When he had thoroughly enjoyed all the dungeons, and all the torture relics, and all the memories of Harrison Ainsworth's romance, 
red in youth and never forgotten, he told another hansom to drive him across the tower bridge, and not go too fast. As he crossed the bridge he looked at his watch. It was half-past twelve. He would have time to get back before half-past one to a restaurant he had made a mental note of near the bank, and still allow the cabby to drive on a bit through the transpontine and interesting regions of Rotherhithe and Cherry Garden Pier. It was so unlike anything he had been seeing lately, none the worse for the latter, in some respects, so at least thought the fair, for he had the good or ill fortune to strike on a rich vein of so-called life in a London slum. Shrieks of fury, terror, pain were coming out of an archway that led, said an inscription, into Livermore's Rents, 1808. Public opinion, outside these rents, ascribed them to the fact that Salter had been drinking. He was on to that poor wife of his again, like last week. Half killed her, he did then, but he was a bad man to deal with, and public opinion wouldn't go down that court if I was you. But you're not, you see, said the fair, who had sought this information. You stop here, my lad, till I come back this to the cabman, who sees him not without misgivings about a source of income, plunge into the filthy and degrading throng that is filling the court, and elbow his way to the scene of excitement. "'He's all right,' said the cabby. "'I'll put a tenor on him any Sunday morning.' A figure of speech we cannot explain. From his elevation above the crowd he can see a good deal of what goes on, and guess the rest. Of what he hears, no phrase could be written without blanks few readers could fill in, and for the meaning of which no equivalent can even be hinted. The actual substance of the occurrence, that filters through the cries of panic of some woman or child, or both, in agony, the brutal bellowings and threats of a predominant drunken lout, presumably Mr. Salter, the incessant appeals to God and Christ by terrified women, and the rhetorical use of the names of both by the men, with the frequent suggestion that someone else should go for the police, this actual substance may be dryly stated thus. Mr. Salter, a plumber by trade, but at present out of work, had given way to ennui, and to relieve it had for two days past been beating and otherwise maltreating his daughter, aged fourteen, and had threatened the life of her mother for endeavouring to protect her. At the moment when he comes into this story, as a mere passing event we shall soon forget without regret, he is engaged in the fulfilment of a previous promise to his unhappy wife, a promise we cannot transcribe literally because of the free employment of a popular adjective, supposed to be a corruption of by our lady, before or after any part of speech whatever, as an expletive to drive home meaning to reluctant minds. It is an expression unwelcome on the drawing-room table, but, briefly, what Mr. Salter had so sworn to do was to twist off his wife's nose with his finger and thumb, and he did not seem unlikely to carry out this threat, as Livermore's tenantry lacked spirit or will to interpose, and did nothing but shriek in panic when feminine, and show discretion when masculine, mostly affecting indifference, and saying they weren't any good, them Salters. The result seemed likely to turn on whether the victim's back hair would endure the tension as a fulcrum, or would come ripping out like so much grass. "'Let go of her!' half bellows, half shrieks her legal possessor, in answer to a peremptory summons. "'Not for a swiney soap-eating apostle! Not for a rotten parson's egg like you! Not for a—' But the defiance is cut short by a blow like the kick of a horse that lands fairly on the eye socket with a cracking concussion that can be heard above the tumult, and is followed by a roar of delight from the male vermin, who sees all the joys before them of battle unshared and dangerless, the joys bystanders feel in foemen worthy of each other's steel, and open to be made the subject of wages. The fair rejects all offers to hold his coat, but throws his felt hat to a boy to hold. Self-elected seconds make a kind of show of getting a clear space. No idea of assisting in the suppression of a dangerous drunken savage seems to suggest itself, nothing but what is called seeing fair. This is, to wit, letting him loose on even terms on the only man who has had the courage to intervene between him and his victim. 
Let us charitably suppose that this is done in the hope that it means prompt and tremendous punishment before the arrival of the police. The cabman sees enough from his raised perch to justify his anticipating this with confidence. He can just distinguish in the crowd Mr. Salter's first rush for revenge and its consequences. He's got it, is his comment. Then he hears the voice of his fare ring out clear in a lull, such a one as often comes in the tense excitement of a fight. Give him a minute, now stick him up again. And then is aware that Mr. Salter has been replaced on his legs, and is trying to get at his antagonist, and cannot. He's playing with him, is his comment this time. But he does not play with him long, for a swift finale comes to the performance, perhaps consequent on a cry that heralds a policeman. It causes a splendid excitement in that cabman, who gets as high as he can to miss none of it. "'That's your sort!' he shouts, quite wild with delight. "'That's the style! Foller on! Foller on!' And then, subsiding into his seat, with intense satisfaction, "'Done his job, anyhow. Hope he'll be out of bed in a week.' this last with an insincere affectation of sympathy for the defeated combatant. The fair comes quickly along the court, and out of the entry, whose occupants the cabman flicks aside with his whip suggestively. "'Let the gentleman come, can't you?' he shouts at them. They let him come. "'Be off sharp,' he says to the cabby, who replies, "'Right you are, governor,' and is off, sharp. Only just in time to avoid three policemen, who dive into Livermore's rents, and possibly convey Mr. Salter to the nearest hospital. Of all that this story knows no more, Mr. Salter goes out of it. The fair, who seems very little decomposed, speaks through the little trap to his Jehu. "'I never got my new hat again,' he says. "'You must drive back. There won't be any decent hatter here.' "'Ask your pardon, sir. The bridge is histed. The vessel coming through.' string of vessels with a tugboat oh well get back to the bank anywhere the nearest way you can and after a mysterious short cut through narrow ways that recall old london some still paved with cobbles past lofty wharves or warehouses daring men lean from the floors up dizzy heights and capture bales for that seem afloat in the atmosphere till one detects the thread that holds them to their crane above under unexplained rialtos and over inexplicable iron incidents in paving that ring suddenly and waggle underfoot, the cab finds its way across London Bridge and back to a region where you can buy anything, from penny puzzles to shares in the power of Niagara, if you can pay for them. Our cab fare, when he called out, Hold hard here, opposite a promising hat shop, seemed to be in doubt of being able to pay for something very much cheaper than Niagara, he took out his purse, still sitting in the cab, and found in it only a sovereign, apparently. He felt in his pockets, nothing there beyond five shillings and some coppers. He could manage well enough, so his face and a slight nod seemed to say, till he went back to the bank after lunch. And so no doubt he would have done, had he been content with a common human billycock or bowler like the former one at four and six. But man is born to give way to temptation in shops. No doubt you have noticed the curious fact when you go into a shop you always spend more, more than you mean to, more than you want to, more than you've got, one or other of them, but always more. Inside the shop, Billy Cox in tissue paper came out of band boxes and then out of tissue paper. But short of eight shillings, they betrayed a plebeian nature and lacked charm. Now, those beautiful white real Panamas at twenty-two shillings were exactly the thing for this hot weather, especially the one the fair tried on. His rich brown hair that wanted cutting told well against the warm straw white. He looked handsome in it, with those strong cheekbones and bronzed throat Mr. Salter would have been so glad to get at. He paid for it, saying never mind the receipt, and then went out to pay the cabby, who respectfully hoped he didn't see him any the worse for that little affair over the water. None the worse, thank you. Shan't be sorry for lunch, though. Then, as he stands with three shillings in his hand, waiting for a recipient hand to come down from above, he adds, 
a very one-sided affair. Did you hear what he said about his daughter? That was why I finished him so thoroughly. No, sir, I did not hear it, but he was good for the gruel he's got, Lord bless you. Without that, I ask your pardon, sir, no, not from a gentleman like you. Couldn't think of it, couldn't think of it. And with a sudden whiplash and a curt hint to his horse, that cabman drove off, unpaid. The other took out a pencil and wrote the number of the cab on his blue wristband, close to a little red spot. Mr. Salter's blood, probably. When he had done this, he turned towards the restaurant he had taken note of. But he seemed embarrassed about finances, at least about the three shillings the cabby had refused, for he kept them in his hand as if he didn't know what to do with them. He walked on until he came to a hidden haven of silence some plane trees and a church were enjoying unmolested, and noticing there a box with a slot, and the word contributions on it, dropped the three shillings in without more ado, and passed on. But he had no intention of lunching on the small sum he had left. An inquiry of a city policeman guided him to a pawnbroker's shop. What would the pawnbroker lend him on that? His watch? Fifteen shillings would do quite well. That was his reply to an offer to advance that sum if he was going to leave the chain as well. It was worth more, but it would all be safe till he came for it, at any rate. "'You'll find it here any time up to twelve months,' said the pawnbroker, who also nodded after him knowingly as he left the shop. "'Coming back for it in a week, of course. All of them are. Name of Smith, as usual. Most of them are.' Yet this man's honouring Mr. Smith with a comment looked as if he thought him unlike most of them. He never indulged in reflections on the ruck, be sure of that. Mr. Smith, if that was his name, didn't seem uneasy. He found his way to his restaurant, and ordered a very good lunch and a bottle of Perrier Jouet. Not a half-bottle, he certainly was extravagant. He took his time over both, also a nap, then waking, felt for his watch, and remembered he had pawned it, looked at the clock, and stretched himself, and called for his bill, and paid it. Most likely the wire had come to the bank by now. Anyhow, there was no harm in walking round to see. If it wasn't there, he would go back to the hotel in Kensington, where he'd left his luggage, and come back to-morrow. It was a bore. Perhaps they would let him have a cheque-book, and save his having to come again. Much of this is surmise, but a good deal was the substance of remarks made in fragments of soliloquy. Their maker gave the waiter sixpence, and left the restaurant with three shillings in his pocket, lighting a cigar as he walked out into the street. He kept to the narrow ways and little courts, wondering at the odd corners time seems to have forgotten about, and changed to have deserted as unworthy of her notice. Every door of every house an extract from a commercial directory, mixed and made unalphabetical by the extractor. Every square foot of flooring wanted for negotiation to stand upon, and transactions to be carried out over. No room here for anything else, thought the smoker, as, after a quarter of an hour's saunter, he threw away the end of his cigar. But his conclusion was premature, for lo and behold, there, in a strange little wedge-shaped corner, of all things in the world, a barber's shop. Maybe a relic of the days of Ben Jonson, or earlier, how could a mere loafer tell? Anyhow, his hair wanted cutting sufficiently to give him an excuse to see the old place inside. He went in, and had his hair cut, but under special reservation not too much. The hairdresser was compliant, but said he regretfully, "'You do your head, sir, less than justice.' Its owner took his residuum of change from his pocket, and carelessly spent all but a few coppers on professional remuneration and a large bottle of eau de cologne. Perhaps the reflection that he could cab all the way back to the hotel had something to do with this easy-going way of courting an empty pocket. When he got to the bank, another young gentleman, with no spectacles this time, said he didn't know if any credit was wired. He was very preoccupied, pinning up cheques and initialling some important customer's paying in book, but he would inquire in a moment if you would wait, and did so, with no result, merely expression of abstract certainty that it was sure to come. There was still an hour, over an hour before closing time, said he to a bag with five pounds of silver in it, unsympathetically. If you could make it convenient to look in an hour, probably we should have received it. The person addressed but not looked at might do so, 
wouldn't commit himself, and went away. The question seemed to be how to while away that hour. Well, there was the Tuppany tube. At that time it was new, and an excitement. Our friend had exactly fourpence in his pocket. That would take him anywhere and back before the bank closed, and also he could put some of that eau de cologne on his face and hands. He had on him still a sense of the foulness of Livermore's rents, and wanted something to counteract it. Eau de cologne is a great sweetener. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of Somehow Good by William Friend de Morgan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter Two A Journey in the Tuppany Tube, A Very Nice Girl and a Negotiation, An Exposed Wire and an Electrocution. He took his fare in the Tuppany Tube. It was the last tuppence but one that he had in his pocket. Something fascinated him in the idea of commanding, in exchange for that tuppence, the power of alighting at any point between Cheapside and Shepherd's Bush. Which should it be? If he could only make up his mind to not alighting at Chancery Lane, he would have two whole minutes for consideration. If British Museum, he would have four. If Tottenham Court Road, six, and so on. For the time being, he was a sort of monarch, in a small way, over time and space. He would go on to the museum, at any rate. What little things life hangs on, sometimes. If he had foolishly got out at either Chancery Lane or British Museum, there either would have been no reason for writing this story, or, if written, it would have been quite different. For at the museum station a girl got into the carriage, and, passing him on her way to a central haven of rest, trod on his foot with severity. It hurt so palpably that the girl begged his pardon. She was a nice girl, and sorry. He forgave her because she was a nice girl, with beautiful rows of teeth and merry eyebrows. He might have forgiven her if she had been a dowdy, but he liked forgiving those teeth and those eyebrows. So when she sat down in the haven, close to his left shoulder, he wasn't sorry that his remark that he ought to beg her pardon, because it was all his fault for sticking out, overlapped her coming to anchor. If it had been got through quicker, the incident would have been regarded as closed. As it was, the fag end of it was unexhausted, and she didn't quite catch the whole. It was in no way unnatural that she should turn her head slightly and say, I beg your pardon. Absolute silence would have been almost discourteous, after plunging on to what might have been a bad corn. "'I only meant it was my fault for jamming up the whole gangway.' "'Oh, yes, but it was my fault all the same, for—for—' for... "'Yes, I, I beg your pardon, you were going to say for—' "'Well, I mean, for standing on it so long, then, if you'd called out. But, indeed, I didn't think it was a foot. I thought it was something in the electricity.' Two things were evident.' One, that it was perfectly impossible to be stiff and stodgy over it and not laugh out. The other, the obvious absurdity of imputing any sort of motive to the serene frankness and absolute candour of the speaker. Any sort of motive of that sort, he said to himself, without further analysis. He threw himself into the laugh, without attempting any. It disposed of the discussion of the subject, but left matters so that stolid silence would have been priggish. It seemed to him that not to say another word would almost have amounted to an insinuation against the eyebrows and the teeth. He would say one, a most impersonal one. Do they stop at Bond Street? Do you want to stop at Bond Street? Not at all, I don't care where I stop. I think I meant, is there a station at Bond Street? The station wasn't opened at first, but it's open now. What an irritating thing a conversation can be. Here was this one, just as one of its constituents was beginning to wish it to go on, must needs exhaust its subject and confess that artificial nourishment was needed to sustain it. And she, for it was she, not he, did you guess wrong, had begun to want to know, don't you see, why the man with the hair on the back of his browned hand and the big plain gold ring on his thumb did not care where he stopped. If he had had a holiday look about him, she might have concluded that he was seeing London, 
and then what could be more natural than to break loose, as it were, in the twopenny tube. But in spite of his leisurely look, he had not in the least the seeming of a holiday-maker. His clothes were not right for the part. What he was could not be guessed without a clue, and the conversation had collapsed, clearly. It was irritating to be gravelled for lack of matter, and he was such a perfect stranger. The girl was a reader of Shakespeare, but she certainly didn't see her way to Rosalind's little expedient. Even though my own name is Rosalind, she said to herself. It was the readiness and completeness with which the man dropped the subject and recoiled into himself that gave the girl courage to make an attempt to satisfy her curiosity. When a man harks back, palpably, on some preoccupation, after exchanging a laugh and an impersonal word or two with a girl who does not know him, it is the best confirmation possible of his previous good faith in seeming rather more father-like than man-like. Rosalind could risk it, surely. Very likely he has a daughter my age, she said to herself. Then she saw an opening, the thumb ring. Do pray excuse me for asking, but do you find it does good? My mother was recommended to try one. This ring? It hasn't done me any good, but then I have hardly anything the matter. I don't know about other people. I'm sorry I brought it now. It costs four and sixpence, I think. I would sooner have the four and sixpence, yes. <laughs> Decidedly, I would sooner have the four and sixpence. Can't you sell it? I don't believe I could get sixpence for it. Do please excuse me. I mean, excuse the liberty I take, but I should so much like to... to... To buy it for sixpence? Certainly, why not? Much better than paying four and six for a new one. Your mother may find it do her good. I don't care about it, and I really have nothing the matter. He drew the ring off his thumb, and Rosalind took it from him. She slipped it on her finger, over her glove. Naturally, it slipped off, a man's thumb ring. She passed it up inside the glove palm, through the little slot above the buttons. Then she got out her purse, and looked in to see what its resources were. "'I've only got half a crown,' said she. The man flushed slightly. Rosalind fancied he was angry, and had supposed she was offering beyond her bargain, which might have implied liberality or benevolence or something equally offensive, but it wasn't that at all. "'I have no change,' said he. "'Never mind about the sixpence. Send me stamps. I'll give you my card.' And then he recollected he had no card, and said so. "'It doesn't matter, being very exact,' said she. "'I have no money at all, except tuppence.' Rosalind hesitated. This man must be very hard up. Only he certainly did not give that impression. Still, no money at all except tuppence. Would it be safe to try and get the half-crown into his pocket? That was what she wanted to do, but felt she might easily blunder over it. If she was to achieve it, she must be quick, for the public within hearing was already feeling in its pocket in order to oblige with change for half-crown. She was quick. "'You send it me in stamps,' she said, pressing the coin on him. "'Take it, and I'll get my card for the address. "'It will be one and eleven exactly, because of the postage. "'It ought to be a penny for stationery, too. "'Oh, well, never mind, then.' "'She had got the card, and the man, demurring to the stationery suggestion, "'and, indeed, hesitating whether to take the coin at all, "'looked at the card with a little surprise on his face. "'He read it. "'Mrs. Nightingale?' Miss Rosalind Nightingale, Krakatoa, Glenmoira Road, Shepherd's Bush, West. "'I'm not Mrs. Nightingale,' said the girl. "'That's my mother.' "'Oh, no,' said he. It, "'It wasn't that. It's only that I knew the name once, years ago.' The link in the dialogue here was that she had thought the surprise was due to his crediting her with matrimony and a visiting card daughter. She was just thinking, could she legitimately inquire into the previous Nightingale, when he said some more of his own accord and saved her the trouble. "'Rosalind Nightingale was the name,' said he. "'Do you know any relation?' "'Only my mother,' answered the girl, surprised. "'She's Rosalind, too, like me. I mean, I'm Rosalind. I'm always called Sally, though.' The man was going to answer when, as luck would have it, the card slipped from his fingers and fluttered down. In pursuing it, he missed the half-crown which the young lady released, fancying he was about to take hold of it, and stooped to search for it where it had rolled under the seat. "'How idiotic of me!' said he. 
Next station, Uxbridge Road, thus the guard proclaimed, and then, seeing the explanation that was going on after the half-crown, he added, I should let it go at that, mister, if I was you. The man asked why. There was a party tried that game last week. He's in the hospital now. This was portentous and enigmatical. The guard continued. If a party gets electrocuted, it's no concern of the employees on the line. It lies between such parties and the company. I shouldn't myself if I was you, but it's between you and the company I wash my hands. If the wires are properly insulated, this was from an important elderly gentleman of a species invariable under the circumstances. If the wires are properly insulated, there is not the slightest cause for apprehension of any sort or kind. Very good, said the guard gloomily. Then all I say is, insulate em yourselves. Don't try to put it on me, or else keep your hands well outside of the circuit. But the elderly gentleman was not ready to acquiesce in the conditions pointed at. I repeat, said he, that the protection of the public is, or ought to be, amply secured by the terms of the company's charter. If any loophole exists for the escape of the electric current, all I can say is the circumstances call for public inquiry. The safety of the public is the concern of the authorities. Then, said the guard pointedly, if I was the public, I should put my hands in my pocket and not go fishing about for ambiguous property in corners. There, what did I tell you? Now you'll say that was me, I suppose. The thing that hadn't been the guard was a sudden crackle that leapt out in a blue flame under the seat where the man's hand was exploring for the half-crown. It was either that, or another like it, at the man's heel, or both together. A little boy was intensely delighted and wanted more of the same sort. The elderly gentleman turned purple with indignation, and would at once complain to the authorities. They would take the matter up, he doubted not. It was a disgrace, etc., etc., etc. Rosalind, or Sally Nightingale, showed no alarm. Her merry eyebrows were as merry as ever, and her smile was as unconscious a frame to her pearly teeth as ever, when she turned to the mother of the delighted little boy and spoke. "'There, now, it's exactly like that when I comb my hair in very dry weather.' And the good woman was able to confirm this from her own experience, narrating, with needless details, the strange phenomena attendant on the head of a young person in quite a good situation at Woolhams's, and really almost a lady, stating several times what she had said to the young person, Miss Ada Taylor, and what answer she had received. She treated the matter entirely with reference to the bearings of the electric current on the questions of social status. But the man did not move, remaining always with his arm under the seat. Rosalind, or Sally, thought that he had run the half-crown home, but in some fixed corner from which detachment was for a moment difficult. Wondering why the moment should last so long, she spoke. "'Have you got it?' said she. But the man never spoke a word and remained quite still. End of chapter 2「Krakatoa Villa, and how the electrocuted traveller went there in a cab. A curious welcome to a perfect stranger. The stranger's label. A cancelled memory. Back like a bad shilling. » Krakatoa was a semi-detached villa, a few minutes' walk from Shepherd's Bush Station. It looked like a showily dressed wife of a shabby husband, for the semi-detached other villa next door had been standing to let for years, and its compo front was in a state of decomposition from past frosts, and its paint was parched and thin in the glare of the present June sun, and peeling and dripping spiritlessly from the closed shutters among the dead flies behind the cracked panes of glass that had quite forgotten the meaning of whitening and water, and that wouldn't hack out easy by reason of the putty having gone hard. One knew at a glance that if the turncock was to come see, and overcome the reluctance of the allotted cock to be turned, the water would burst out at every pore of the service pipes in that house, except the taps and would know also that the adept who came to soften their hearts and handles would have to go back for his tools, 
and would be a very long time away. Krakatoa, on the other hand, was resplendent with stone colour, and smelt strongly of it. And its door you could see through the glass of into the hall, when its shutters were not thumb-screwed up over the panes, was painted a green that staggered the reason, and smelt even more strongly than the stone colour. And all the paint was so thick that the beadings on the door were dim memories, and all the execution on the sculptured goblets on pedestals flanking the steps in the front garden was as good as spoiled and the paint simmered in the sun, and here and there it blistered, and altogether suggested that Krakatoa, like St. Nicholas, might have halved its coats with the beggar next door, given him, suppose, one flat and one round coat. Also that either the job had been hurried, and not given proper time to dry, or that the summer had come too soon, and we should pay for it later on, you see if we didn't. The coatless and woe-begone villa next door had almost lost its name, so faded was the lettering on the gate-post that was putting out its bell-handle to the passer-by, even as the patient puts out his tongue to the doctor. But experts in palimpsests, if they had penetrated the superscriptions in chalk and pencil of idle authorship, would have found that it was the retreat. Probably this would have been revealed, even if the texts had been merely bowdlerized with Indian rubber or a sponge, because there were a good many objectionable passages. But the retreat was a retreat, and smelt strong of the hermits, who were cats. Krakatoa was not a volcano, except so far as eruptions on the paint went, but then it had become Krakatoa through a mistake, for the four coats of paint at the end of the first seven years, as per agreement, having completely hidden the first name, Saratoga, and the builder's retention of it having been feeble, possibly even affected by newspaper posters, for it was not long after the date of the great eruption, the new name had crept in in the absence of those who would have corrected it, but had gone to Brighton to get out of the smell of the paint. When they returned, Mr. Pritchard, the builder, though shocked and hurt at the discovery that the wrong name had been put up, was strongly opposed to any correction or alteration, especially as it would always show if altered back. You couldn't make a job of it, not to say a proper job. Besides, the names were morally the same, and it was absurd to allow a variation in the letters to impose on our imagination. The two names had been applied to very different turns out abroad, certainly, but then they did all sorts of things abroad. If Saratoga, why not Krakatoa? Mr. Pritchard was entrenched in a stronghold of total ignorance of literary matters, and his position, that mere differences of words ought not to tell upon a healthy mind, was difficult to shake, especially as he had the coin of vantage. He had only to remain inanimate, and what could a presumably widow lady with one small daughter do against him? So at the end of the first seven years what had been Saratoga became Krakatoa and remained so. And it was in the back garden of the again newly painted villa seven years later that the lady of the house, who was watering the garden in the cool of the afternoon, asked her excited daughter, who had just come home in a cab, what on earth could have prompted her to do such a mad thing, such a perfectly insane thing. We shall see what it was immediately. "'Oh, Sally, Sally!' exclaimed the young person, still young and very handsome mother. "'What will the child do next?' "'Oh, Mamma, mamma! answered Sally, just on the edge of a burst of tears. "'What was I to do? What could I do? It was all my fault from the beginning. "'You know I couldn't leave him to be taken to the police station or the, or the hospital or—' "'Yes, of course you could. Why not? "'And not know what became of him or anything? "'Oh, mother! You silly child, why on earth couldn't you leave him to the railway people? "'And run away and leave him alone? "'Oh, mother!' "'But you don't even know his name. "'Mamma, dear, how should I know his name? "'Don't you see, it was just like this.' "'And then Miss Sally Nightingale repeats, "'briefly and rapidly, for the second time, "'the circumstances of her interview in the railway carriage "'and its tragic ending. "'Also, their sequel on the railway platform, "'with a partial recovery of the stunned or stupefied man, "'his inability to speak plainly, the unsuccessful search in his pockets for something to identify him, and the final decision to put him in a cab and take him to the workhouse infirmary, pending discovery of his identity. 
the end of her story has a note of relief in it. And it was then I saw Dr. Vereker on the platform. Oh, you saw Dr. Vereker? Of course I did, and he came with me. He's always so kind, you know, and he knew the station people, so... Where is he now? Outside in the cab. He stopped to see after the man. We couldn't both come away, so I came to tell you. You stupid chit, why couldn't you tell me at first there? Don't cry and be a goose. But Sally disclaims all intention of crying. Her mother discards the watering pot and an apron, and suppresses appearance of gardening, then goes quickly through the house, passes down the steps, between the scarlet geraniums in the overpainted goblets, through the gate on which Saratoga ought to be, and Krakatoa is, written, and finds a four-wheeled cab awaiting developments. One of its occupants alights and meets her on the pavement. A rapid colloquy ensues in undertones, ending in the slightly raised voice of the young man, who is clearly Dr. Vereker. Of course, you're perfectly right, perfectly right, but you'll have to make my peace with Miss Sally for me. A chit of a girl like that. Fancy a responsible man like you letting himself be twisted round the finger of a young monkey. But you men are all alike. Well, you know, really, what Miss Sally said was quite true, that it was only a step out of the way to call here, and she had got this idea that it was all her fault. Was it? I can only go by what she says. The girl comes into the conversation through the gate. She may perhaps have stopped for a word or two with Cook and a house and parlour maid, who were deeply interested in the rear. "'It was my fault,' she said. "'If it hadn't been for me, it would never have happened. "'Do see how he is now, Dr. Vereker.' "'It is open to surmise that the first strong impulse of generosity, "'having died down under the corrective of a mother, "'our young lady is gradually seeing her way to interposing Dr. Vereker "'as a buffer between herself and the subject of the conversation, "'for she does not go to the cab door to look in at him. "'The doctor does.' The mother holds as aloof as possible, not to get entangled into any obligations. "'Get him away to the infirmary or the station at once,' she says. "'That's the best thing to be done. They'll take care of him till his friends come to claim him. Of course they'll come. They always do.' The doctor seems to share this confidence, or affects to do so. "'Sure to his friends or his servants,' says he. "'But he can't give any account of himself yet.' Of course, I don't know what he'll be able to do tomorrow morning. He resumes his place in the cab, beside its occupant, who, except for an entire want of animation, looks much like what he did in the railway carriage. The same strong-looking man, with well-marked cheekbones, very thick brown hair and bushy brows, a skin rather tanned, and a scar on the bridge of the nose. Very strong hands, with a tattoo mark showing on the wrist, and an abnormal crop of hair on the back, running on to the fingers, but flawed by a scar or two. Add to this the chief thing you would recollect him by, an Elizabethan beard, and you will have all the particulars about him that a navy blue serge suit with shirt to match allows to be seen of him. But you will have an impression that could you see his skin beyond the sun-mark limit on his hands and neck, you would find it also tattooed. Yet you would not at once conclude he was a sailor, Rather, your conclusion might go on other lines, but always assigning to him a rough, adventurous, outdoor life. When the doctor got into the cab and shut the door himself, he took too much for granted. He assumed the driver, without whom, if your horse has no ambition at all beyond tranquillity and an empty nose-bag, your condition is that of one camping out, or as one in a ship moored alongside in dock, the curbstone playing the part of the key. Boys will then accumulate and undervalue your appearance and belongings, and impossible persons with no previous or subsequent existence will endeavour to see their way to the establishment of a claim on you, and you will be rather grateful than otherwise that a policeman without active interests should accrue and communicate to them the virus of dispersal, however long its incubation may be. You will then probably do, as Dr. Vereker did, and resent the driver's disappearance. The boys, mysteriously in his, each other's, and the policeman's confidence, all to your exclusion, will be able to quicken his movements, and he will come trooping from the horizon, on or beyond which is somebody's entire. 
All this came to pass in due course, and the horse, deprived of his nose-bag, returned to his professional obligations. But it was a shabby horse, in a shabby cab, to which he imparted movement by falling forwards and saving himself just before he reached the ground. His reins were visibly made good with stout pack-thread, and he had a well-founded contempt for his whip, which seemed to come to an end too soon, and always to hit something wooden before it reached any sensitive part of his person. But he did get off at last, and showed that, as force is a mode of motion, so weakness is a mode of slowness, and one he took every advantage of. His mother and daughter stood looking after the vanished label, that stated that the complication of inefficiencies in front of it was one of twelve thousand and odd, pray heaven more competent ones, in the metropolis, and had nearly turned to go into the house, when the very much younger sister, that might have been, addressed the very much, but not impossibly, older one, thus. "'Mamma, he said he knew somebody of our name.' "'Well, Miss Fiddlestick?' with an implication of what of that, were there not plenty of nightingales in the world? Miss Sally is perceptive about this. Yes, but he said Rosalind. Where? He didn't say where, that's all he said. Rosalind. As the two stand together watching the retreating cab, we are able to see that our first impression of them, derived perhaps from their relative ages only, was an entirely false one, as far as size went. The daughter is nearly as tall as her mother, and may end by being as big a woman, when she has completely graduated, taken her degree, in womanhood. But for all that we, who have looked at both faces, know that when they turn round, we shall see on the shoulders of the one youth, inexperience, frankness, and expectation of things to come, on those of the other a head that keeps all the mere physical freshness of the twenties, if not quite the bloom of the teens but expressed heaven knows how, experience, reserve, and retrospect on things that have been once and are not, and that we have no right to assume to be any concern of ours. Equally true of all faces of forty, do we understand you to say? Well, we don't know about that. It was all very strong in this face. We can look again when they turn round, but they don't, for number twelve thousand and odd has come to a standstill and its energumenon has come down off its box, and is fiddling at something on the horse's head. So Cook says, evidently not impressed with that cab. The doctor looks out and confers, then gets out and comes back towards the house. The girl and her mother walk to meet him. Never saw such a four-wheeler in my life. The harness is tied up with string and the rein's broken. The idiot says that if he had a stout bit of whipcord he could make it square. No sooner have the words passed the doctor's lips and Miss Sally is off on a whipcord quest. "'I wish the child wouldn't always be in such a hurry,' says her mother. "'Now she won't know where to get it.' She calls out after her, ineffectually. The doctor suggests that he shall follow, with instructions. "'Yes, suppose he does. There is precisely the thing wanted in the left-hand drawer of the table in the hall. The drawer the handle comes off. This seems unpromising, but the doctor goes and transmission of messages ensues, heard within the house. Left alone, Mrs. Nightingale, the elder Rosalind, seems reflective. A funny thing, too, she says aloud to herself. She is thinking clearly of how this man in the cab, who can't give any account of himself, once knew a Rosalind Nightingale. Probably the handle has come off the drawer, for they are a long time over that string. Curiosity has time to work, and has so much effect that the lady seems to determine that, after all, she would like to see the man. Now that the cab is so far from the door, even if she spoke to him, she would not stand committed to anything. It is all settled, arranged, ratified, that he shall go to the police station, or the infirmary, or somewhere. When the string, and Dr. Vereker, and Sally the daughter come out of the house, both exclaim, and the surprise they express is that the mother of the latter should have walked all the way after the cab, and should be talking to the man in it. It is not consistent with her previous attitude. "'Now, isn't that like Mamma? says Sally. "'If so, why be so astonished at it?' is a question that suggests itself to her hearer. But self-confutation is not a disorder for his treatment. Besides, the doctor likes it in this case. 
His own surprise at Mamma's conduct is unqualified by any intimate acquaintance with her character. She may be in consistency itself, for anything he knows. Is she going to turn the cab around and bring him to the house after all? It looks like it. I'm so glad, Sally replies to the doctor. I hope you won't repent it in sackcloth and ashes. I shan't. Why do you think I shall? How do you know you won't? You'll see. Sally pinches her red lips tight over her two rows of pearls and nods confirmation. Her dark eyes look merry under the merry eyebrows, and the lip pinch makes a dimple on her chin, a dimple to remember her by. She's a taking young lady, there is no doubt of it. At least, the doctor has none. Yes, Sally, it's quite all right. Thus her mother, arriving a little ahead of the returning cab. Now don't dispute with me, child, but do just as I tell you. We'll have him in the breakfast-room, there's fewer steps. She seems to have made up her mind so completely that neither of the others interposes a word, but she replies, moved by a brain-wave, to a question that stirred in the doctor's mind. Oh, yes, he has spoken. He spoke to me just now. I'll tell you presently. Now let's get him out. No, never mind calling Cook. You take him on that side, doctor. That's right. And then the man, whose name we still do not know, found himself half supported, half standing alone, on the pavement in front of a little white eligible residence smelling of new paint. He did not in the least know what had happened. He had only a vague impression that if someone or something, he couldn't say what, would only give up hindering him, he would find something he was looking for. But how could he find it if he didn't know what it was? And that he was quite in the dark about. The half-crown, and the pretty girl who had given it to him, the train-guard and his cowardice about responsibility, the public-spirited gentleman, the railway carriage itself, to say nothing of all the exciting experiences of the morning, all, all had vanished, leaving behind only the trace of the impulse to search, nothing else. He stood looking bewildered, then spoke thickly. "'I am giving trouble,' said he. Then the two ladies and the gentleman, whom he saw dimly and did not know, looked at one another, each perhaps to see if one of the others would speak first. In the end the lady, who was a woman, nodded to the gentleman to speak. And then the lady, who was a girl, confirmed her, by what was little more than an intention to nod, not quite unmixed with a mischievous enjoyment at the devolution of the duty of speech on the gentleman. It twinkled in her closed lips. But the gentleman didn't seem overwhelmed with embarrassment. He spoke as if he was used to things. "'You've had an accident, sir, on the railway, in the Tuppany Tube? Yes, you'll remember all about it presently. Yes, I'm a doctor. Yes, we want you to come in and sit down and rest. till You're better. No, it won't be a long job. You'll soon come round. What? Oh, no, 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 no trouble at all. It's this lady's house, and she wants you to come in. The speaker seems to guess at the right meanings, as one guesses in the jaws of the telephone, perhaps with more confidence. But there was but little audible articulation on the other's part. He did not seem to want much support, chiefly guidance. He was taken down the half-dozen steps that flanked a grass slope down to a stone paving, and through a door under the more numerous steps he had escaped climbing, and into a breakfast-room flush with a kitchen, opening on a small garden at the back. There was the marriage of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert over the chimney-piece, and a tortoiseshell cat with a collar on the oilskin cover of a square table, who rose as though half resenting strange visitors, then, after stretching, decided on some haven less liable to disturbance, and went through the window to it without effort, emotion, or sound. There was a clock under a glass cover on the chimney-piece, whose works you could see through, with a fascinating ratchet movement of perfect grace and punctuality. Also, a vertical orange-yellow glass vase, twisted to a spiral and full of spills. Also, the leaning tower of Pisa, done small, in alabaster. He could see all these things quite plainly, and but that his tongue seemed to have struck work, he could have described them, but he could not make himself out, nor how and why he came to be there at all. Where ought he to have been, he asked himself, and to his horror he could not make that out either. Never mind, 
Patience was the word, clearly. Let him shut his eyes as he sat there in the little breakfast room, with the flies continually droning in the ceiling, and an especially large blue bottle busy by the window, who might just as easily have gone out and enjoyed the last hour of long evening in a glorious sunshine, but who mysteriously preferred to beat himself for ever against a closed pane of glass, a self-constituted prisoner between it and a gauze blind. Let him shut his eyes and try to think out what it all meant, what it was all about. All that he was perfectly certain of at that moment was that he was awake, with a contused pain all over, and very stiff left hand and foot, and that, knowing he had been insensible, he was striving hard to remember what something was that had happened just before he became insensible. He had nearly got it, once or twice. Yes, now he had got it, surely? Ah, oh, no, he hadn't. It was gone again. A mind that is struggling to remember some particular thing does not deal with other possibilities of oblivion. We all know the painful phenomenon of being perfectly aware what it is we are trying to remember, feeling constantly close to it, but always failing to grasp it. We know what it will sound like when we say it, what it will mean, where it was on the page we read it on. Oh dear, yes, quite plainly. The only thing we can't remember for the life of us is what it was. And while we are making stupendous efforts to recapture some such thing, does it ever occur to any of us to ask if we may not be mistaken in our tacit assumption that we are quite certain to remember everything else as soon as we try? That, in fact, it may be our memory faculty itself that is in fault, and that we are only failing to recall one thing, because at the moment it is that one sole thing and no other that we are trying our brains against. It was so in the pause of a few minutes in which this man we write of, left to himself and the ticking of the clock, and hearing, through the activity of the blue bottle and the monotony of the ceiling flies, the murmur of a distant conversation between his late companions, who for the moment had left him alone, tried in vain to recover his particular thread of memory, without any uneasiness about the innumerable skeins that made up the tissue of his record of a lifetime. When the young doctor returned, he found him still seated where he had left him, one hand over his eyes, the other on his knee. As he sat, for the doctor watched him from the door for a moment, he moved and replaced either hand at intervals, with implied distress in the movements. They gave the impression of constant attempt, constantly baffled. The doctor, a shrewd-seeming young man, with an attentive pale eye and very fair hair, seemed to understand. "'Let me recommend you to be quiet, and rest. Be quite quiet. You will be all right when you've slept on it.' Mrs. Nightingale, that's the lady you saw just now, this is her house, will see that you're properly taken care of. Then the man tried to speak. It was with an effort. I, I wish to thank. I, I must thank. Never mind thanks yet, all in good time. Now, what do you think you can take to eat or drink? Nothing. Nothing to eat or drink. Well, you know best. However, there's tea coming. Perhaps you'll go so far as a cup of tea. You would be the better for it. Rosalind Junior, or Sally, slept in the back bedroom on the first floor. That is to say, if we ignore the basement floor, and call the one flush with the street doorstep the ground floor. We believe that we are right in doing so. Rosalind Senior, the mother, slept in the front one. It wasn't too late for tea, they had decided, and thereupon they had gone upstairs to revise and correct. After a certain amount of slopping and splashing in the back room, uncorroborated by any in the front, Sally called out to her mother on the disjointed lines of talk in real life. "'I like this soap. Have you a safety pin?' Whereto her mother replied, speaking rather drowsily and perfunctorily, "'Yes, but you must come and get it.' "'It's so nice and oily. It's not from Cackley's?' "'Yes, it is. I thought it was. Where's the pin?' At this point she came into her mother's room, covering her slightly retroussé nose with her fresh-washed hands, to enjoy the aroma of Catley's soap. In the little pink saucer, only don't rest my things about. Headache, Mummy dear. For her mother was lying back on the bed with her eyes closed. The speaker left her hands over her nostrils as she spoke, to do full justice to the soap, pausing an instant in her safety-pin raid for the answer. I've been feeling the heat, it's nothing. You go down and I'll come. 
have some eau de cologne? But alas, there was no eau de cologne. Never mind, you go down and I'll follow. I shall be all right after a cup of tea. And Sally, after an intricate movement with a safety pin, an open-work lace cuff that has lost a button and a white wrist, goes down three accelerandos of stair lengths with landing pauses and ends with a dining-room door staccato. But she isn't gone long, for in two minutes the door reopens and she comes upstairs as fast nearly as she went down. In her hand she carries, visibly, Johann Maria Farina. "'Where on earth did you find that?' says her mother. "'The man had it. Wasn't it funny? He heard me say to Dr. Vereker that I was so sorry I'd not been able to eau de cologne your forehead, and he began speaking and couldn't get his words, and then he got this out of his pocket. I remember one of the men at the station said something about his having a bottle, but I thought he meant a pocket flask. He looks the sort of man that would have a pocket flask and earrings.' Her mother doesn't seem to find this inexplicable, nor to need comment. Rather the contrary. Sally dabs her brow with eau de cologne, beneficially, for she seems better, and says now go, she won't be above a couple of minutes. Nor is she, in the sense in which her statement has been accepted, for she comes downstairs within seven by the clock, with the dutiful ratchet movement. When she came within hearing of those in the room below, she heard a male voice that was not Dr. Vereker's. Yes, the man, whom we still cannot speak of by a name, was saying something, slowly, perhaps, but fairly articulately and intelligibly. She went very deliberately and listened in at the doorway. She looked very pale and very interested, a face of fixed attention, of absorption in something she was irresolute about, rather than of doubt about what she heard, an expression rather out of proportion to the concurrent facts as we know them. What is so strange, this is what the man was saying in his slow way, is that I could find words to tell you, if I could remember what it is I have to tell. But when I try to bring it back, my head fails. Tell me again, mademoiselle, about the railway carriage. Sally wondered why she was mademoiselle, but recognised a tone of deference in his use of the word. She did as he asked her, slightly interrupting her narrative, to make sure of getting the tea made right as she did so. "'I trod on your foot, you know. One, two, three spoonfuls. Surely you must remember that. Four, and a little one for the pot. I have completely forgotten it. Then I was sorry, and said I would have come off sooner if I'd known it was a foot. You must remember that.' The man half smiled as he shook a slow, disclaiming head, one that would have remembered so gladly if it could. Then continues Sally, I saw your thumb ring for rheumatism. My thumb ring. He presses his fingers over his closed eyes, as though to give memory a better chance by shutting off the visible present, then withdraws them. No, I remember no ring at all. How extraordinary. I remember a violent concussion somewhere, I can't say where, and then finding myself in a cab trying to speak to a lady whose face seemed familiar to me, but who she could be I had not the slightest idea. And then I tried to get out of the cab, and I found I could not move, or hardly. Look at Mamma again. Here she is, come. For Mrs. Nightingale has come into the room, looking white. Yes, mother dear, I have. Quite full, up to the brim, only it isn't ready to pour yet. This last concerns the tea. Mrs. Nightingale moves round behind the tea-maker, and comes full face in front of her guest. One might have fancied that the hand that held the pocket-handkerchief that caused the smell of eau de cologne that came in with her was tremulous. But then that very eau de cologne was eloquent about the recent effect of the heat. Of course, she was a little upset. Nothing strikes the doctor or Mademoiselle Sally as abnormal or extraordinary. The latter resumes. Surely, sir, oh, you must, you must remember about the name Nightingale. This young gentleman said it just now. Your name, madam? Certainly my name, says the lady addressed. But Sally distinguishes. Yes, but I didn't mean that. I meant when I took the ring from you, and was to pay for it. Sixpence. And you had no change for half a crown. And then I gave you my mother's card to send it to us here. One and elevenpence because of the postage. Why, surely you can remember that. She cannot bring herself to believe him. 
Dr. Vereker does, though, and tells him not to try recollecting he will only put himself back. Take the tea and wait a bit, is the doctor's advice. For Miss Sally is transmitting a cup of tea with studied equilibrium. He receives it absently, leaving it on the table. I do not know if you will know what I mean, he says, but I have a sort of feeling of, of being frightened, for I have been trying to remember things, and I find I can remember almost nothing. Perhaps I should say I cannot remember at all. Can't do any recollecting, if you understand. Everyone can understand, at least each says so. Sally goes on, half sotto voce. You can recollect your own name, I suppose. She speaks halfway between soliloquy and dialogue. The doctor throws in counsel aside for precaution. You'll only make matters worse like that. Better leave him quite alone. But the man's hearing does not seem to have suffered, for he catches the remark about his name. I can't tell, he says. I I'm not so sure. Of course, I can't have forgotten my own name, because that's impossible. I will tell it you in a minute. Oh, dear. The young doctor seems to disapprove highly of these efforts, and to wish to change the conversation. Let it alone now, says he, only for a little. Would you kindly allow me to see your arm again? Let him drink his tea first. This is from Miss Sally, the tea priestess. Another cup? But no, he won't take another cup, thanks. Now let's have the coat off and get another look at the arm. Never mind apologising. But the patient had not contemplated apology. It was the stiffness made him slow. However, he got his coat off and drew the blue shirt off his left arm. He had a fine hand and arm, but the hand hung inanimate, and the fingers looked scorched. Dr. Vereker began feeling the arm at intervals all the way up, and asking each time questions about the degree of sensibility. "'I couldn't say whether it's normal or not up there,' so the patient testified. And Mrs. Nightingale, who was watching the examination intently, suggested trying the other arm in the same place for comparison. "'You didn't see the other arm at the station, doctor?' she said. "'Didn't I? I was asking.' "'Well, no. Now I come to think of it, I, I don't think I did. "'We'll have a look now, anyhow.' "'You're a nice doctor. "'This is from Miss Sally, a little confidential fling at the profession. "'She is no respecter of persons. "'Her mother would, no doubt, check her, a pert little monkey, "'only she is absorbed in the examination.' "'The doctor, as he ran back the right arm sleeve, uttered an exclamation. "'Why, my dear sir!' cried he. "'Here we have it. What more can we want?' and pointed at the arm, and Sally said, as though relieved, "'He's got his name written on him, plain enough, anyhow.' Her mother gave a sigh of relief, or something like it, and said, "'Yes.' The patient himself seemed quite as much perplexed as pleased at the discovery, saying only, in a subdued way, "'It must be my name.' But he did not seem to accept at all readily the name tattooed on his arm, a. Fenwick, 1878. "'Whose name can it be, if it is not yours?' said Mrs. Nightingale. She fixed her eyes on his face as though to watch his effort of memory. "'Try and think,' but the doctor protested. "'Don't do anything of the sort,' said he. "'It's very bad for him, Mrs. Nightingale. He mustn't think. Just let him rest.' The patient, however, could not resign himself without a struggle to this state of anonymous ambiguity. His bewilderment was painful to witness. "'If it were my name,' he said, speaking slowly and not very clearly, "'surely it would bring back the first name. I try to recall the word, and the effort is painful, and doesn't succeed.' His hostess seemed much interested, even to the extent of ignoring the doctor's injunctions. "'Very curious. If you heard the name now, would you recollect it?' "'I wish you wouldn't try these experiments,' said the doctor. They won't do him any good. Rests the thing. I think I would rather try, says Fenwick, as we may now call him. I will be quiet if I can't get this right. Mrs. Nightingale begins repeating names that begin with A. Alfred, Augustus, Arthur, Andrew, Algernon. Fenwick's face brightens. That's it, says he. Algernon. I knew it quite well at the time, of course, but I couldn't couldn't. However, I don't feel that I shall make myself understood. 
I can't make out, said Sally, how you came to remember the bottle of eau de cologne. I did not remember it. I do not now. I mean, how it came to be in the pocket. I can remember nothing else that was there. Would have been, that is. There is nothing else there now, except my cigar case and a pocket book with nothing much in it. I can tell nothing about my watch. A watch ought to be there. There, there, says the doctor. You will remember it all presently. Do take my advice and be quiet and sit still and don't talk. But half an hour or more after, although he had taken this advice, Fenwick remembered nothing, or professed to have remembered nothing. He seemed, however, much more collected, and except on the memory point, nearly normal. When the doctor, looking at his watch, referred to his obligation to keep another engagement, Fenwick rose, saying that he was now perfectly well able to walk, and he would intrude no longer on his hostesses at hospitality. This would have been perfectly reasonable, but for one thing. It had come out that his pockets were empty, and he was evidently quite without any definite plan as to what he should do next or where he should go. He was only anxious to relieve his new friends of an encumbrance. He was evidently the sort of person on whom the character sat ill, one who would always be most at ease when shifting for himself, such a one as would reply to any doubt thrown on his power of doing so, that he had been in many a worse plight than this before. Yet you would hardly have classed him on that account as an adventurer, because that term implies unscrupulousness in the way one shifts for oneself. His face was a perfectly honourable one. It was a face whose strength did not interfere with its refinement, and there was a pleasant candour in the smile that covered it, as he finally made ready to depart with the doctor. He should never, he said, know how to be grateful enough to Madame and her daughter for their kindness to him. But when pressed on the point of where he intended to go, and how they should hear what had become of him, he answered vaguely. He was undecided, but of course he would write and tell them, as they so kindly wished to hear of him, would Mademoiselle give him the address written down? They found themselves, at least the doctor and Sally did, inferring, from his refreshed manner and his confidence about departing, that his memory was coming back, or would come back. It might have seemed needless inquisitiveness to press him with further questions. They left the point alone. After all, they had no more right to catechise him about himself than if he had been knocked down by a cart outside the door and brought into the house unconscious, a thing which might quite well have happened. Mrs. Nightingale seemed very anxious he should not go away quite unprovided with money. She asked Dr. Vereker to pass him on a loan from her before he parted with him. He could post it back when it was quite convenient, so the doctor was to tell him. The doctor asked, wasn't a sovereign a large order? But she seemed to think not. Besides, said she, it makes it certain we shall not lose sight of him. I am not sure we ought to let him go at all, added she. She seemed very uneasy about it, almost exaggeratedly so, the doctor thought. But he was reassuring and confident, and she allowed his judgment to overrule hers. But he must bring him back without scruple, if he saw reason to do so. He promised, and the two departed together, the gait and manner of Fenwick giving rise to no immediate apprehension. "'How rum!' said Sally, when they had gone. "'I never thought I should live to see a man electrocuted.' "'A man what? Well, half electrocuted, then. I say, mother.' "'What, dear?' "'She's looking very tired, and speaks absently. "'Sally makes the heat responsible again in her mind, and continues. "'I don't believe his name's Algernon at all. "'It's Arthur, or Andrew, or something of that sort. "'You're very wise, Poppet. Why?' "'Because you stopped such a long time after Algernon. "'It was like cheating at spiritualism. "'You must say the alphabet quite steady. "'A, B, C, D.' Sally sketches out the proper attitude for the impartial inquirer, or else you're an accomplice. You're a puss. No, his name's Algernon, right enough. I mean, I've no doubt it's Algernon. Why shouldn't it be? No reason at all. Dr. Vericus is Conrad, so, of course, there's no reason why his shouldn't be Algernon. Satisfactory and convincing. At least the speaker thinks so, and is perfectly satisfied. Her mother doesn't quarrel with the decision. "'Kitten, 
she says suddenly, and then in reply to her daughter's, "'What's up, mummy dear?' she suggests that they should walk out in front. It's a quiet, retired sort of cul-de-sac road, ending in a fence done over with tar, with nails along the top, like the letter L upside down, in the cool. "'It's quite delicious now the sun's gone down, and Martha can make supper half an hour late.' Agreed. The mother pauses as they reach the gate. "'Who's that talking?' she asks, and listens. "'Nobody. It's only the sparrows going to bed. No, 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 not that. Shh, be quiet. I'm sure I heard Dr. Vereker's voice. How could you? He's home by now. Do be quiet, child.' She continues listening. "'Why not look round the corner and see if it isn't him?' "'Well, I was going to. Only you and the sparrows make such a chattering. There, I knew it would be that. Why doesn't he bring him back here at once?' For at the end of the short road are Dr. Vereker and Fenwick, the latter with his hand on top of a post, as though resting. They must have been there some minutes. "'Fancy they're having got no further than the fire alarm,' says Sally, who takes account of her surroundings. "'Of course, I ought never to have let him go,' thus her mother with decision in her voice. "'Come on, child.' She seems greatly relieved at the matter having settled itself. So Sally thinks, at least." Well, we've got as far as this, Dr. Vereker says, rather meaninglessly, if you come to think of it. It is so very obvious. And now, said Mrs. Nightingale, how is he to be got back again? That's the question. She seems not to have the smallest doubt about the question, but much about the answer. It is answered, however, with the assistance of the previous police constable, who reappears like a ghost, and Mr. Fenwick is back again, within the little white villa, much embarrassed at the trouble he is giving, but unable to indicate any other course. Clearly it would never do to accept the only one he can suggest, that he should be left to himself, leaning on the fire alarm, till the full use of his limbs should come back to him. Mrs. Nightingale, who is the person principally involved, seems quite content with the arrangement. The doctor, in his own mind, is rather puzzled at her ready acquiescence, but then the only suggestion he could make would be that he should do precisely the same good office himself to this victim of an electric current of a good deal too many volts, too many for private consumption, or cab him off to the police station or the workhouse. For Mr. Fenwick continues quite unable to give any account of his past or his belongings, and can only look forward to recollecting himself, as it were, to-morrow morning. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Somehow Good by William Friend de Morgan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter Four How the Stranger Stopped On at Krakatoa Villa. Of the Freaks of an Extinguished Memory. Of How the Stranger Got a Good Appointment, but None Could Say Who He Was Nor Whence. We must suppose that the personal impression produced by the man so strangely thrown on the hands of Mrs. Nightingale and her daughter was a pleasant one, for had the reverse been the case, the resources of civilization for disposing of him elsewhere had not been exhausted when the decision was come to that he should remain where he was till next morning at any rate. The lady of the house, of course the principal factor in the solution of the problem, appeared, as we have seen, to have made her mind up on the subject, and probably her daughter had been enough influenced by the stranger's manner and appearance, even in the short period of the interview we have just described, to get rid of a feeling she had of self-reproach for her own rashness. We don't understand, girls, but we ask this question of those who do. Is it possible that Miss Sally was impressed by the splendid arm with the name tattooed on it, an arm in which every muscle told as in a Greek statue, without infringing on its roundness, the arm of Theseus or Elysius? Or was it the tone of his voice, a musical one enough, or merely his generally handsome face and courteous manner? He remained that night at the house, but next day still remembered nothing. He wished to go on his way, destination not known, but somewhere and would have done so had it not been for Mrs. Nightingale, whose opposition to his going was, 
thought Dr. Vereker, almost more decisive than the case called for. So he remained on, that day and the next, slowly regaining the use of his right hand. But his memory continued a blank, and though he was not unable to converse about passing events, he could not fix his attention, or only with a great effort. What was very annoying to Sally was that he was absolutely unable to account for his remark about her name and her mother's in the railway carriage. He could not even remember making this. He could recall no reason why he should have made it, from any of the few things that came back to his mind now, hazily, like ghosts. Was he speaking the truth? Why not? Mrs. Nightingale asked. Why not forget that as readily as anything else? His distress at this inability to remember, to account for himself, to himself or anyone else, was almost painful to witness. The only consolatory circumstance was that his use and knowledge of words remained intact. It was his memory of actual incidents and people in the past that was in fault. Definite effort to follow slight clues remaining in his mind ended in failure, or only served to show that their origin was traceable to literary fiction. But his language faculty seemed perfectly in order. It came out that he spoke French fluently, and a little Spanish, but he was just as ready with German. It seemed as if he had been recently among French people, if one could judge from such things as his calling his hostess Madame when he recovered. These facts came to light in the course of next day, the second of his stay in the house. The favourable impression he had produced on Miss Sally did not diminish, and it seemed much easier and more natural to acquiesce in his remaining than to cast about for a new whereabouts to transfer him to. So his departure was deferred, for a day at least, or perhaps until the room he occupied should be wanted for other purposes. The postponements on the days that followed were a natural sequence, so long as there remained any doubt of his ability to shift for himself. But in about a month's time, the effects of the nervous shock had nearly disappeared, and he had almost recovered the use of his hand, could, in fact, write easily. Besides, as long as he remained, it would be impossible for an old friend of Mrs. Nightingale's, who frequently stayed the night when he came on an evening visit, to follow a custom which was, in the winter, almost invariable. In the summer it was less important, and as soon as this friend, an old military gentleman, spoken of as the Major, could be got to understood exactly what had taken place, he readily gave up his quarters at Krakatoa Villa, and returned to his own at the top of a house in Ball Street, Mayfair. Nevertheless, the inevitable time came for looking Fenwick's future in the face. It was difficult, as he was unable to contribute a solution of the question, except by his readiness to go out and find work for himself, promising not to come back till he found it. "'You'll see, I shall come back to dinner,' said he. "'I shan't make you late.' Sally asked him what sort of work he should look for. "'I have a sort of inner conviction,' he replied, "'that I could do almost anything I turned my hand to. Probably it is only a diseased confidence spread of what you might call my artificial inexperience. Every sharp young man's bona fide inexperience lands him in that delusion.' "'But you must have some kind of preference for something, however much you forget.' "'If I were to choose, I think I should like horse-training. "'Oh, no, I, I can't, of course, recall the training of any specific horse, "'but I know I know all about it, for all that. "'I can feel the knowledge of it itching in my finger-ends, yes. "'I could train horses. Fruit-farming would require capital. "'Who said anything about fruit-farming?' Fenwick laughed aloud. It was a great big laugh that made Rosalind, who was giving directions in the kitchen, just across the passage, call out to know what they were laughing at. "'I'll be hanged if I know,' said he. "'Why, I said fruit farming. I must have had something to do with it. It's all very odd.' "'But the horses! The horses!' said Sally, who did not want him to wander from the point. "'How should you go about it? Should you walk into Tattersall's without a character and ask for a place?' "'Not a bit of it. I should saunter into taps like a swell, "'and ask them if they couldn't find me a raw colt "'to try my hand on for a wager. "'Say I had laid a hundred, "'I would quiet down the most vicious quadruped "'they could find in an hour.' "'But that would be fibs. "'Oh, no, I could do it. "'But I don't know why I know. "'I didn't mean that. "'I meant you wouldn't have laid the wager.' "'Yes, I should. "'I lay it you now. "'Come, Miss Sally.' 
A hundred pounds to a brass farthing, I knock all the vice out of the worst beast they can find in an hour. I shouldn't say the wager had been accepted, you know. Well, anyhow, I shan't accept it. You haven't got a hundred pounds to pay with. To be sure, I haven't got a brass farthing that I know of. It's as broad as it is long. Yes, it's that, he replied musingly. As broad as it is long. I haven't got a hundred pounds that I know of. He repeated this twice, becoming very absent and thoughtful. Sally felt apologetic for reminding him of his position, and immediately said so. She was evidently a girl quite incapable of any reserves or concealments, but she had mistaken his meaning. "'No, no, dear Miss Sally,' said he, "'no, not that, not that at all. I spoke like that because it all seemed so strange to me. Do you know, of all the things I can't recollect, the one I can't recollect most, can you understand, is ever being in want of money?' I must have had plenty. I'm sure of it. I dare say you had. You'll recollect it all presently, and what a lark that will be! Sally's ingenious optimism made matters very pleasant. She did not like to press the conversation on these lines, lest Mr. Fenwick should refer to a loan she knew her mother had made him. Indeed, had it not been for this, the poor man would have been hard put to it for clothes and other necessaries. All such little matters which hardly concerned the story, had been landed on a comfortable footing at the date of this conversation. But Mr. Fenwick did not lend himself to the agreeable anticipation of Sally's lark. There was a pained distraction on his handsome face as he gave his head a great shake, tossing about the mass of brown hair, which was still something of a lion's mane in spite of the recent ministrations of a hairdresser. He walked to the window-bay that looked out on the little garden, shaking and rubbing his head, and then came back to where he had been sitting, always as one wrestling with some painful half-memory he could not trace. Then he spoke again. Whether the sort of flash that comes in my mind of writing my name in a cheque-book is really a recollection of doing so, or merely the knowledge that I must have done so, I cannot tell, but it is disagreeable thoroughly disagreeable and strange to the last degree. I cannot tell you how how torturing it is always to be compelled to stop on the threshold of an uncompleted recollection. I have the idea, though, quite, said Sally, but of course one never remembers signing one's name any particular time. One does it mechanically, so I don't wonder. Yes, but the nasty part of the flash is that I always know that it is not my name. Last time it came... Just now, this minute, it was a name like Harrington, or, or Carrington. Oh, dear! He shook and rubbed his head again with the old action. Perhaps your name isn't Fenwick, but Harrington or Carrington. No, that cock won't fight. In a flash, I know it's not my own name as I write it. Oh, but I see! Sally is triumphant. You signed for a firm you belong to, of course. People do sign for firms, don't they? added she, with misgivings about her own business capacity, but Mr. Fenwick did not accept this solution, and continued silent and depressed. The foregoing is one of many similar conversations between Fenwick and Sally, or her mother, or all three, during the term of his stay at Krakatoa Villa. They were less encouraged by the older lady, who counselled Fenwick to accept his oblivion passively, and await the natural return of his mental powers. They would all come in time, she said. And young Dr. Vereker, though his studious and responsible face grew still more studious and responsible as time went on, and the mind of this case continued a blank, still encouraged passivity, and spoke confidently, whatever he thought, of an early and complete recovery. When, in Fenwick's absence, Sally reported to Dr. Vereker and her mother the scheme for applying to Tats, for a wild horse to break in, the latter opposed and denounced it so strongly, on the ground of the danger of the experiment, that both Sally and the doctor promised to support her, if Fenwick should broach the idea again. But when he did so, it was so clear that the disfavour Mrs. Nightingale showed for such a risky business would be sufficient to deter him from trying it, that neither thought it necessary to say a word in her support and the conversation went off into a discussion of how it came about that Fenwick should remember Tattersall's. But, said he, he did not remember Tattersall's, even now, 
and yet hearing the name he had automatically called it Tats. Many other instances showed that his power of imagery in relation to the past was paralysed, while his language faculty remained intact, just as many fluent speakers and writers spell badly, only it was an extreme case. A fortunate occurrence that happened at this time gave its quietus to the unpopular horse-breaking speculation. It happened that, as Mrs. Nightingale was shopping at a big universal providing stores not far away, one of the clerks had some difficulty in interpreting a French phrase in a letter just received from abroad. No one near him looked more likely to help than Mrs. Nightingale, but she could do nothing when applied to, although she said she had been taught French in her youth. But she felt certain Mr. Fenwick could be of use at her house. French idiom was evidently unfamiliar in the neighbourhood, for the young gentleman from the office jumped at the opportunity. He went away with Mrs. Nightingale's card, inscribed with a message, and came back before she had done shopping. Not that that means such a very short time. Not only with an interpretation, but with an exhaustive draft of an answer in French, which she saw to be both skilful and scholarly. It was so much so, that a fortnight later an inquiry came to know if Mr. Fenwick's services would be available for a firm in the city, which had applied to be universally provided with a man having exactly his attainments and no others. In less than a month he was installed in a responsible position as their foreign correspondent, and in receipt of a very respectable salary. The rapidity of phrasing in this movement was abnormal, prestissimo, in fact, if we indulge our musical vocabulary, but the instrumentation would have seemed less surprising to Sally had she known the lengths her mother had gone in the proffer of a substantial guarantee for Fenwick's personal honesty. This seeming rashness did not transpire at the time. Had it done so, it might have appeared unintelligible to Sally, at any rate. She would not have been surprised at herself for backing the interests of a man nearly electrocuted over her half-crown, but why should her mother endorse her protégé so enthusiastically? It is perhaps hardly necessary for us to dwell on the unsuccessful attempts that were made to recover touch with other actors on the stage of Fenwick's vanished past. Advertisement, variously worded, in the second column of the Times, three times a week for a month, produced no effect. Miss Sally frequently referred with satisfaction to the case of John Williams, reported among the psychical researches of past years, in which a man who vanished in England was found years after carrying on a goods store in Chicago under another name, with a new wife and family, having utterly forgotten the first half of his life and all his belongings. Her mother seemed only languidly interested in this illustration, and left the active discussion of the subject chiefly to Sally, who speculated endlessly on the whole of the story, without, however, throwing any fresh light on it, unless, indeed, the Chicago man could be considered one. And the question naturally arose, as long as his case continued to hold out hopes of a sudden return of memory, and until we were certain of his condition was chronic, why go to the expense and court publicity? By the time he was safely installed in his situation at the wine merchants, the idea of a police inquiry, application to the magistrates and so forth, had become distasteful to all concerned, and none more so than Fenwick himself. When Dr. Vereker, acting on his own account, and unknown to Mrs. Nightingale and Fenwick, made confidential reference to Scotland Yard, that Yard smiled cynically over the Chicago storekeeper, and expressed the opinion that probably Fenwick's game was a similar game, and that things of this sort were usually some game. The doctor observed that he knew without being told that nine such cases out of ten had human rascality at the bottom of them, but that he had consulted that yard in the belief that this might be a tenth case. The yard said, very proper, and it would do its best, and no doubt did, but nothing was elucidated. It is just possible that had Mr. Fenwick communicated every clue he found, down to the smallest trifle, Dr. Vereker might have been able to get at something through the Criminal Investigation Department. But it wasn't fair to Sherlock Holmes to keep anything back. Fenwick, knowing nothing of Vereker's inquiry, did so, 
for he had decided to say nothing about a certain pawn ticket that was in the pocket of an otherwise empty purse or pocket book evidently just bought he would however investigate it himself and did so it was quite three weeks though before he felt safe to go about alone to any place distant from the house more especially when he did not know what the expedition would lead to when at last he got to the pawnbroker's he found that the gentleman at the counter did not recognize him or said he did not fenwick of course could not ask the question did i pawn this watch it would have seemed lunacy but he framed a question that answered as well to his thinking would you very kindly tell me he asked dropping his voice whether the person that pawned this watch was at all like me like a brother of mine for instance perhaps he was not a good hand at pretences and the pawnbroker outclassed him easily no sir replied he without looking to see that i most certainly cannot tell you fenwick was not convinced that this was true but had to admit to himself that it might be this man's life was one long record of an infinity of short loans and its problem was the advancing of the smallest conceivable sums on the largest obtainable security why should he recollect one drop in the ocean of needy applicants the only answer fenwick could give to this was based on his belief that he looked quite unlike the other customers more knowledge would have shown him that there was not one of those customers scarcely but had a like belief it is the common form of human thought among those who seek to have pawns broked they are a class made up entirely of exceptions fenwick came away from the shop with the watch that must have been his that was how he thought of it as soon as he wore it again it became his watch naturally but he could remember nothing about it and its recovery from the pawnbrokers he could not remember leaving it at became an absurd dream perhaps in sherlock holmes's hands it would have provided a valuable clue fenwick said nothing further about it put it in a drawer until all inquiries about him had died into the past another little thing that might have helped was the cabman's number written on his wristband but here fate threw investigation off her guard the ciphers were as it chanced three thousand six hundred and an unfortunate shrewdness of scotland yard when dr vereker communicated this clue spotted the date in it the third day of the sixth month of nineteen hundred so no one dreamed of the cabby who could at least have shown where the hat was lost that might have had a name or address inside it and where he left its owner in the end and there was absolutely no clue to anything elsewhere among his clothes the panama hat might have been bought anywhere the suit of blue serge was ticketless inside the collar and the shirt unmarked probably bought for the voyage only fenwick had succeeded in forgetting himself just at a moment when he was absolutely without a reminder and it seemed there was nothing for it but to wait for the revival of memory this then is how it came about that within three months of his extraordinary accident mr fenwick was comfortably settled in an apartment within a few minutes walk of krakatoa villa and all the incidents of his original appearance were getting merged in the insoluble and would soon no doubt under the influence of a steady ever-present new routine of life be completely absorbed in the actual past end of chapter four chapter five of somehow good by william friend de morgan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by helen taylor oxford u k chapter five the christmas after of the church of st satisfax and the young idiot who came there when one is called away in the middle of a street fight and misses seeing the end of it how embittered one's existence is and continues for some time after think what our friend the cabman would have felt had he missed the denouement and when one finds oneself again on its sight if that is the correct expression how one wishes one was not ashamed to inquire about its result from the permanent officials on the spot the waterman attached to the cab rank the crossing sweeper on the corner 
the neolithographic artist who didn't really draw that half mackerel himself but is there all day long for all that or even the apothecary shop over the way on the chance that the casualties went or were taken there for treatment after the battle one never does ask because one is so proud but if one did ask one would probably find that oblivion had drawn a veil over the event and that none of one's catechumens had heard speak of any such an occurrence and that it must have been another street because if it had been there they would have seen to a certainty and the monotonous traffic rolls on 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 and the two counter streams of creatures each with a story divide and subdivide over the spot where the underneath man's head sounded on the curbstone which took no notice at the time and now seems to know less than ever about it are we in thus moralizing merely taking the mean advantage the author is apt to imagine he has established over his reader when he ends off a chapter with a snap and hopes the said reader will not dare to skip no we are not we really mean something and shall get to it in time let us only be clear what it is ourselves it refers at any rate to the way in which the contents of chapters one and two had become records of the past six months later when the snow was on the ground four inches thick on christmas morning two inches at least having been the last night's contribution and made it all sweet and smooth all over so that there need be no unpleasantness as sally looked out of her mother's bedroom window towards the front of the venetian blind she saw the footprints of cats alone on the snow in the road and of the milk alone along the pavement for the milk had preferred to come by hand rather than plough its tricycle through the unknown depths and drifts of glenmoira road west to which it had found its way over tracks already palliated by the courage of the early bus not plying for it higher at that hour but only seeking its equivalent of the carceres of the roman Colosseum, to inaugurate the carriage of twelve inside and fourteen out to many kinds of divine service early in the day and one kind only of dinner service late the one folk eat too much pudding and mince pie at and have to take a dose after during this early introductory movement of the bus its conductor sits inside like a lord and classifies documents but he has nothing to do with our story let us thank him for facilitating the milk and dismiss him my gracious goodness me said sally when she saw the snow she did not say it quite from the bottom of her heart and as her own form of expression but in inverted commas as it were the primary responsibility being cook's or jane's you mustn't think of getting up mother oh nonsense i shall get up the minute the hot water comes you won't do any good by getting up you'd much better lie in bed i shouldn't get up if i was you etc etc oh stuff my rheumatism's better do you know i really think the ring has done it good dr vereker may laugh as much as he likes well the proof of the pudding's in the eating but wait till you see how thick the snow is come in this is very staccato jane was knocking at the door with cans of really hot water this time i said come in before merry christmas and happy new year jane oh i say what a dear little robin he's such a little duck i hope the cat won't get him and sally who is huddled up in a thick dressing-gown and is shivering is so excited that she goes on looking through the blind and the peep-hole she has had to make to see clear through the frosted pane in spite of the deadly cold on the finger-tip she rubbed it with her mother felt interested too in the fate of the robin but not to the extent of impairing her last two minutes in bed by admitting the slightest breath of cold air into a well-considered fortress she was really going to get up though that was flat the fire would blaze directly although at this moment it was blowing wood smoke down jane's throat and making her choke directly was five or six minutes but the fire did blaze up royally in the end you see it wasn't a slow combustion grate and it burned too much fuel and flared away coal and did all sorts of comfortable uneconomical things so did jane who had put in a whole bundle of wood but now that the wood was past praying for and jane had departed after thawing the hearts of two sponges it was just as well to take advantage of the blaze while it lasted and mrs nightingale and her daughter in the thickest available dressing-gowns and pretending they were not taking baths only because the bathroom was thrown out of gear by the frost took advantage of the said blaze to their heart's content and harked back a good way back 
on the conversation. You never said, come in, chick. I did, mother. Well, if I didn't, at any rate, I always tell her not to knock. She is the stupidest girl. She will knock. Her mother doesn't press the point. There is no bad blood anywhere. Did not Sally wish the handmaiden a Merry Christmas? The cat didn't get the robin, Sally. Not he. The robin was too sharp by half. Such a little darling, but I was sorry for the cat. Poor pussy. Not our pussy, was it? Oh, no, it was that piebald Tom that lives at the empty house next door. Oh, I know. Horrible beast. Well, but just think of being out in the cold in this weather with nothing to eat. Ooh! Sally illustrates with an intentional shudder. I wonder who that is. I didn't hear anyone. You'll see, he'll ring directly. I know who it is. It's Mr. Fenwick. Come to say he can't come tonight. I heard the click of his skates. They've a sort of twinkly click skates have when they're swung by a strap. He'll go out and skate all day. He'll go to Wimbledon. The girl's hearing was quite correct. A ring came at the bell. Krakatoa had no knocker and a short colloquy followed between Jane and the ringer. Then he departed, with his twinkly click and noiseless footstep on the snow, slamming the front gate. Jane was able to include a card he had left in a recrudescence of reinforcement of hot water. Sally takes the card and looks at it, and her mother says, "'Well, Sally?' with a slight remonstrance against the unfairness of keeping back information after you have satisfied your own curiosity, a thing people are odious about, as we all know. "'He's coming all right,' says Sally, looking at both sides of the card, and passing it on when she's quite done with it. Sally, we may mention, as it occurs to us at this moment, though why, we have no idea, means to have a double chin when she is five years older than her mother is now. At present it, the chin, is merely so much youthful roundness and softness, very white underneath. Her mother's is quite of a different type. Her daughter's father must have had black hair, for Sally can make huge, shining coils, or close plaits, very wide, out of her inheritance. Or it will assume the form of a bush, if indulged, till Sally is almost hidden under it, as the boss Jessman under his version of Burnham Wood, that he shoots his assegai from. But the mother's is brown, with a tinge of chestnut, going well with her eyes, which have a claret tone, or what is so called. But we believe people really mean pale old port when they say so. She has had, still has, we might say, a remarkably fine figure, and we don't feel the same faith in Miss Sally's. That young lassie will get described as plump some day if she doesn't take care. But really it is a breach of confidence to get behind the scenes and describe two ladies in this way, when they are so very much in deshabillé, having not even washed. We will look at them again when they have got their things on. However, they may go on talking now. The blaze has lost its splendour, and dressing cannot be indefinitely delayed. But they can and do talk from room to room, confident that Cook and Jane are in the basement out of hearing. "'We shall do nicely, kitten. Six at table. I'm glad Mr. Fenwick can come, aren't you?' "'Rather. Fancy having Dr. and Mrs. Vereker, and the dear old fossil, and nobody to help out.' "'My dear, you say Dr. and Mrs. Vereker as if he was a married man. "'Well, him and his mammy, then. "'He's good, but he's professional. "'Oh, dear, his professional manner. "'You have to be forming square to receive cavalry every five minutes "'to prevent his writing you a prescription. "'Ungrateful little monkey. "'You know the last he wrote you did you no end of good. "'Yes, but I didn't ask him for it. "'He wrote it by force.' I hate being hectored over and bullied. I say, Mother. What, kitten? I hope as Mr. Fenwick's coming you'll wear your wedding ring. Wear what? Wear your wedding ring. His ring, you know. You know what I mean, the rheumatic one. Of course I know perfectly well what you mean, says her mother, with a shade of impatience in her voice. But why? Why? Because it gives him pleasure always to see it on your finger. He fancies it's doing good to the neuritis. Perhaps it is. Very well, then, why not wear it? Because it's so big and comes off in the soup and is a nuisance. And then he didn't give it to me, either. He was to have had a shilling for it. But he never did have. And it wasn't a shilling, it was sixpence. And he says it's the only little return he's ever been able to make for what he calls our kindness. I couldn't shovel him out onto the street. Put his wedding ring on, Mammy, to oblige me. 
"'Very well, chick, I don't mind.' And so that point is settled. But something makes the daughter repeat, as she comes into her mother's room, dry-toweling herself. "'You're sure you don't mind, Mammy?' To which the reply is, "'No, no, why should I mind? It's quite all right.' With a forced decision, equivalent to wavering about it. Sally looks at her a moment in a pause of dry-toweling, and goes back to her room not quite convinced. Persons of the same blood, living constantly together, are sometimes quite embarrassed by their own brain waves and very often misled. Exigencies of teeth and hair cut the talk short about Mr. Fenwick, but he gets renewed at breakfast and, in fact, goes on more or less until brought up short by the early service at St. Satisfax, where he is extinguished by a preliminary hymn. But not before his whole story, so far as is known, has been passed in review so that an attentive listener might have gathered from their disjointed chat most of the particulars of his strange appearance on the scene, and of the incidents of the next few weeks, and their result in the foundation of what seemed likely to be a permanent friendship between himself and Krakatoa Villa. And what certainly was, all things considered, that most lucrative and lucky post in a good wine merchant's house in the city. For Mr. Fenwick had nothing to recommend him but his address and capacity, brought into notice by an accidental concurrence of circumstances. It had been difficult to talk much about him to himself, without seeming to wish to probe into his past life, and as Mrs. Nightingale impressed on Sally for the twentieth time, just as they arrived at St. Satisfax, they really knew nothing of it. How could they even know that this oblivion was altogether genuine? It might easily have been so at first, but... Who could say how much of his past had come back to him during the last six months? An unwelcome past, perhaps, and one he was glad to help oblivion in extinguishing? As this was on the semi-circular path in front of the saint's shrine, between two ramparts of swept-up snow, and on a corrective of cindergrit, Sally ascribed this speculation to a disposition on her mother's part to preach, she having come, as it were, within the scope and atmosphere of a pending decalogue. Also, she thought the ostentatious way in which Mr. Fenwick had gone away to skate had something to do with it. But she was at all times conscious of a certain access of severity in her mother as she approached altars, rather beyond the common attitude of mind one ascribes to the bearer of a prayer book when one doesn't mean to go to church oneself. We are indebted for this piece of information to an intermittent church-goer, it is on a subject on which our own impressions have little value. In the present case, Sally was going to church, so she had to account to herself for a nuance in her mother's manner. After dwelling on the needlessness and inadvisability of pressing Mr. Fenwick as to his recollections, by ascribing it to the consciousness of some secularism elsewhere, and he was the nearest case of ungodliness to hand. I wonder whether he believes anything at all, said Sally assuming the consecutiveness of her remark. I don't see why he shouldn't. Why should he disbelieve more than... All I mean is, I don't know. The speaker ended abruptly, but then that may have been because they were at the church door. Possibly as a protest against having carried chat almost into the precinct, Mrs. Nightingale's preliminary burial of her face in her hands lasted a long time. In fact, Sally almost thought she'd gone to sleep, and told her so afterwards. Perhaps, though, she added, it was me came up from under the bedclothes too soon. Then she thought her levity displeased her mother and kissed her. But it wasn't that. She was thoughtful over something else. This time in the church it may be Sally noticed her mother's abstraction, or was it perhaps devotional tension, less than she had done when her attention had been caught once or twice lately by a similar strained look. For Miss Sally had her eyes on a little gratifying incident of her own, a trifle that would already have appeared as an incident in her diary had she kept one, somewhat thus. Saw that young idiot from Catley's stores again in church today, in a new scarlet necktie. I wonder whether it's me or Miss Peplow that gollops, or the large Miss Baker, which would have shown that she was not always a nun, breathless with adoration during religious exercises. The fact is... Sally would have made a very poor St. Teresa indeed. The young idiot was the same young man who had brought the difficult French idiom to Krakatoa, when Mr. Fenwick was still without an anchorage of his own. Martha the cook, 
who admitted him, not feeling equal to the negotiation, had merely said, "'Would he mind stepping into the parlour, and she would send Miss Sally up?' and had departed, bearing Mrs. Nightingale's credential card in a hand, as free from grease as an apron so deeply committed could make it, and brought Miss Nightingale in from the garden, where she was gardening, possibly effectually, but what do we know? When you are gardening on a summer afternoon, you may look very fetching, if you are nineteen and the right sex for the adjective. Miss Sally did, being both, and for our own part, we think it was inconsiderate and thoughtless of Cook. Sally was sprung upon that young man like a torpedo on a ship with no guards out, saying with fascinating geniality through a smile, as one interests oneself in a civility that means nothing, that Mr. Fenwick had just gone out, and she didn't know when he would be back. But why not ask Mrs. Price at the school, opposite St. Satisfax, where we went to church? She was French, and would be sure to know what it meant. She wouldn't mind. Say I sent you. And the youth, whom the torpedo had struck amidships, was just departing, conscious of reluctance, when Mr. Fenwick appeared, having come back for his umbrella. Sally played quite fair. She didn't hang about as she might have done to rub her pearly teeth and merry eyebrows into her victim. She went back and gardened honourably, while Mr. Fenwick solved the riddle and supplied the letter. But for all that, the young man appeared next Sunday at St. Satisfax's with an extremely new prayer book that looked as if his religious convictions were recent, and never took his eyes off Sally all through the service. That is, if he did as she supposed, and peeped all the while that his head ought to have been, as she metaphorically expressed it, under the clothes. Now this was naturally a little unaccountable to Sally, after such a very short interview, and on the part, too, of a young gentleman who passed all the working hours of the day among working houris, as it were, soaked and saturated in their fascinations, and not at liberty to squeeze their hands or ask them for one little lock of hair all through shop-time. Sally did not realise the force of sameness, nor the amount of contempt familiarity will breed. Perhaps the Houris got tired and snappish, poor things, and used up their artificial smiles on the customers. Perhaps it had leaked out that the trying-on hands contributed only length, personally, to the loveliness of the trying-on figures. All sorts of things might have happened to influence this young man towards St. Satisfax, and how did Sally know how often he had seen the other young lady communicants she had speculated about? Her mind had certainly thrown in the large Miss Baker with something of derision, but that Sylvia Peplow was just the sort of girl men run after, like a big pale gloire de Dijon rose all on one side, with pale golden wavy hair and great big goggly blue eyes, looking as if she couldn't help it. Now that we have given you details from Sally's inner consciousness of Miss Peplow's appearance, we hope you will perceive why she said golloped. We don't, exactly. However, on this Christmas morning it was made clear whom this young donkey was hankering after. This is Sally's way of putting it. As Miss Peplow failed to get her usual place through being late and had to sit in a side aisle instead of the opposite of her to the idiot. We are again borrowing from Sally, and now the idiot would have to glare round over his shoulder at her or go without. It was soon evident that he was quite content to go without and that Sally herself had been his lodestar. The certainty of this was what prevented her taking so much notice of her mother as she might otherwise have done. Had she done so closely, she would hardly have put down her preoccupation or tension or whatever it was to displeasure at Mr. Fenwick's going to skate on Christmas morning instead of going to church. What concern was it of theirs, what Mr. Fenwick did? End of chapter 5「Six of Somehow Good by William Friend de Morgan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter Six of Boxing Day Morning at Krakatoa Villa and What Observant Creatures Fossils Are. The dear old fossil, referred to by Miss Sally, was one of those occurrences, auxiliaries or encumbrances as may be, whom one is liable to meet with in almost any family, 
who are so forcibly taken for granted by all its members that the infection of their acceptance catches on, and no newcomer ever asks that they should be explained. If they were relatives, they would be easy of explanation, but the only direct information you ever get about them is that they are not. This seems to block all avenues of investigation, and presently you find yourself taking them as a matter of course, like the lion and unicorn, or the image on a stamp. Fenwick accepted the major, as the old fossil was called, so frankly and completely under that name that he was still uncertain about his real designation at the current moment of the story. Nobody ever called him anything but the major, and he would as soon have asked Major Watt as called in question the title of King of Hearts instead of playing him on the Queen and taking the trick. So far as he could conjecture, the major had accepted him in the same way. When the railway adventure was detailed to him, the fossil said many times, How perfectly extraordinary! God bless my soul! You don't mean that! And so on, but his astonishment always knocked his double eyeglass off, and when he couldn't find it, it had to be recovered before he could say, Eh, hey, hey, eh, what was that? and get in line again. So he made a disjointed listener. But these fossils see more than they hear sometimes, and this old major, for all he was so silent, must have noticed many little things that Christmas evening to cause him to say what he did next day to Sally. For, of course, the Major couldn't go back to his lodgings in Ball Street in weather like this. So he stayed the night in a spare room, where Mr. Fenwick had been put up temporary, Cook said, a room which was, in fact, usually spoken of as the Major's room. Of course, Sally was the sort of girl who would never see anything of that sort. You'll see what sort directly, though she was as sharp as a razor in a general way. What made her blind in this case was that in certain things, aspects, relations of life, she had ruled mother out of court as an intrinsically grown-up person, one to whom some speculations would not apply. So she saw nothing in the fact that when Mr. Fenwick's knock came at the door, her mother said, There he is, and went out to meet him, nor even in her stopping with him outside on the landing, chatting confidentially and laughing. Why shouldn't she? She saw nothing, nothing whatever, in Mr. Fenwick's bringing her mother a beautiful sealskin jacket as a Christmas present. Why shouldn't he? The only thing that puzzled Sally was, where on earth did he get the money to buy it? But then, of course, he was in the city, and the city is sort of Tom Tiddler's ground. Sally found that enough, on reflection. She saw nothing, either, in her mother's carrying her present away upstairs, and saying nothing about it till afterwards. Nor did she notice any abnormal satisfaction on Mr. Fenwick's countenance as he came into the drawing-room by himself, such as one might discern in a hen, if hens had countenances, after a special egg. Nor did she attach any particular meaning to an expression on the elderly face of the doctor's mother, that any student of Lavater would at once have seemed to mean that we saw what was going on, but were going to be maternally discreet about it, and only mention it to every one we met, in the very strictest confidence. This lady, who had rather reluctantly joined the party, for she was a martyr to ailments, was somewhat grudgingly admitted by Sally to be a comfortable sort of old thing enough, if only she didn't goozle over you so. She had no locus standi for goozling, whatever it was, for had not Sally as good as told her son that she didn't want to marry him or anybody else? If you ask us what would be the connecting link between Sally's attitude towards the doctor and the gooselings of a third party, we have no answer ready. No, Sally went to bed as wise as ever, so she afterwards told the fossil major at the end of the evening. She had enjoyed herself immensely though the simple material for rapture was only four square halmer, played by the four acuter intelligences of the six, and draughts for the goozler and the fossil. But then Sally had a rare faculty for enjoying herself, and she was perfectly contented, with only one admirer to torment, though he was only old prosy, as she called him, but not to his face. She was jolly glad Mother had put on her maroon-coloured watered silk with velvet facings, because you couldn't deny that she looked lovely in it. And as for Mr. Fenwick, he looked just like Hercules and Sir Walter Raleigh after being out skating all day long in the cold. 
and Sally's wisdom had not been in the least increased by what was, after all, only a scientific experiment on poor Mr. Fenwick's mental torpor, when her mother, the goozler and old prosy having departed, got out her music to sing that very old song of hers to him, that he had thought the other day seemed to bring back a sort of memory or something. Was it not possible that if he heard it often enough, his past might revive slowly? You never could tell. So when, on Boxing Day morning, Sally's mother, who had got down early and hurried her breakfast to make a dash for early prayer at St. Satisfacts, looked in at her backward daughter and reproached her, and said there was the Major coming down and no one to get him his chocolate, she spoke to a young lady who was serenely unprepared for any revelations of a startling nature, or, indeed, any revelations at all. Nor did getting the Major his chocolate excite any suspicions. So Sally was truly taken aback when the old gentleman, having drunk his chocolate, broke a silence which had lasted since a brief and fossil-like good morning with, "'Well, Missy, and what do you say to the idea of a stepfather?' but not immediately, for at first she didn't understand him, and answered placidly, "'It depends on who?' Oh, "'Mr. Fenwick, for instance?' "'Yes, but who for? And stepfather to step what? Stepdaughter or stepson?' "'Yourself, little goose. You would be the stepdaughter.' Sally was then so taken aback that she could make nothing of it, but stood in a cloud of mystification. The Major had to help her. "'How would you like your mother to marry Mr. Fenwick?' He was one of those useful people who never finesse, who let you know point-blank where you are and to whom you feel so grateful for being unfeeling, while others there be who keep you dancing about in suspense while they break things gently and all the while are scoring up a little account against you for considerateness. Sally's bewilderment, however, recognised one thing distinctly, that the Major's inquiry was not to get, but to give information. He didn't in the least want to know what she thought. He was only working to give her a useful tip, so she would take her time about answering. She took it, looking as grave as a little downy owl-tot. Meanwhile, to show there was no bad feeling, she went and sat candidly on the fossil's knee, and attended to his old whiskers and moustache. "'Major, dear,' she said presently. "'What, my child?' "'Wouldn't they make an awfully handsome couple?' The Major replied, "'Handsome is as handsome does,' and seemed to suggest that questions of this sort belong to a pre-fossilised condition of existence." "'Now, Major dear, why not admit it when you know it's true? "'You know quite well they would make a lovely couple. "'Just fancy them going up the aisle at St. Satisfax. "'It would be like medieval kings and queens.' "'For Sally was still in that happy phrase of girlhood "'in which a marriage is a wedding, "'et proteria a liquid, but not much. "'But,' she continued, "'I couldn't give up any of Mamma. "'No, not so much as that, "'if she were to marry twenty Mr. Fenwick's.' as the quantity indicated was the smallest little finger-end that could be checked off with a thumbnail, the twenty husbands would have come in for a very poor allowance of matrimony. The Major didn't seem to think the method of estimation supplied a safe ground for discussion, and allowed it to lapse. "'I may be quite wrong, you know, my dear,' said he. "'I dare say I'm only an old fool, so we won't say anything to Mamma, will us, little woman?' "'I don't know, Major dear.' I'll promise not to say anything to her because of what you've said to me, but if I suspect it myself on my account later on, of course I shall. What shall you say to her? Ask her if it's true. Why not? But what was it made you think so? Whereon the Major gave in detail his impressions of the little incidents recorded above, which Sally had seen nothing in. He laid a good deal of stress on the fact that her mother had suppressed the Christmas present until after Dr. Vereker and his mother had departed. She wouldn't have minded the doctor, he said, but she would naturally want to keep the old bird out of the swim. Besides, there was Fenwick himself. One could see what he thought of it. She could perfectly well stop him, if she chose, and she didn't choose. "'Stop his whatting,' said Sally, perplexingly. 
but she admitted the possibility of an answer by not pressing the question home. Then she went on to say that all these things had happened exactly under her nose, and she had never seen anything in them. The only concession she was inclined to make was in respect of the impression her mother evidently made on Mr. Fenwick. But that was nothing wonderful. Anything else would have been very surprising. Only it didn't follow from that that Mother wanted to marry Mr. Fenwick or Mr. Anybody. As far as he himself went, she liked him awfully. But then he couldn't recollect who he was, poor fellow. It was most pathetic sometimes to see him trying. If only he could have remembered that he hadn't been a pirate or a forger or a wicked marquis. But to know absolutely nothing at all about himself? Why, the only thing that was known now about his past life was that he once knew a Rosalind Nightingale, what he said to her in the railway carriage, and now he had forgotten that, too, like everything else. "'I say, Major dear,' Sally has an influx of a new idea, "'it ought to be possible to find out something about that Rosalind Nightingale he knew. Mamma says it's nonsense her being any relation, because she'd know.' "'And suppose we did find out who she was?' "'Well, then, if we could get at her, we might get her to tell us who he was, and then we could tell him. "'Perhaps it is only his fossil-like way of treating the subject, "'but certainly the Major shows a very slack interest, so he thinks, "'in the identity of this namesake of hers. "'He does, however, ask absently, "'What sort of way did he speak of her on the train?' Why, he said so little. But she gave you some impression. Oh, of course. He spoke as if she was a person. Not a female, you know. A person. A person isn't a female when, eh, Missy? This requires little consideration, and gets it. The result, when it comes, seems good in its author's eyes. When they sit down. When you ask them to, you know. In the parlour, I mean. Not the hall. They might be a female then. Did he mean a lady? And take milk and no sugar, and pull her gloves on to go, and leave cards turned up at the corner? Oh, no, not a lady, certainly. As she makes these instructive distinctions, Miss Sally is kneeling on a hassock before a mature fire, which will tumble down and spoil presently. When it does, it will be time to resort to that hearth-broom and restrict combustion with collected caput mortuum of Derby Brights, selected, twenty-seven shillings. Till then, Sally, who deserted the Major's knee just as she asked what Mr. Fenwick was to stop in, is at liberty to roast, and does so with undisturbed gravity. The Major is becoming conscious of a smell like Joan of Arc at the beginning of the entertainment, when her mother comes in on a high moral platform and taxes her with singeing and dissolves the Parliament, and rings to take away breakfast and forecasts an open window the minute the Major has gone. Sally doesn't wait for the open window, but as one recalled to the active duties of life from liquefaction in a Turkish bath, takes a cold plunge as far as the front gate, without so much as a hat on, to see if the post is coming, which is absurd and comes back braced. But though she only wonders what can have put such an idea as her mother marrying Mr. Fenwick into the Major's dear silly old head, she keeps on a steady current of speculation about who that Rosalind Nightingale he knew could possibly have been, and whether she couldn't be got at even now. It was such a pity he couldn't have a tip given about him who he was. If he were once started, he would soon run, she was sure of that. But did he want to run? That was a point to consider. Did he really forget as much as he said he did? How came he not to have forgotten his languages he was so fluent with? And how about his bookkeeping? And that curious way he had of knowing about places and then looking puzzled when asked when he had been there. When they talked about Klondike the other day, for instance, and he seemed to know so much about it. But then, see how he grasped his head and ruffled his hair and shut his eyes and clenched his teeth over his efforts to recollect whether he had really been there himself or only read it all in the Century or Atlantic Monthly. Surely he was in earnest then. Sally's speculations lasted her all the way to number 260 Ladbroke Grove Road, 
where she was going to a music lesson, or rather music practice with a friend who played the violin, for Sally was learning the viola to be useful. End of chapter 6「Concerning People's Pasts and the Separation of the Sheep from the Goats, of Yet Another Major, and How He Gossiped at the Herkaru Club, Some Trustworthy Information About an Alleged Divorce. You who read this may have met with some cross chance, such as we are going to try to describe to you, possibly with the same effect upon yourself as the one we have to confess to in our own case, namely that you have been left face to face with a problem to which you have never been able to supply a solution. You have given up a conundrum in despair, and no one has told you the answer. Here are the particulars of an imaginary case of the sort. You have made an acquaintance, made friends, years ago with some man or woman without any special introduction, and without feeling any particular curiosity about his or her antecedents. No inquiry seemed to be called for, all concomitants were so very usual. You may have felt a misgiving as to whether the easy-going ways of your old papa or the innocent bohemianisms of his sons and daughters will be welcome to your new friend whom you credit with being a little old-fashioned and straight-laced, if anything. But it never occurs to you to doubt or investigate. Why should you, when no question is raised of any great intimacy between you and the so-and-sos, which may stand for the name of his or her family, they ask no certificate from you, of whom they know just as little? Why should you demand credentials of a passer-by because he is so obliging as to offer to lend you a Chinese vocabulary or Whittaker? Why should your wife try to go behind the cheque-book and the prayer-book of a married couple when all she has had to do with the lady was, suppose, to borrow a square bottle of her, marked off in half-inch lengths, to be shaken before taken? Why not accept her unimpeachable Sunday morning as sufficient warranty for talking to her on the beach next day and finding what a very nice person she is? Because it would very likely be at the seaside. But suppose any sort of introduction of this sort... You know what we mean. Well, the so-and-sos have slipped gradually into your life, let this be granted. We need not imagine for our purpose any extreme approaches of family intimacy, any love affairs or deadly quarrels. A tranquil intercourse of some twenty years is all we need, every year of which has added to your conviction of the thorough trustworthiness and respectability of the so-and-sos, of their readiness to help you in any little difficulty and of the high opinion which the rest of the world has of Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, the world which knew them when it was a boy, and all their connections and antecedents, which, you admit, you didn't. And then, after all these years, it is suddenly burst upon you that there was a shady story about so-and-so that never was cleared up, something about money, perhaps, or, worse still, one of those stories your informant really doesn't like to be responsible for the particulars of, so you must ask Smith yourself, or your wife comes to you in fury and indignation that such a scandalous falsehood should have got about as that Clara so-and-so was never married to so-and-so at all till ever so long after Fluffy or Toppy or Croppy or Poppy was born. We take any names at random of this sort merely to dwell on your good lady's familiarity with the so-and-so family. Well, then. There you are, and what can you make of it? There you are, face to face with the fact that a man who was a black sheep twenty or thirty years ago has been all this time making believe to be a white sheep so successfully as never was. Or, stranger still, that a woman who has brought up a family of model daughters, daughters whom it would be no exaggeration to speak of as on all fours with your own, and who is quite one of the nicest and most sympathetic people your wife has to go to in trouble, this woman actually, actually, if this tale is true, was guilty in her youth. There, that will do. Suppose we say she was no better than she should be. She hadn't even the decency to be a married woman before she did it, which always makes it so much easier to talk to strange ladies and girls about it. 
You can say all the way down a full dinner table that Lady Polly Andrews got into the divorce court without doing violence to any propriety at all. But the story of Mrs. So-and-so's indiscretion, while still Miss Such-and-Such, must be talked of more guardedly. And all the while behold the subjects of these stories, in whom, but for this sudden revelation of a shady past, you can detect no moral difference from your amiable and respectable self. They puzzle you as they puzzle us, with a doubt whether they are really the same people, whether they have not changed their identity since the days of their delinquency. If they really are the same, it almost throws a doubt on how far the permanent unforgiveness of sins is expedient. We, of course, refer to human expediency only. The construction of a working hypothesis of life that would favour peace on earth and goodwill towards men, that would establish a modus vivendi and enable us to be jolly with these reprobates, at any rate as soon as they had served their time and picked their oakum. We are not intruding on the province of the theologian, merely discussing the problem of how we can make ourselves pleasant to one another all round, until that final separation of the sheep from the goats, when, however carefully they may have patched up their own little quarrels, they will have to bid each other farewell reluctantly, and make up their minds to the permanent endurance of heaven and hell, respectively. We confess that we ourselves think there ought to be a statute of limitations, and that after a certain lapse of time any offence, however bad, against morality, might be held not to have been committed. If we feel this about culprits who tempted us, at the time of their enormity, to put in every honest hand a whip to lash the rascal naked the length of a couple of lamp-posts, how much more when the offence has been one which our own sense of moral law, a perverted one we admit, scarcely recognises as any offence at all? And how much more yet when we find it hard to believe that they, actually they themselves that we know now, can have done the things imputed to them? If the stories are really true, were they not possessed by evil spirits, or have they since come to be possessed by better ones than their normal stock in trade? What is all this prosy speculation about? Well, it's about our friend in the last chapter, Sally's mother. At least it is suggested by her. She is one of those perplexing cases we have hinted at, and we acknowledge ourselves unable to account for her at the date of the story, knowing what we do of her twenty years previously. It's little enough, mind, and much of it inferential. Suppose, instead of giving you our inferences, we content ourselves with passing on to you the data on which we found them. Maybe you will see your way to some different life history for Sally's mother. The first insight we had into her past was supplied by a friend of Sally's old fossil, who was himself a major, but with a difference, for he was really a major, whereas the fossil was only so called by Krakatoa Villa, being in truth a colonel. This one was Major Roper of the Herkaroo Club, an old schoolfellow of ours who was giving us a cup of coffee and a cigar at the said club, and talking himself hoarse about society. When the Major gets hoarse, his voice rises to a squeak, and his eyes start out of his head, and he appears to swell. I forget how Mrs. Nightingale came into the conversation, but she did somehow. "'She's a very charming woman, that,' squeaked the Major. "'A very charming woman. I don't mind telling you, you know, that I knew her at Madras, ah, uh, before the divorce.' I wouldn't tell Horrocks, nor that dumb young fool Silcox, but I don't mind telling you. Only look here, my dear boy, don't you go putting it about that I told you anything. You know I make it a rule, a guiding rule, never to say anything. You follow that rule through life, my boy. Take the word of an old chap that's seen a deal of service, and just hold your tongue. You make a point. You'll find it pay... <coughs> An asthmatic cough came in here. There was a divorce, then, we said. Terms had to be made with a cough, but speech came in the end. Oh, yes, of course, of course, don't mind repeating that thing was on the papers at the time. What I was suggesting holding your tongue about was that story about Penderfield and her. Well, as I said just now, I don't mind repeating it to you. You ain't Horrocks or little Silcox. You can keep your tongue in your head. Remember, I know nothing. I'm only telling what was said at the time. Now, whatever was her name... Was it Rainer, or was it Vashoyle? Pelu, Pelu. 
The Major tried to call the attention of a man who was deep in an Oriental newspaper at the far end of the next room. But when the Major overstrains his voice, it misses fire like a costermonger's, and only a falsetto note comes out on a high register. When this happens, he is wroth. "'It's all that damn noise they're making,' he says, as soon as he has become articulate. "'That's the man I want, behind the Daily Sunderbund. "'If it wasn't for this damn toe, I'd go across and ask him. "'No, no, don't you go. "'Send one of those damn jumping frogs idling about.' "'He requisitions a passing waiter, gripping him by the arm to give him instructions. "'Just to touch the General's arm and catch his attention. "'Say Major Roper.' "'And he liquidates his obligations to a great deal of asthmatic cough, "'while the jumping frog does his bidding. "'The General,' who was now Lord Pellew of Cutch, by the by, came with an amiable smile from behind the journal, and ended a succession of good-evening nods to newcomers by casting an anchor opposite the Major. The latter, having by now taken the surest steps towards bringing the whole room into his confidence, stated the case he sought confirmation for. Oh, yes, certainly, the General was in Umballa in eighty, remembered the young lady quite well, and the row between Penderfield and his wife about her, as for Penderfield, everybody remembered him, de mortuis nil, etc. Of course, of course, for all that, he was one of the damnedest scoundrels that ever deserved to be turned out of the service. Ought to have been cashiered long ago. Good job he's gone to the devil. Yes, he was quite sure he was remembering the right girl. No, no, he wasn't thinking of Daisy Neversedge, no. No, no, nor of little Mrs. Rennick. Same sort of story, but he wasn't thinking of them at all. Only the name wasn't either Rayner or Vershoyle. General Pellew stood thoughtfully feeling about in a memory at fault, and looking at an unlighted cigar he rolled in his fingers, as though it might help if caressed. Then he had a flash of illumination. Rosalind Graythorpe, he said. Here we had it, sure enough. The Major seesawed in the air with a finger of sudden corroboration. "'Rosalind Graythorpe,' he repeated triumphantly, and then again, "'Rosalind Graythorpe,' dwelling on the syllables and driving the name home, as it were, to the apprehension of all within hearing. It was so necessary to a complete confidence that every one should know whom he was holding his tongue about. Where would be the merit of discretion else? But the enjoyment of details should be sotto voce. The general dropped his voice to a good sample, suggesting a like course to the more demonstrative secrecy of the major. "'I remember the whole story quite well,' said he. "'The girl was going out by herself, to marry a young fellow, up the country at Umbala, I think. They were fiancés, and on the way the news came of the outbreak of cholera, so she got hung up for a while at Penderfield's. Sort of cousin, I believe, him or his wife, till the district was sanitary again.' Bad job for her, as it turned out. Nobody there to warn her what sort of fellow Penderfield was. And if there had been, she wouldn't have believed them. She was a madcap sort of a girl, and regularly in the hands of about as bad a couple as you'll meet with in a long spell, India or anywhere. They used to say out there that she, Penderfield, winked at all her husband's affairs as long as he didn't cut across her little arrangements. Did more than wink, in fact, lent a helping hand but only as long as she could rely on his remaining detached, as you might say. The moment she suspected an entichement on her husband's part, she was up in arms, and he was just the same about her. I remember Lady Sharp saying that if Penderfield had suspected his wife of caring about any of her co-respondents, he would have divorced her at once. They were a rum couple, but their attitude to one another was the only good thing about them. The general lighted his cigar, and seemed to consider this was chapter one. The major appended a footnote for our benefit. "'Leave be' was the word, the word for Penderfield. You'll understand that, sir. No meddling. A good-looking colonel's wife in garrison has her choice. Good Lord, why, she's only got to hold her finger up. We entirely appreciated the position, and that a siren has a much easier task in the entanglement of a confiding dragoon than falls to the lot of Don Giovanni in the reverse case. But we were more interested in the particular story of Mrs. Nightingale than in the general ethics of profligacy. I suppose, we suggested, that the young woman threatened to be a formidable rival, as there was a row. 
Each of the officers nodded at the other, and said that was about it. The Major then started on a little private curriculum of nods on his own account, backed by a half-closed eye of superhuman subtlety, and added once or twice that that was about it. We inferred from this that the row had been volcanic in character. The Major then added, repeating the air-sawing action of his forefinger admonitorily, "'But mind you, I say nothing, and my recommendation to you is say nothing neither.' "'The rest of the story is soon told,' said the General, answering our look of inquiry. "'Miss Greythorpe went away to Umbala to be married. "'It was all gossip, mind you, about herself and Penderfield. "'But gossip always went one way about any girl he was seen with. "'I have my own belief, and so has Jack Roper.' "'The Major underwent a perfect convulsion of nods, winks, and acquiescence. "'Well, she went away and was married to this young shaver, "'who was very little over twenty. "'He wasn't in the service. Civil appointment, I think.' "'How long was it, Major, before they parted? Do you recollect?' "'Week, ten days, month, six weeks, couldn't say. "'They didn't part at the church door, that's all I could say for certain. "'Tell him the rest.' "'They certainly parted very soon, and people told all sorts of stories. "'The stories got fewer and clearer when it came out that the young woman was in the family way. "'No one had any right then to ascribe the child that was on its road "'to any father except the young man she had fallen out with. "'But they did. "'It was laid at Colonel Penderfield's door before there was any sufficient warrant. "'However, it was all clear enough when the child was born. "'When was the divorce? "'He applied for a divorce what, twelve months after the marriage. "'The child was then spoken of as being four months old. "'My impression is he did not succeed in getting a divorce.' "'Not he,' said the Major, overtopping the General's quiet, restrained voice with his falsetta. "'I recollect that, bless you. The court commiserated him, but couldn't give him any relief, so he made a bolt of it, and he's never been heard of since, as far as I know.' "'What did the mother do? Where did she go?' we asked. "'Well, she might have been hard put to it to know what to do, but she met with old Lund, Carrington Lund, you know, not Beecham. He'd a civil appointment at Umritsur. Comes here sometimes, do you know him? She's his Rosie, he talks about. He was an old friend of her father, and took her in and protected her, saw her through it. She came with him to England. I was with them on the boat part of the way, and then she took the name of McNuchton, I believe? The young husband's name. I can't remember the least. But it wasn't McNuchton. The Major squeaked in again. No! not hers either nightingale general that's the name she goes by friend of this gentleman very charming person indeed introduce you and a very charming little daughter going nineteen the two officers interchanged glances over our young friend sally she was a nice baby on the boat said the general and the major chuckled wheezily and hoped she didn't take after her father we left him to the tender mercies of gout and asthma and the enjoyment of a sherry cobbler through a straw, looking rather too fat for his snuff-coloured trousers with a cord outside, and his flowered silk waistcoat, but very much too fat for the straw, the slenderness of which was almost painful by contrast. Perhaps you will see from this why we hinted at the outset of this chapter why Mrs. Nightingale was a conundrum we had given up in despair, of which no one had told us the answer. We wanted your sympathy, you see and to get it have given you an insight into the way our information was gleaned. Having given you this sample, we will now return to a simple narrative of what we know of the true story, and trouble you with no farther details of how we came by it. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Somehow Good by William Friend de Morgan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter 8. The Antecedents of Rosalind Nightingale, Sally's mother. How both came from India to England, and took a villa on a repairing lease. Somewhat of Sally's upbringing, some more roper gossip, and a cat let out of a bag. A piece of presence of mind. Sally Graythorpe. Our Mrs. Nightingale was the daughter of a widowed mother, also called Sally. 
the name in both cases being, as in that of her daughter whom we know, Rosalind, not Sarah. This mother married, en second noce, a former sweetheart. It had been a case of a match opposed by parents on the ground of the apparent hopelessness of the young man's prospects. Mr. Paul Nightingale, however, falsified the doleful predictions about his future by becoming a successful leader-writer and war correspondent. It was after the close of the American Civil War, in which he had gained a good deal of distinction, that he met at Saratoga his old flame, Mrs. Graythorpe, then a widow with a little daughter five or six years old. Having then no wishes to consult but their own, and no reason to the contrary appearing, they were married. They did not find the States the pleasant domicile in the early days following the Great War, and came to England. The little daughter soon became like his own child to Mr. Paul Nightingale, and had his wish been complied with, she would have taken his name during his life. But her mother saw no reason, apparently, for extinguishing Mr. Graythorpe in toto, and she remained Sally Graythorpe. Miss Graythorpe was, at a guess, about fifteen when her stepfather died. Her mother, now for the second time a widow, must have been very comfortably off, as she had an income of her own as well as a life interest in her late husband's invested savings, which was unfettered by any conditions as to her marrying again, or otherwise. She was not long in availing herself of this liberty, for about the time when her daughter was of an age to be engaged on her own account, she accepted a third offer of marriage, this time from a clergyman, who, like herself, had already stood by the deathbeds of two former mates, and was qualified to sympathise with her in every way, including comfortable inheritances. But the young Sally Graythorpe kicked furiously against this new arrangement. It was an insult to papa. She referred to Mr Nightingale. Her real papa was a negligible factor, and she wouldn't live in the same house with that canting old hypocrite, she would go away straight to India and marry Jerry. He would be glad enough to have her. See how constant the dear good boy had been. Not a week passed, but she got a letter. She asked her mother flatly, what could she want to marry again for at her time of life? And such a withered old sow thistle as that. Sub-dean, indeed. She would sub-dean him. In fact, there were words, and the words almost went the length of taking the form known as language par excellence. The fact is, this Sally and her mother never did get on together well. It wasn't the least like her subsequent relation with our special Sally, Sally number three, who trod on Mr. Fenwick in the Tuppany Tube. The end of the words was a letter to Jerry, a liberal trousseau, and a first-class passage out by P&O. The young lady's luggage for the baggage room was beautifully stenciled, care of Sir Ortred Penfield, the residency, Copal perfectly safe in his keeping, no doubt it would have been, but then that might have been true also of luggage if consigned to the devil. If the tale hinted at in our last chapter was true, its poor little headstrong, inexperienced heroine would have been about as safe with the latter. Anyway, this club gossip supplies the broad outline of the story, and it is a story we need not dwell on. It gives us no means of reconciling the like of the Mrs. Nightingale we know now, with the amount of dissimulation, if not treachery, she must have practised on an unsuspicious boy, assuming that she did, as a matter of course, conceal her relation with Penderfield. One timid conjecture we have is that the girl, having to deal with a subject every accepted phrase relating to which is an equivocation or a hypocrisy, really found it impossible to make her position understood by a lover who simply idolised the ground she trod on. Under such circumstances, she may either have given up the attempt in despair, or jumped too quickly to the conclusion that she had succeeded in communicating the facts, and had been met halfway by forgiveness. Put yourself in her position, and resolve in your mind exactly how you would have gone about it, how you would have got a story of that sort, forced into the mind of a welcoming lover, wedged into the heart of his unsuspicious rapture. Or if you fancied he understood you, and no storm of despairing indignation came, think how easy it would be to persuade yourself you had done your duty by the facts, and let the matter lapse. Why should not one woman once take advantage of the obscurities of decorum so many a man has found comforting to his soul during confession of sin? when pouring his revelations into an ear 
whose owner's experience of life has not qualified her to understand them. Think of the difficulty you yourself have encountered in getting at the absolute facts in some delicate concurrence of circumstances in this connection, because of the fundamental impossibility of getting anyone, man or woman, to speak direct truth. Let us find out, or construct, all the excuses we can for poor Miss Graythorpe. Let us imagine the last counsel she had from the only one of her own sex who would be likely to know anything of the matter, the nefarious partner, if the Major's surmise was true, in the crime of her betrayer. You're making a fuss about nothing. Men are not so immaculate themselves. Your Jerry is no Joseph. If he rides his high horse with you, just you ask him what he had to say to Potiphar's wife. Oh, we're not so straight-laced out here, bless us alive, as we are in England, or pretend to be. We can fancy the elegant brute saying it. All our surmises bring us very little light, though. It is not that we are at such a loss to forgive poor Sally Graythorpe as a mere human creature we know nothing about. The difficulty is to reconcile what she seems to have been then with what she is now. We give it up. Only we wish to remark that it is her offence against her fiancé alone that we find hard to stomach. As to her relations with Colonel Penderfield, we can say nothing without full particulars, and even if we had them, and they bore hard upon Miss Graythorpe, our mind would go back to the temple in Jerusalem, and a morning nearly two thousand years ago. The voice that said, Who was to cast the first stone, is heard no more, or has merged in ritual, but the scribes and Pharisees are with us still, and quite ready to do the pelting. We should be harder on the colonel, no doubt, with our prejudices. Only observe, he isn't brought up for judgment. He never is, any more than the other party was that day in Jerusalem. But then the scribes and Pharisees were male, and they had the courage of their convictions, their previous convictions, and acted on them in their selection of the culprit. Without further apology for retailing conjecture as certainty, the following may be taken as substantially the story of this lady. We do not know whether to call her a divorced or a deserted wife, and her little encumbrance. She found a resource in her trouble, in the person of this old friend of her stepfather, Paul Nightingale, Colonel, at that time Major, Lund. This officer had remained on in harness to the unusual age of fifty-eight, but it was a civil appointment he held. He had retired from active service in the ordinary course of things. It was probably not only because of his old friendship for her stepfather, but because the poor girl told him her unvarnished tale in full, and he believed it, that he helped and protected her through the critical period that followed her parting from her husband, found her a domicile and seclusion, and enlisted on her behalf the sympathies of more than one officer's wife at our Sally's birthplace, Um Ritzel, if Major Roper was right. He corresponded with her mother as intercessor and mediator, but that good lady was in no mood for mercy. Had her daughter not told her that she was too old to think of marriage? Too old! And had she not called her venerable sub-dean a withered old sow-thistle? She could forgive, under guarantees of the sinner's repentance, for had not her lord enjoined forgiveness when the bail tendered was sufficient? Only... So many reservations and qualifications occurred in her interpretations of the gospel narrative that forgiveness, diluted out of all knowledge, left its perpetrator free to refuse ever to see its victim again. But she would pray for her. A subdiagonal application would receive attention. That was the suggestion between the lines. The kind-hearted old soldier pooh-poohed her first letters. She would come round in time. Her natural good feeling would get the better of her when she had had her religious fling. He didn't put it so, a strict Puritan of the old school. But that was Miss Graythorpe's gloss in her own mind on what he did say. However, her mother never did come round. She cherished her condemnation of her daughter to the end, forgiving her again more suo, if anything, with increased asperity on her deathbed. This Colonel Lund is, have we mentioned this before, the old fossil whom we have seen at Krakatoa Villa. He was usually called the Major there from early association. He continued to foster and shelter his protégé during the year following the arrival of our own particular young Sally on the scene, saw her safely through her divorce proceedings, and then, 
when he finally retired from his post as deputy commissioner for the Umritsur district, arranged that she herself, with her encumbrance and an ayah, should accompany him to England. His companion travelled as Mrs. Graythorpe, and Sally Junior as Mrs. Graythorpe's baby. She was excessively popular on the voyage. Sally was not suffering from seasickness, or feeling apparently the least embarrassed by the recent bar sinister in her family. She courted society, seizing it by its whiskers or its curls, and holding on like grim death. She endeavoured, successively, to get into the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Atlantic, but failed in every attempt, and was finally landed at Southampton in safety. After a resolute effort to drag the captain, who was six feet three high and weighed twenty stone, ashore by his beard, she was greatly missed on the remainder of the voyage to Bremen. The boat was a German boat, by a family of bonds, who fortunately never guessed at the flaw in Sally's extraction, or there's no knowing what might have happened. But the arrival was too late for her poor mother to utilise her services towards a reconciliation with her own offended parent. A sudden attack of influenza, followed by low diet on high principles, and uncombated by timely port wine and tonics, had been followed by heart failure, and the sub-dean was left free to marry again. Again. Whether he did so or not doesn't matter to us. The scheme Mrs. Graythorpe had been dwelling on with pleasure through the voyage of simply dropping her offspring on its grandmother and leaving it to drive a coach and six through the latter's Christian forgiveness was not come to pass. She found herself, after a year and a half of Oriental life, back in her native land, an orphan with a small, but it must be admitted very charming, illegitimate family. It was hard upon her for she had been building on the success of this manoeuvre, in which she had perhaps an unreasonable confidence. If she could only rely on Sally not being inopportunely sick over Mamma just at the critical moment, that was the only misgiving that crossed her mind. Otherwise such creases and such a hilarious laugh would be too much for starch itself. Poor lady! She had thought to herself more than once, since Sally had begun to mature and consolidate, that if Jerry had only waited a little just long enough to see what a little duck was going to come of it all, and not lost his temper, all might have been made comfortable, and Sally might have had a little legitimate half-brother by now. What had become, what would become of Jerry? That she did not know, might never know. One little pleasant surprise awaited her. It came to her knowledge for the first time that she was sole heir to the estate of her late stepfather, Paul Nightingale. The singular practice that we believe to exist in many families of keeping back all information about testamentary dispositions as long as possible from the persons they concern, especially minors, had been observed in her case, and her mother, perhaps resenting the idea that her daughter, a young chit, should presume to outlive her, had kept her in ignorance of the contents of her stepfather's will. It did not really matter much. Had the sum been large and a certainty, it might have procured for her a safer position when a temporary guest at the residency at Copal, or even caused her indignant young bridegroom to think twice before he took steps to rid himself of her. But after all, it was only some three hundred and fifty pounds a year, and depended on the life of a lady of forty-odd who might live to be a hundred. A girl with no more than that is nearly as defenceless as she is without it. A condition was attached to the bequest, not an unwelcome one. She was to take her stepfather's name, Nightingale. She was really very glad to do this. There was a faux air of a real married name about Mrs. Nightingale that was lacking in Mrs. Graythorpe. Besides, all troublesome questions about who Sally's father was would get lost sight of in the fact that her mother had changed her name in connection with that sacred and glorious thing an inheritance. A trust fund would always be a splendid red herring to draw across the path of Mrs. Grundy's sleuth-hounds, a quarry more savoury to their nostrils even than a reputation. And nothing soothes the sceptical more than being asked now and then to witness a transfer of stock, especially if it is money held in trust. It has all the force of a pleasant alterative pill on the circulation of respectability removes obstructions and promotes appetite, 
is a certain remedy for sleeplessness, and so forth. So though there wasn't a particle of reason why Mrs. Nightingale's money should be held by any one but herself, as she had no intention whatever of marrying, Colonel Lund consented to become her trustee, and both felt that something truly respectable had been done, something that, if it didn't establish a birthright and a correct extraction for Miss Sally, at any rate went a long way towards it. By the time Mrs. Nightingale had got settled in the little house at Shepherd's Bush, that she took on a twenty-one years' lease, five or six years after her return to England, and had christened it Saratoga, after her early recollection of the place where she first saw her stepfather, whose name she took when she came into the money he left her, by this time she, with the assistance of Colonel Lund, had quite assumed the appearance of a rather comfortably off young widow lady, who did not make a great parade of her widowhood, but whose circumstances seemed reasonable enough, and challenged no inquiry. Inquisitiveness would have seemed needless impertinence, just as much so as yours would have been in the case of the hypothetical so-and-sos at the beginning of our last chapter. A vague impression got in the air that Sally's father had not been altogether satisfactory. Well, wasn't it true? It may have leaked out from something in the Major's manner, but it never produced any effect on friends, except that they saw in it a reason why Mrs. Nightingale never mentioned her husband. He had been a black sheep. Silence about him showed good feeling on her part. De mortuis, etc. Of one thing we feel quite certain that if, at the time we made this lady's acquaintance, any chance friend of hers or her daughter's, say, for instance, Letitia Wilson, Sally's old school friend and present music colleague, had been told that Mrs. Nightingale of Krakatoa Villa No. 7 Glenmoira Road, Shepherd's Bush West, had been the heroine of divorce proceedings under queer circumstances, that her husband wasn't dead at all, and that dear little puss Sally was goodness knows whose child, we feel certain that the information would have been cross-countered with a blank stare of incredulity. Why, the mere fact that Mrs. Nightingale had refused so many offers of marriage was surely sufficient to refute such a nonsensical idea. Who ever heard of a lady with a soiled record refusing a good offer of marriage? But while we are showing our respect for what the man in the street says or thinks, and the woman in the street thinks and says, are we not losing sight of a leading phrase of the symphony, sonata, cantata, whatever you like to call it, of Mrs. Nightingale's life? A phrase that steals in just audibly, no more, in the most strepitoso passage of a stormy second movement, a movement, however, in which the proceedings of the divorce court are scarcely more audible, pianissimo legato, a chorus with closed lips, all the stringed instruments sordini, but it grows and grows in allegro con fuoco on the voyage home, and only leaves a bar or two blank when the thing it metaphorically represents is asleep and isn't suffering from the wind. It breaks out again vivacissimo accelerando when Miss Sally, whom we allude to, wakes up and doesn't appreciate Nestlé's milk. But it always grows, and in due course may be said to become the music itself. More intelligibly, Mrs. Nightingale became so wrapped up in her baby that had seemed to her at first a cruel embarrassment, a thing to be concealed and ignored, that very soon she really had no time to think about where she broke her molasses jug, as Uncle Remus says. The new life that it had become hers to guard took her out of herself, made her quite another being from the reckless and thoughtless girl of two years ago. As time went on, she felt more and more the value of the newcomer's indifference to her extraction and the tragedy that had attended it. A living creature with a stupendous capacity for ignoring the past, and indeed everything except a monotonous diet, naturally gave her mind a bias towards the future, and hope grew in her heart unconsciously, without reminding her that it might have been despair. A bad alarm when the creature was six months old that an enteric attack might end fatally, had revealed to its mother how completely it had taken possession of her own life, and what a power for compensation there was, even in its most imperious and tyrannical habits. As it gradually became articulate, however unreasonable it continued, her interest in its future extinguished her memories of her own past, and she found herself devising games for baby, 
before the little character was old enough to play them, and costumes before she was big enough to wear them. By the time Saratoga Villa had become Krakatoa, Miss Sally had had time to benefit by a reasonable allowance of the many schemes her mother had developed for her during her infancy. Had all the projects which were mooted for her further education at this date been successfully carried out, she would have been an admirable female Crichton, if her reason had survived the curriculum. Luckily for her, she had a happy faculty for being plucked at examinations, and her education was consequently kept within reasonable bounds. There was, however, one department of culture in which Sally outshot all competitors. This was swimming. She would give a bath's length at the Paddington Baths to the next strongest swimmer in the ladies' club, and come in triumphant in a race of ten lengths. It was a grand sight to see Sally rushing stem on, cleaving the water with her head almost as if breath were an affectation, and doubling back at the end while the other starters were scarcely halfway. Or shooting through the air in her little blue costume straight for the deepest water, and then making believe to be a fish on the shiny tiles at the bottom. Her mother always said that she was certain that if the little monkey had managed to wriggle through some hole into the sea on the voyage home, she would have swum after the ship and climbed up the rudder chains. Possibly, but she was only twelve months old. If, however, she had met with an early death, her mother's lot would have lacked its redemption. The joint life of the two supplies a possible answer to the conundrum that has puzzled us. For in a certain sense, the absorption of her own existence in that of another than herself had made of Rosalind the woman, at the date of our introduction to her, quite another person from Rosalind the hot-headed and thoughtless girl that had quarrelled with her natural guardian for doing what she had a perfect right to do, and had steered alone into unknown seas, a ship without rudder or compass, and very little knowledge of the stars of heaven for her guide. We can see what she is now, much better than we can judge what she was then. It need not be supposed that this poor lady never felt any interest, never made any inquiry about the sequel of the life she had so completely bouleversée, for whatever blame we feel bound to express, or whatever exculpation we contrive to concoct for her, there can be no doubt what the result was to the young man who has come into the story, so far, only under the name of Jerry. We simply record his designation as it has reached us, in the data we are now making use of. It is all hearsay about a past. We add what we have been able to gather, merely noting that what it seems to point to recommends itself to us as probable. Nobody knew, nobody cared, was our friend Major Roper's brief reply to an inquiry what became of this young man. Why, good Lord, sir, he went on, if one was to begin fussing about all the johnnies that shy off when there's a row of that sort, one would never get a damn night's rest. Not but what if I could recollect his name. Now, what was his confounded name? Thought I'd got it, but no. Wasn't Messeter. Fancy his Christian name was Jeremiah. I recollect Messeter, I'm thinking of. Character that looked as if he had a pain in his stomach. Came into forty thousand pounds. Stop a bit. Was it Indemar? No, no, it wasn't Indemar. No use guessing. Give it up. Besides, the Major was getting purple with suppressed coughing. When he had given it up, he surrendered unconditionally to the cough, but was presently anxious to transmit, through its subsidence, an idea that he found it impossible to shake across the table between us out of an inarticulate forefinger end. It assumed form in time. Why not ask the lady herself? We demurred, and the old soldier explained. Not rushing at her, you know, and saying, Who the deuce was it married you, ma'am? I'm not a dem fool. Showing tact, you know, putting it easy and accidental. Who was that young beggar now? Inspector, surveyor, something of the sort, up at Umbala in 79. Barampator Irrigation, that's what he was on. And Lord bless you, my dear sir, you don't suppose she'll up and say, I suppose you mean that dem husband of mine? Not she. Sensible woman, that, sir, seen the world, knows a thing or two. You'll see, she'll only say, that was Foodle, or Parker, or Stebbins, or Jepson, as may be, according to the name. We did not see our way to this enterprise, and said so. We drew a line, 
said there were things you could do and things you couldn't do. The Major chuckled and admitted this might be so. His old governor used to say, Est modus in rebus sunt certi denique finis. <laughs> the last two words remained behind in the cough, unless, indeed, they were shaken out of the Major's forefinger into a squeezed lemon that was awaiting its seltzer. "'But I can tell you the thing, Mr...' said he, forgetting our name, as soon as he felt soothed by the lemon squash. "'He didn't keep his name. That young man didn't. You may bet he didn't safely. Only it's no use asking me why, nor what he changed it to. If it was him that was lost in the bush in New South Wales when I was at Sydney, why, of course, that chap's name was the same. I remember that much. Can't get hold of the name, though.' He appeared to consult the pattern on his silk pocket handkerchief as an oracle, and to await its answer with a thoughtful eye. Presently he blew his nose on the oracle, and returned it to his pocket, adding, "'But it's a speculation, little speculation of my own. Don't ask me!' We saw, however, that more would come without asking, and it came. "'It made a talk out there at the time, but that didn't bring him to life.' You may talk till your horse, but you won't bring a dead man to. Not when he's twenty miles off in a forest of gum trees as like as tallow candles. Oh, yes, they had the natives put on the scent. Black trackers, they call them. But it was no use. They only followed the scent of his horse. And the horse came back a fortnight after with them on his heels, an hour or so behind. He'd only just left his party a moment and meant to come back into the open. I suppose he thought he was sure to cross the cutting and got trapped in the solid woodland. "'What was the speculation? "'You said just now, "'Not much to go by,' said the Major, "'shaking a discouraging head. "'Another joker with another name "'who turned up a hundred miles off. "'Harrison, I fancy. "'Yes, Harrison. "'It was only my idea they were the same. "'I came away. "'I don't know how they settled it.' "'But something, Major Roper, "'must have made you think this man the same, "'the same as Jeremiah Indemar, "'or whatever his name was.' "'Mrs. Nightingale's man?' "'Something must. "'What it was is another pair of shoes.' "'He cogitated and reflected, but seemed to get no nearer. "'You ask Pelu,' he said. "'He might give you a tip.' "'Then he called for a small glass of cognac, "'because the seltzer was such damn chilly stuff, "'and the dry sherry was no use at all. "'We left him arranging the oracle over his face, "'with a view to a serious nap.' We got a few words shortly after with General Pellew, who seemed a little surprised at the Major's having referred to him for information. "'I don't know,' said he, "'why our friend Roper shouldn't recollect as much about it as I do. However, I do certainly remember that when this young gentleman, whatever his name was, left the station, he did go to Sydney or Melbourne, and I have some hazy recollection of someone saying that he was lost in the bush. But why old Jack fancies he was found again, or changed his name to Harrison, I haven't the slightest idea. So all that we ourselves succeeded in getting at about Jerry may be said to have been the trap-door he vanished through. Whether Mrs. Nightingale got at other sources of information we cannot say. Whatever she learned she would be sure to keep her own counsel about. She may have concluded that the bones of the husband who had in a fit of anger deserted her had been picked by white ants twenty years ago in an Australian forest, or she may have come to know, by some means, of his resuscitation from the bush, and his successes or failures in later life elsewhere. We have had our own reasons for doubting that she ever knew that he took the name of Harrison, if he really did, a point which seems to us very uncertain, so far as the Major's narrative went. If she did get a scrap of tidings, a flying word about him now and again, it was most likely all she got and when she got it she would feel the danger of further inquiry, the difficulty of laying the reasons for her curiosity before her informant. You can't easily say to a stranger, oh, do tell us about Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith, she or he is our divorced or separated wife or husband. A German might, but Mrs. Nightingale was not German. However, she may have heard something about that Jerry, we grant you, in all those twenty long years, but if you ask us our opinion... Our private opinion, it is that she scarcely heard of him, if she heard at all, and certainly never set eyes on him, until one day her madcap little daughter brought him home, half killed by an electric shock, 
in a cab we were at some pains to describe accurately a few pages ago. And even then, had it not been for the individualities of that cab, she might have missed seeing him, and let him go away to the infirmary or the police station, and probably never been near him again. As it was, the face she saw when a freak of chance led her to following that cab, and looking in out of mere curiosity at his occupant, was the face of her old lover, of her husband. Eighteen, twenty years had made a man of one who was then little more than a boy. The mark of the world he had lived in was on him, and it was the mark of a rough, strong world where one fights, and, if one is a man of this sort, maybe wins. But she never doubted his identity for a moment and the way in which she grasped the situation, above all the fact that he had not recognised her and would not recognise her, quite justified, to our thinking, Major Roper's opinion of her powers of self-command. Nevertheless, these were not so absolute that her demeanour escaped comment from the cabby, the only witness of her first sight of the electrocuted man. He spoke of her afterwards as that squealing party down that sanguinary little turning off shepherd's bush road he took that sanguinary galvanic shock to end of chapter eight chapter nine of somehow good this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by helen taylor oxford u k chapter nine how those girls do chatter over their music. Mrs. Nightingale's resolution, but the risk. A hard part to play. There was only Mamma for the girl. The garden of long ago. Two parts in a sestet, played alone, may be a maddening torture to a person whose musical imagination is not equal to supplying the other four. Perhaps you have heard Haydn, opus 1704 and rejoiced in the logical consecutiveness of its fugues the indisputableness of its well-classified statements the swift pertinence of the repartees of the first violin to the second the apt resume and orderly reorganization of their epigrammatic interchanges by the cello and double bass the steady typewritten report and summary of the whole by the pianoforte and the regretful exception to so many points taken by the clarionet if so, you have no doubt felt, as we have, a sense of perfect satisfaction at faultless musical structure, without having to surrender your soul unconditionally to the passionate appeal of a Beethoven, or to split your musical brains and conjectures about what Volkanikovsky is driving at. You will find at the end that you have passed an hour or so of tranquil enjoyment and are mighty content with yourself, the performers, and everybody else. But if you only hear the two parts played alone, and your mental image of all the other parts is not strong enough to prevent your hearing the two performers count the bars, while the non-performers don't do anything at all, you will probably go away and come back presently, or go mad. Nobody else was there when Sally and Letitia Wilson were counting four, and beginning too soon, and having to go back and begin all over again, and missing a bar, and knocking down their music stands when they had to turn over quick. So nobody went mad. Mamma had gone to an anti-vaccination meeting, and Athene had gone to stay over bank holiday at Leighton Buzzard, and the boys had gone to skate, and Papa was in his study, and didn't matter, and they had the drawing-room to themselves. Oh dear, how very often they did count four, to be sure. Sally was distrait, and wasn't paying proper attention to the music. Whenever a string had to be tightened by either, Sally introduced foreign matter. Letitia was firm and stern. She was twenty-four, if you please, and wouldn't respond. As thus, in a tightening-up pause. "'I like him awfully, you know, Tishy. In fact, I love him. It's a pleasure to hear him come into the house. Only... One's mother, you know. It's the oddity of it. Yes, dear. Now, are you ready? It only clickets down because you will not screw in. It's no use turning and leaving the key sloppy. I know, Tishy, dear. Teach your granny. There, I think that's right now. But it is funny when it's one's mother, isn't it? 
One, two, three, four. There, you didn't begin. Remember, you've got to begin on the demi-semi-quaver at the end of the bar. Only not too staccato, remember? And allow for the pause. Now, one, two, three, four. And you begin in the middle of four, not the end. Oh, dear. Now, once more, etc. You will see at once from this that Sally had lost no time in finding a confidant for the fossil's communication. An hour and a half of resolute practising makes you not at all sorry for an oasis in the counting, which you inaugurate, or whatever you do when it's an oasis, by smashing the top coal and making a great blaze, and then you go ever so close and can talk. Are you sure it isn't Colonel Lund's mistake? Old gentlemen get very fanciful. Thus, Miss Wilson. But it seems Sally hasn't much doubt, rather the other way round, if anything. I thought it might be all the way to Norland Square, then I changed my mind coming up the hill. Of course, I don't know about Mamma till I ask her, but I expect the Major's right about Mr. Fenwick. But how does he know? How do you know? I don't know. Sally tastes the point of a holly leaf with her tongue tip, discreetly, to see how sharp they are, and cogitates. At least, she continues, I do know. He never takes his eyes off Mamma from the minute he comes into the house. Oh. Besides, lots of things. Oh, no, as far as that goes, I should say he was spoony. I see. You're a vulgar child all the same. But about your mother, that's the point. The vulgar child cogitates still more gravely. I should say now, she says, after thinking it over, that only I never noticed it at the time, you know. That what? That Mamma knows Mr. Fenwick is spoony, and looks up at times to see that he's going on. Letitia seemed to receive this idea with some hesitation or reserve. Looks up at times to see if he's going on, she repeats inquiringly. Yes, of course, like we should. Only I didn't say see if, I said see that. It makes all the difference. Miss Wilson breaks into a laugh. And there you are, all the time looking as if butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, and as grave as a judge. Sally had to acquiesce to being kissed by her friend at this point, but she curls up a little as one who protests against being patronised. Well, she says, lengthening out the word, why not? I don't see anything in that. Oh no, dear, that's all right. Why shouldn't it be? But this isn't candid of Letitia, whose speech and kiss had certainly appeared to impute suppressed insight, or penetration, or sly pussness, or something of the sort, to her young friend, but with an implied claim of rights of insight on her own account from seniority. Sally is froise at this, but not beyond jerking the topic into a new light. Of course it's their being grown up that makes one stare so, if it wasn't for that. But this gives away her case surrenders all claim to her equality with Letitia's twenty-four years. The advantage is caught at, meanly. That's only because you're a baby, dear. Wait till you're ten years older, and thirty-eight won't seem so old. I suppose your mother's about that. Mother? Why, she's nearly thirty-nine. And Mr. Fenwick? Oh, he's forty-one, quite, because we talked it all over, and made out they were over eighty between them. Who talked it over? Why, him and her and me, of course, last night. Who did you have, Sally dear? Only ourselves and Dr. Prosy and his goody mother. I thought, Mr. Fenwick, I counted him in with us, mother and me and the Major. Oh, you counted him in. Why shouldn't I count him in, if I like? Why not? And you do like? There is an appearance of irritating sagacity about Sally's friend. What did Dr. Vereker say, Sally dear? Dr. Vereker. Dr. Prosy. Prosy's not a referee. It was no concern of his. Besides, they'd gone. Who'd gone? Dr. Prosy and his old hen of a mother. Well, Tishy dear, she is like that. Comes wobbling down on you as if you were a chicken. I hope you don't think Mother and I and Mr. Fenwick would talk about how old we were added together with old goody Prosy in it. Of course not, dear. Oh, Tishy dear, how aggravating you are. Now do please don't be penetrating. You know you're trying to get at something, and there's nothing to get at. It was perfectly natural. Only, of course, we should never dream of talking about how old before people and their gossipy old mothers. 
"'Of course not, dear. "'There now, you're being imperturbable. "'I knew you would. "'But you may say what you like. "'There really was nothing in it. "'Nothing whatever that time. "'However, of course, Mother does like Mr. Fenwick very much. "'Everybody knows that.' Letitia says time will show, and Sally says, show what? For the remark connects with nothing in the conversation. Its maker does not reply, but retires into the fastnesses of a higher philosophy, unknown to the teens, but somehow attainable in the early twenties. She comes down, however, to ask after Dr. Vereker. Sally has as good as held her tongue about him. Have they quarrelled? My dear Tishy, the idea! A perfect stranger! I thought you were such good friends. I've nothing against Dr. Vereker, but fancy quarrelling with him, like bosom friends, kissing and making it up. What next? Letitia seems to have discovered that Sally, subjected to a fixed amused look, is sure to develop, and maintains one, and Sally follows on. One has to be on an intimate footing to fall out. Besides, people shouldn't be hen's sons, not if they expect that sort of thing. Which sort? You know perfectly well, Tishy dear, and they shouldn't be worthy either, people shouldn't. I'm not at all sure it isn't his worthiness, just as much as his mother. I could swallow his mother if it came to that. Letitia, without relaxing the magnetism of her look, is replacing a defective string. But a stimulating word will keep Sally up to the mark. It would be a pity she should die down, having got so far. Not at all sure what isn't his worthiness. Now, Tishy, dear, what nonsense, as if you didn't understand. You may just as well be penetrating outright if you're going to go on like that. All I know is that worthiness or no, if Dr. Vereker expects I'm going to put him on a quarrelling footing, he's mistaken. And the sooner he gives up the idea, the better. I suppose he'll be wanting me to cherish him next. And then what does that irritating Letitia Wilson do but say suddenly, I'm quite ready for the skirt, so dear, if you are? Just as if Sally had been talking all this for her own private satisfaction and amusement. And she knew perfectly well, Letitia did, that she had been eliciting, and that she meant to wait a day or two, and begin again ever so far on, and make believe Sally had said heaps of things, and Sally had really said nothing. Nothing! However... Miss Wilson was certainly a very fine violin figure, and really striking in long sostenuto notes, with a fine throat and handsome fingers on her left hand with broad bones, and a handsome wrist on her bowing arm where it was wanted. Only now, of course, she hadn't got her Egyptian bracelet that looked so well, and her hair wasn't done in a coronet, but only just twisted up anyhow. Besides, when it's a difficult skirt so, and you take it quick, your appearance of having the concentration of Bonaparte and Julius Caesar and the alacrity of a wild cat doesn't bring out your good points. Give us an andante maestoso movement or a diminuendo rallentando that reaches the very climax and acme of slowness itself just before the applause comes. It was rather as a meditation in contrasts, though, that Sally thought thus to herself for detached musical jerks of diabolical rapidity that have to be snapped at with the punctuality of the mosquito-slayer don't show your rounded lines to advantage and make you clench your teeth and glare horribly. Our story is like the scherzo in one respect. It has to be given in detached jerks, literary, not musical, and these jerks don't come at any stated intervals at all. The music was bad enough, so Sally and Letitia thought, but the chronicle is more spasmodic still. However, if you want to know its remaining particulars, you will have to brace yourself up to tolerating an intermittent style. It is the only one our means of collecting information admits of. This little musical interlude, and the accidental chat of our two young performers, gives us a kind of idea of what was the position of things at Krakatoa Villa six months after Fenwick made his singular reappearance in the life of Mrs. Nightingale. We shall rely on your drawing all our inferences. There is only one belief of ours we need to lay stress upon. It is that the lady scheme to do all she could to recapture and hold this man who had been her husband was no mere slow suggestion of the course of events in that six months, but a swift and decisive resolution, one that, 
if not absolutely made at once, paused only in the making until she was quite satisfied that the disappearance of Fenwick's past was an accomplished fact. Once satisfied of that, he became to her simply the man she had loved twenty years ago, the man who did not, could not, forgive her what seemed so atrocious a wrong, but whom she could forgive the unforgiveness of, and this all the more if she had come to know of the ruinous effect her betrayal of him had had, must have had, upon his after-life. He was this man, this very man, to all appearance with a mysterious veil drawn, perhaps for ever, over the terrible close of their brief linked life and its hideous cause, over all that she would have asked and prayed should be forgotten. If only this oblivion could be maintained. That was her fear. If it could, what task could be sweeter to her than to make him such amends as lay in her power for the wrong she had done him, how faultfully, who shall say, and if in late old age no dawn of memory having gleamed his ruined mind, she came to be able to speak to him and tell him his own story, the tale of the wreck of his early years, would not that almost, almost, carry with it a kind of compensation for what she had undergone? But her terror of seeing a return of memory now was a haunting nightmare to her. She could only soothe and alleviate her anxiety by suggesting efforts at recollection to Fenwick and observing with concealed satisfaction how utterly useless they all were. She felt guilty at heart in being so happy at his ill success, and had to practice an excusable hypocrisy, an affectation of disappointment at his repeated failures. On one particular occasion, a shudder of apprehension passed through her. She thought he had got a clue. If he did, what was to prevent his following it up? She found it hard to say to him how sorry she was this clue led to nothing, and to forecast from it encouragement for the future. But she said to herself after that that she was a good actress, and had played her part well. The part was a hard one. For what came about was this. It chanced one evening, some three months after the railway adventure, when Fenwick had become an accepted and constant visitor at Krakatoa Villa, that as he took a very late leave of Sally and her mother, the latter came out with him into the always quiet road, while Sally ran back into the house to direct a letter he was to post, but which had been forgotten for the moment, just as he was departing. They had talked a great deal, and with a closer familiarity than ever before, of the problem of Fenwick's oblivion. Both ladies had gone on the lines of suggesting clues, trying to recall to him the things that must have been in his life, as in others. How about his parents? Well, he remembered that, as a fact, he had a father and mother. It was themselves he could not recollect. How about his school days? No, that was a blank. He could not even remember having been flogged. Yet the idea of school was not unfamiliar. How otherwise could he laugh as he did at the absurdity of forgetting all about it, especially being flogged? But his brothers, his sisters, how could he forget them? He did, although in their case, as in that of his parents, he somehow knew that some definite identities had existed that he had forgotten. But any effort to recall any specific person came to nothing, or else he had only succeeded in reviving images manifestly confused with characters in fiction or history. Then Sally, who was rather incredulous about his complete vacuity of mind, had said to him, "'But come now, Mr. Fenwick, you don't mean to say you don't know if you ever had a sweetheart?' And he had replied with a laugh, "'My dear Miss Sally, I'm sure I must have had plenty of sweethearts. Perhaps it's because I had so many that I have forgotten them all.' all, all, they are all gone with the rest. I can do sums, and can speak French, but what school I learned to keep accounts at I can't tell you, and as to where I lived, as I must have done, among French people to speak French, I can tell no more than Adam. And then he had become rather reserved and silent till he got up to go, and they had not liked to press him for more. The pained look they had often been distressed to see came on his face, and he pressed his fingers on his eyelids as though shutting out the present world might help him to recall the past. Then, with a rough head-shake of his thick hair, like a big dog, and a brushing of it about with both hands, 
as though it would rouse his useless head into some sort of action, he put the whole thing aside and talked of other matters till he left the house. But when he and Mrs. Nightingale found themselves alone in the road, enjoying the delicious west wind that meant before the morning to become an equinoctial gale and blow down chimney-pots and sink ships, he turned to her and went back to what they had been talking of. She could see the fine, strong markings of his face in the moonlight, the great jaw and firm lips, the handsome nose damaged by a scar that lay true across the bridge of it and looked white in the gleam of the moon, the large, sad eyelids and the grave eyes that had retaken the look he'd shaken off. She could note and measure every change maturity had stamped upon him, and could see behind it the boy that had come to meet her at the station at Umbala twenty years before, had met her full of hope, met her to claim his reward after the long delay through the hideous days of the pestilence, to inaugurate the anticipated hours of happiness he had trembled to dream of. And the worst of the collar awards that had filled the last months of his life with horror had held nothing for him so bad as the tale she had to tell, or conceal. She could see back upon it as they stood there in the moonlight. Do not say she was not a strong woman. Do you know, Mrs. Nightingale, Fenwick said, it's always a night of this sort that brings back one's youth. You know what I mean? I think I understand what you mean, Mr. Fenwick. You mean if... She hesitated a moment. If you could recollect... He nodded a complete yes. Just that, said he. I don't know if it's the millions of dry leaves sweeping about, or the moon scudding so quick through the clouds, or the smell of the Atlantic, or the bark coming off the plane trees, or the winds blowing the roads into smooth dust drifts and hard clear-ups you could eat your dinner off. Ah, I don't know what it is. But something or another, on a night of this sort, does always seem to bring old times back, when, as you say, they can be got back on any terms. He half laughed, not in earnest. She found something to say, also not very much in earnest. Because we remember nights of the sort when we were small, and that brings them back. Come, I say now, Mrs. Nightingale, as if we couldn't remember all sorts of nights and nothing comes back about them. It's this particular sort of night does the job. Do you think you remembered something, Mr. Fenwick? There was anxiety in her voice, but no need to conceal it. It would as readily pass muster for anxiety that he should have remembered something as that he shouldn't. I can hardly go so far as that. But that joke of your little pussycat about the sweethearts got mixed with the smell of the wind and the chrysanthemums and dahlias and sunflowers. He pressed his fingers hard on his eyes again. Do you know, there's pain in it, worse than you'd think. The half-idea that comes is not painful in itself, rather the contrary, but it gives my brain a twist at the point at which I can recall no more. Yes, it's painful. But there was a half-idea? Forgive me if it gives you pain, and don't try, only I'm not sure you ought not to try when the chance comes, for your own sake. Oh, I don't mind trying. This time it was something about a front garden and a girl and a dog-cart. He had not taken his hands from his eyes. Now he did so, brushing them on his hair and forehead as before. "'I get no nearer,' said he. "'A front garden and a girl and a dog-cart.' Thus Miss Sally saucily coming out with a letter. "'Did you have a very touching parting, Mr. Fenwick? Now mind you don't forget to post it. I wouldn't trust you.' He took the letter from her, but seemed too distrait to notice her little piece of levity, then, still speaking as if in distress or pain, he said, "'It must have been some front garden long ago. This one brought it back, this and the leaves. Only there was nothing for the dog-cart. And only Mamma for the girl.' Thus Sally the irrepressible, and then Mamma laughed, but not Mr. Fenwick at all. Only Sally thought that her mother's laugh came hard, and said to herself, "'Now she should catch it for chaffing.' However, she didn't catch it although the abruptness with which her mother said good-night and went back into the house half confirmed her impression that she should. On the contrary, when she followed her a few minutes later, having accompanied Fenwick to near the road end, and scampered back to the house, turning to throw Parthian good-nights after him, she found her mother pale and thoughtful, 
and surely the lips and hands she used to kiss her with were cold. She wasn't even sure that wasn't a tear. Perhaps it was. For Mamma had had a bad ten minutes, scarcely a mauvais quart d'heure, and even that short interim had given her time to see that this kind of thing would be incessant with her recovered husband, granting that she could recover him. Only of that she felt nearly secure, unaccountably perhaps, certainly not warrantably, but how to bear this kind of thing through a life? That was the question. What was this kind of thing, this bad ten minutes that had made her tremble and turn white, and glad to get away, and be alone a minute before Sally came up jubilant? But oh, how glad for all that to get at her daughter's lips to kiss, only not too hard so as to suggest reflection and analysis. What had upset Mrs. Nightingale was a counter-memory of twenty years ago, a clear and full and vivid recollection of the garden and the girl and the dog-cart. And then also there had only been Mamma for the girl. But, oh, the relation the lassie who said those words bore to those past days, her place in the drama that filled them out, little wonder her mother's brain reeled. She could see it all vividly now, all over again. A glorious night like this, a dazzling full moon sailing in the blue beyond the tumbled chaos of loose clouds so near the earth, the riot of the wind-swept trees fighting to keep a shred of their old green on the bareness, making new concessions to the blast and beating their stripped limbs together in their despair, the endless swirl of leaves at liberty, free now at last to enjoy a short and merry life before becoming food for worms. She could see the face she had just parted from, but twenty years younger, the same bone structure with its unscarred youth upon it, only a lesser beard with a sunnier tinge, but all the thickness of the hair. She could remember the voices in the house, the farewells to the young man who was just starting for India, and how she slipped down to say a last good-bye on her own account, and felt grateful to that old Dean Ierson, the only time in her life, for begging her mother, who of course was the Rosalind Nightingale Fenwick spoke of in the train, on no account to expose herself to the night air. Why, she might have come down too into the garden and spoiled it all. And then she could remember, oh, how well, their last words in the windy garden, and the horse in the dog-cart, fresh from his stall, and officiously anxious to catch the train, as good as saying so with flings and stamps, and how little she cared if the groom did hear him call her Rosie, for that was his name for her. Now, Jerry, remember, I've made you no promises, but I'll play fair. If I change my mind, I'll write and tell you, and you may write to me. Every day. Silly boy, be reasonable. Once a month. You'll see, you'll get tired of it. Come, Rosie, I say, the idea. Yes, you will. Now go, you'll lose the train. Oh, Rosie, dearest. Yes, what? You'll lose the train. Oh, my dearest, I can't. Just think, I, I may never see you again. You must go, Jerry, dear, and there's that blockhead of a boy outside there. Never mind him, he's nobody. Only one more. Yes, dearest love, I'm really going. Good-bye. Good-bye. God bless you. And then how she stood there, with the memory of his lips dying on hers, alone by the gate in the wild wind, and heard the sharp regular trot of the horse lessen on the hard road and die away. And then the running of the train she thought was his, and how he would surely miss it and have to come back. And it would be nice just to see him again. But he was gone for all that and he was a dear good boy, and she recollected going to her bedroom to do up her hair, which had all come down, and hiding her face on her pillow in a big burst of tears. Her mind harked back on all this as he himself, the same but changed, stood there in the moonlight, striving to recollect it all and mysteriously failing. But at least he did fail, and that was something, but oh! What a wrench it gave to life, thought, reason, to all her heart and being, to have that unconscious chit cut in with, only mamma for the girl. What and whence was this little malaprop? Her overwrought mind shut away this question, 
almost in the asking it, with dearer to me at least than anything else in this world, unless... and then shut away the rest of the answer. But she was glad to get at Sally, and feel her there, although she could not speak freely to her, nor indeed speak at all, and as soon as attention died down, she went back as to a source of peace to the failure of his powers of memory, obvious, complete. All her hopes lay in that. Where would they be if the whole past were suddenly sprung on him? He might be ready to bury bygones, but... She woke next day fairly at ease in her mind, but feeling as one does after any near-run escape. And then it was she said to herself that she was a good actress, but the part was hard to act. The relations between Fenwick and the Nightingales, mother and daughter, seem to us to have been acquiring cohesion at the time of the foregoing interview. It is rather difficult to say why, but it serves to pave the way to the state of things that Sally accepted as the spooniness of Fenwick and her mother's observation of his going on, without the dimmest idea of the underlying motives of the drama. Another three months, bringing us on to these discriminations of Sally's, may also have brought about appearances that justified them. End of chapter 9Chapter Ten of Somehow Good. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter Ten The Dangers of an Unknown Past. Nettle Grasping and a Recurrence. Who among us courts catechism about himself? A universally provided young man. How about the poor old furniture? We defy the acutest of psychologists to estimate precisely the hold love has on a man who is diagnosed, in the language of the vulgar child Sally, as spoony. Probably no patient has ever succeeded in doing this himself. It is quite another matter when the eruption has broken out, when the crater is vomiting flames and the lava is pouring down on the little homesteads at the mountain's base, that may stand in the metaphor for all that man's duties and obligations. By that time, he knows. But while still within the spoony zone, he knows no more than you or I, or that most important she, what the morrow means to bring. Will it be a step on, or a step back? An altogether new she, or the fires of the volcano let loose beyond recall? Fenwick was certainly not in a position to gauge his own feelings towards Mrs. Nightingale. All previous experience was cut away from him, or seemed so. He might have been, for anything he knew, a married man with a family, a devoted husband. He might have been recently wedded to an adoring bride, and she might now be heartbroken in her loneliness. How could he tell? The only thing that gave him courage about this was that he could remember the fact that he had had parents, brothers, sisters. He could not recollect anything whatever about sweetheart, wife, or child. Unearthly gusts of half-ideas came to him at times, like that of the girl and the dog-cart, but they only gave him pain and went away unsolved, leaving him sick and dizzy. His situation now was an acutely distressing one. He was shackled and embarrassed, so to speak, by what he knew of his relations to existence. At any moment a past might be sprung on him, bringing him suddenly face to face with God knows what. So strongly did he feel this, that he often said to himself that the greatest boon that could be granted to him would be an assurance of continued oblivion. He was especially afflicted by memories of an atrocious clearness that would come to him in dreams, the horror of which would remain on into his waking time. They were not necessarily horrible things at all, but their clearness in the dream, and their total, if slow, disappearance as the actual world came back, became sometimes an excruciating torment. Who could say that they, or some equivalents, might not reach him out of the past, today or tomorrow? any time. For instance, he had one morning waked up in a perfect agony, 
a cold perspiration as of the worst nightmares, because of a dream harmless enough in itself. He had suddenly remembered, in the dream street he could identify the houses of so plainly, a first floor he had occupied, where he had left all his furniture locked up years ago. And he had found the house and the first floor quite easily, and had not seen anything strange in the landlord saying that he and his old woman often wondered when Mr. Fenwick would come for his things. It was not the accumulation of rent unpaid, nor that of the dirt he knew he should find on the furniture, all of which he could recollect in the dream perfectly well, but the fact that he had forgotten it all, and left it unclaimed all those years, that excruciated him. Even his having to negotiate for its removal in his shirt did not afflict him so much as his forgetfulness for so long of the actual furniture, his conviction of the reality of which lasted on after his discovery about his costume had made him suspect in his dream that he was dreaming. To a man whose memory is sound, who feels sure he looks back on an actual past in security, such a dream is only a curiosity of sleep. To Fenwick it was, like many others of the same sort, a possible herald of an analogous revelation in waking hours, with a sequel of dreadful verification from abysm of utterly forgotten past. His worst terror, far and away, was the fear that he was married, and a father. It might have been supposed that this arose from a provisional sense of pity for the wife or children he must have left, that his mind would conceive hypothetical poverty for them, or sorrow, or disease, or death, the result, direct or indirect, of his disappearance. But this was scarcely the case. They themselves were too intensely hypothetical. In this respect the blank in his intellect was so unqualified that it might never have occurred to him to ask himself the question if they existed, had it not been suggested to him by Mrs. Nightingale herself. It was in fact a question she almost always recurred to when Miss Sally was out of the way. It was no use trying to talk seriously when that little monkey was there. She turned everything to a joke. But the Major was quite another thing. He would back her up in anything reasonable. "'I wish more could be done to find out,' said she for the twentieth time to Fenwick one evening, shortly after the musical recital of last chapter. "'I don't feel as if it was right to give up advertising. Suppose the poor thing is in Australia or America?' The poor thing is my hypothetical wife. Exactly so. Well, suppose she is. Some people never see any newspapers at all, and all the while she may have been advertising for you. Oh, no, we should have been sure to see or hear. But why? Now I ask you, Mr. Fenwick, suppose she advertised half a dozen times in the Melbourne Argus or the New York Sun, would you have seen it, necessarily? I should not because I never see the Melbourne Argos or the New York Sun. But those agents we paid to look out go steadily through the agony columns, the personal advertisements of the whole world's press. They would have found it if it had ever been published. I dare say they only pocketed the money. That they did, no doubt, but they gave me something for it. A hundred and twenty-three advertisements addressed to Phoenix, none of them to me. But... Have we advertised enough? Oh, heavens, yes. Think of all the answers we've had. I've just received the hundred and forty-second from a lady in distressed circumstances who bought a piano ten years ago from a party of my name and initials. Thought I might be inclined to buy it back at half price. She proposes to call me early next week. Poor Mr. Fenwick. It is discouraging, I admit. But, oh, dear... Fancy if there's some poor thing breaking her heart somewhere. It's easy enough for you. You don't believe in her. That's it. I don't. He dropped a tone of pleasantry and spoke more seriously. Dear Mrs. Nightingale, if my absence of conviction of the existence of this lady did not rise to the height of a definite disbelief in her altogether, well, I should be wretched. But I feel very strongly that I need not make myself a poor miserable about her. I don't believe in her. That's the truth. You don't believe a man could forget his wife? I can't believe it, try how I may. Anything, anybody else. But a wife? No. 
Fenwick had come late in the evening, as he was in the habit of doing, often three or four times in the week. He looked across from his side of the hearthrug, where he had been standing watching the fire, but could not see the face opposite to him. Mrs. Nightingale was sitting with her back to the light, sheltering her eyes from the blaze with a fire screen. So Fenwick saw only the oriole the lamp made in her hair. It was a fine halo with a golden tinge. Sally was very proud of Mamma's hair. It was much better fun to do than her own, said the vulgar child. But even had she not been hidden by the screen, the expression on her face might have meant nothing to him. That is, nothing more than the ready sympathy he was so well accustomed to. A little anxiety of eye, a tremor in the lip, the birth of a frown without a sequel, these might have meant anything or nothing. She might even have turned whiter than she did, and yet not be said to show the cross-fire of torments in her heart. She was, as we told you, a strong woman, either by nature, or else her life had made her one. For think what the recesses of her memory held. Think of the past she looked back on, and knew to be nothing but a blank to him. Think of what she was, and he was, as he stood there and said, "'Anybody else but his wife,' and then rather shaped the no that followed with his lips than said it, but shook an emphasis into the word with his head. "'When are you going to get your hair cut, Mr. Fenwick?' said she. And he did think she changed the subject abruptly without apparent cause. "'It's just like a lion's mane when you shake it like that. "'Tomorrow, if you think it too disreputable. "'I like it. Sally wants to cut it.' The last few words showed the completeness of Fenwick's tame catitude in the family. It had developed in an amazingly short time. Was it due to the old attachment of this man and woman, an attachment, mind you, that was sound and strong till it died a violent death? We do not find this so very incredible, perhaps, because that memory of their old parting in the garden went nearer to an actual revival than any other stirring in his mind. But, of course... There may have been others equally strong, only we chance to hear of this one. That was not our purpose, however, in recording such seeming trivial chat. It was not trivial on Mrs. Nightingale's part. She had made up her mind to flinch from nothing, always to grasp her nettle. Here was a nettle, and she seized it firmly. If she identified as clearly as she did that shaken lion mane of Fenix with that of Jerry, the young man of twenty years ago, and seeing its identity was silent, that would be flinching. She would, and did, say the self-same thing she could recall saying to Jerry, and she asked Fenwick when he was going to get his hair cut, with a smile that was like that of the Indian brave under torture. A knife was through her heart. But it was well done, so she thought to herself. If she could be as intrepid as that, she could go on and live." She tried experiments of this sort, when the watchful merry eyes of her daughter were not upon her, and even felt glad this time that the Major was having a doze underneath a daily telegraph. Fenwick took it all as a matter of course, mere chaff. Did he? If so, why, after a few more words of chat, did he press his hands on his eyes, and shake a puzzled head, then, after an abrupt turn up and down the room, come back to where he stood at first, and draw a long breath. "'Was that a recurrence, Mr. Fenwick?' she asked. They had come to speak of these mental discomforts as recurrences. They would afflict him, not seldom, without bringing to his mind any definite image, and this was the worst sort. When an image came, his mind felt eased. A sort of one. "'Can you tell when it came on?' All this was nettle-grasping. She was getting used to it. Was it before or after I said that about your hair? After. No. Before. Perhaps just about then? Mrs. Nightingale decided that she would not tempt Providence any further. Self-discipline was good, but not carried to danger point. Now sit down and be quiet, she said. We won't talk any more about unpleasant things. Only the worst of it is she added, smiling, that one's topics, yours and mine, I mean, are so limited by the conditions. 
I should ask any other man who had been about in the world, as you must have done, all sorts of questions about all sorts of places, where he had been, whom he had seen. You can't answer questions, though I hope you will some day. She paused, and he saw the reason. You see, said he, with a good-humoured laugh, one gets back directly to the unpleasant subject, whether one will or no. But if I could remember all about my precious self, I might not court catechism about it. I should not about mine. This was said in a low tone, with a silent look on the unraised eyes that was almost an invitation not to hear, and her lips hardly moved to say it, either. He missed it for the moment, but finished his speech with a thought in his mind. Still, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. See what a clear conscience I have. But what was that you said? She dropped the fire-screen and raised her eyes. Fine eyes they were, which we might have likened to those of Juno, had the eyes of Oxen been blue, turning them full on him. When? said she. Just this minute I ought to have apologised for interrupting you. I said I should not court catechism about myself. I should not. Fenwick felt he could not assign this speech its proper place in the dialogue without thinking. He thought gravely, looking to all seeming into the fire for enlightenment, then turned around and spoke. Surely that is true, in a sense, of all mankind, mankind and womankind. Nobody wants to be seen through, but one's past would need to be a very shaky one to make one wish for an oblivion like mine to extinguish it. I should not dislike it. I have now all that I wish to keep out of the past. I have Sally. There is nothing I could not afford to forget in the past. No one thing the loss of which could alter her in the least, that little monkey of a daughter of mine. And there are many, many things I should like to see the last of. From which speech Fenwick derived an impression that the little monkey, the vulgar child, had come back warm and living and welcome to the speaker's mind, and had driven away some mists of night, some uglinesses that hung about it. How he wished he could ask, was one of them her father? That was not practicable, but it was something of that sort, clearly. His mind could not admit the idea of a haunting remorse, a guilty conscience of an action of her own, in the memory of the woman who spoke to him. He was too loyal to her for that. Beside, the wording of her speech made no such supposition necessary. Fenwick's answer to it fell back on abstractions, the consolation a daughter must be, and so forth. "'There she is,' said her mother, and then added, as perturbation without heralded Miss Sally's approach, "'I will tell you what I meant some other time.' For there she was, no doubt of it, wild with excitement to report the splendid success of the great sestet, the production of which had been the event of the musical gathering she had come from. And you know, as well as we do, how it is when youth and high spirits burst in upon the sober stay-at-homes, intoxicated with music and lights and supper and too many people talking at once. Sally's eyebrows and teeth alone would have been enough to set all the birds singing in the dullest coppices decorum ever planted, let alone the tales she had to tell of all the strange and wonderful things that had come to pass at the Erskine Peelses, who were the givers of the party, and always did things on such a scale. "'And where do you think, mother, Mrs. Erskine Peel gets all those good-looking young men from that come to her parties? Why, from the stores, of course. Just fancy. How do I know? Why, because I talked to one of them for ever so long, and made them tell me all about it.' I detected him and told him so straight off. How did I recognise him? Why, of course, because he's that young man that came here about the letter. Oh, you know, Mr. Fenwick, gracious me how slow you are. The young man that brought you the letter to translate. Rather tall. Dark eyes. Oh, yes, certainly I remember him quite well. Well, I expect he made a very good young man for a small tea-party. Of course he did, and it's quite ridiculous by which the vulgar child meant that class distinctions were ridiculous. She had this way of rushing subjects, eliding the obvious and relying on her hearers. He told me all about it. He'd been universally provided, he said, and I promised not to tell. 
Miss Erskine Peel, that's Orange, you know, the soprano, went to the manager and said her mother said they must get more men, though it wasn't dancing, or the rooms looked so bad, only they mustn't be fools, and must be able to say Wagner and Liszt and things, and he hoped I didn't think he was a fool. What did you say? Said I couldn't say, didn't know him well enough, he might be to look at, or not, accordingly. I didn't say that, you know, Mamma. I didn't know, darling, you're very rude sometimes. Well, he did say he could certainly say Wagner and Liszt, and even more, because... It was rather sad, you know, Mamma dear. Sally, you've told that young man he may call. You know you have. Well, Mamma dear, and if I have, I don't see that anybody's mare's dead. Because do listen. Fenwick interposed a parenthesis. I don't think you need to be apprehensive, Mrs. Nightingale. He was an educated young man enough. His not knowing a French phrase like that implies nothing. Not one in a hundred would. The way in which the Major, who of course had come out of his doze on the inrush of Miss Sally, looked across at Fenwick as he said this, implied an acquired faith in the judgment of the latter. Sally resumed. Just let me tell you, his name's Bradshaw, only he's no relation to the Bradshaw, in a yellow cover, you know. Well, I don't see anything in that. Sally is defending her position against a smile her mother and Fenwick have exchanged. They concede that there is nothing in it, and Sally continues. Where was I? Oh, Bradshaw, yes. He was an awfully promising violinist, awfully promising. And what do you think happened? Why, the nerves of his head gave way, and he couldn't stand the vibration. So it came to being a Catley's or nothing. Sally certainly had the faculty of cutting a long story short. She thought the story, so cut, one that her mother and Mr. Fenwick might have shown a more active interest in, instead of saying it was time for all of us to be in bed. She did not, however, ascribe to them any external preoccupation, merely an abstract love of truth, for was it not nearly one o'clock in the morning? Nevertheless, a little incident of Mr. Fenwick's departure, not noticed at the moment, suddenly assumed vitality just as Sally was going off, and woke her up. What was it she overheard her mother say to him, just as he was leaving the house, about something she had promised to tell him some time? However, reflection on it with waking faculties dissipated the importance it seemed to have halfway to dreamland, and Sally went contentedly to sleep again. Fenwick, as he walked to his lodgings through the dull February night, did not regard this something, whatever it was, as a thing of slight importance at all. He may have been only spoony, but it was in a sense that left him no pretense for thinking that anything connected with this beautiful young widow lady could be unimportant to him. On the contrary, she was more and more filling his waking thoughts, and becoming the pivot on which all things turned. It is true he dismissed from his mind, whatever that means, every presumptuous suggestion that in some precious time to come she might be willing to throw in her lot with his own, and asked himself what sort of thing was he that he should allow such an idea to come even as far as contradiction point. He, a poor, inexplicable wreck. What was the self he had to offer, and what else had he? But indeed the speculation rarely got even to this maturity, so promptly was it nipped in the bud only there were so many buds to nip, he became aware that he was giving a good deal of attention to this sort of gardening. Also he had a consciousness that he was growing morbidly anxious for the maintenance of his own oblivion. That which was at first only a misgiving about what a return of memory might bring to light was rapidly becoming a definite desire that nothing should come to light at all. How could he look forward to the hypothetical wife, whom he did not in the least believe in, but who might be somewhere, for all that. He knew perfectly well that his relations with Krakatoa Villa would not remain the same, say what you might. Of course he also knew that he had no relations there that need change. Most certainly not. At this point an effort would be made against the outcrop of his thoughts. 
Those confounded buds were always bursting. It was impossible to be even with them. Perhaps it was on this evening, or rather early morning, as he walked home to his lodgings, that Fenwick began to recognise more fully than he had done before Mrs. Nightingale's share in what was, if not an absolute repugnance to a revival of the unknown past, at least a very ready acquiescence in his ignorance of it. But surely, he reasoned with himself, if this cause is making me contented with my darkness, it is the more reason that it should be penetrated. An uncomfortable variation of his dream, of the resurrected first floor, crossed his mind. Suppose he had forgotten the furniture, but remembered the place, and gone back to tenant it with a van load of new tables and chairs. What would he have done with the poor old furniture? End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Somehow Good. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter 11. More Girls Chatter. Sweeps and Dustmen. How Sally Disillusioned Mr. Bradshaw. Out of the Frying Pan. It is impossible to make Gluck's music anything but a foretaste of heaven as long as there is any show of accuracy in the way it is rendered. But then you must go straight on, and not go over a difficult phrase until you know it. You must play fair. Orpheus would probably only have provoked Cerberus, certainly wouldn't have put him to sleep, if he had practised and counted and gone back six bars and done it again. But Cerberus wasn't at 260 Ladbroke Grove Road on the Tuesday following Mrs. Erskine Peel's musical party which was the next time Sally went to Letitia Wilson. And it was as well that he wasn't, for Sally stuck in a passage at the end of one page and the beginning of the next, so that you had to turn over in the middle, and it was bad enough, goodness knew, without that. It might really have been the Northwest Passage, so insuperable did it seem. "'I shall never get it right, I know, Tishy,' said the viola. And the violin replied, "'Because you never pay any attention to the arpeggio, dear.' It doesn't begin on the chord, it begins on the G-flat. Look here now. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yes, that's all very well. Who's going to turn over the leaf, I should like to know? I know I shall never do it. Not because the nerves of my head are giving way, but because I'm a duffer. I suppose you know what that young man is, dear. Sally accepts this quite contentedly, and immediately skips a great deal of unnecessary conversation. I'm not in love with him, Tishy, dear. Didn't say you were, dear, but I suppose you don't know what he is all the same. Which certainly seems inconsecutive, but we really cannot be responsible for the way girls talk. Don't know and don't want to know. What is he? He's from Catley's. This throws a light on the conversation. It shows that Sally had told Letitia who she was going to meet at her mother's next evening. Sally is not surprised. As if I didn't know all about this, as if he didn't tell me his story. Like the mock turtle in Alice. Now, Tishy dear, is that an insinuation or isn't it? Do be candid. The mock turtle told his story once he was a real turtle. Very well, Tishy dear, that's as much as to say Julius Bradshaw is mock. I can't see where the mockness comes in myself. He told me all about it, plain enough. Yes, and you know what a rage Mrs. Erskine Peel is in, and says it was an éclaircissement. Why can't she be satisfied with English? What? Of course, there are hundreds of English equivalents for éclaircissement. There's bust-up. That's only one. Tishy, dear, don't be aggravating. Keep to the point. Why mustn't I have Julius Bradshaw to play with if I like, because he's at Catley's? You may, if you like, dear, as long as you're satisfied, it's all right. Well, what fault have you to find with him? I? None at all. It's perfectly all right. You are the most irritating girl. Suppose we take the adagio now, if you're rested. But Sally's back was up. Not until you tell me what you really mean about Julius Bradshaw. So Letitia had her choice between an explicit statement of her meaning 
and an unsupported incursion into the adagio. I suppose you'll admit there are such things as social distinctions. Sally wouldn't admit anything whatever. If sociometry was to be a science, it must be worked out without axioms or postulates. Letitia immediately pointed out that if there were no such things as social distinctions, of course there was no reason why Mr. Julius Bradshaw shouldn't take his violin to Krakatoa Villa. Or here, or anywhere, concluded Letitia, with a touch of pride in the status of Ladbroke Grove Road, whereupon Sally surrendered as much of her case as she had left. "'You talk as if you were a sweep or a dustman,' said she. "'I don't see why you should mind if I do, dear, because if there are to be no social distinctions, there's no reason why all the sweeps and dustmen in Christendom shouldn't come and play the violin at Krakatoa Villa. Now, not too slow, you know. One, two, three, four. That'll do.' Perhaps Sally felt it would be a feeble line of defence to dwell on the scarcity of good violinists among sweeps and dustmen, and that was why she fell into rank without comment. This short conversation, some weeks on in the story, lets in one or two gleams of sidelight. It shows that Sally's permission to the young man Bradshaw to call at her mother's had been promptly taken advantage of. Jumped at is the right expression. Also that Miss Wilson had stuck-up ideas. Also that Sally was a disciple of what used to be called socialism. Only really nowadays such a lot of things get called socialism that the word has lost all the discriminative force one values so much in noun substantive. Also, only we knew it already, that Sally was no lawyer. We do not love her the less for our part. But nothing in this interchange of shots between Sally and her friend, nor in anything she said to her mother about Mr. Bradshaw, gives its due prominence to the fact that, though the young gentleman was a devout worshipper at the Shrine of St. Satisfax, he had only become so on the Sunday after Miss Sally had casually mentioned the latter as a saint she frequented. Perhaps she dismissed it from her mind, and it was obliging enough to go. Perhaps she considered she had done her duty by it when she put on record, in soliloquy, her opinion that if people chose to be gaping idiots, they might, and she couldn't help it. She had a happy faculty for doing what she called putting young whippersnappers in their proper places. This only meant that she managed to convey to them that the lines they might elect to whippersnap on were not to be those of sentimental nonsense. And perhaps she really dealt in the wisest way with Mr. Bradshaw's romantic adoration of her at a distance, when he fished for leave to call upon her. The line he made his application on was that he should so like to play her a rapid movement by an unpronounceable Slav. She said directly, why not come and bring his violin on Wednesday evening at nine? That was her mother's address on the card on the fiddle case. He must recollect it, which he did unequivocally. Now, if this young lady had had a fan, she might have tittered with it, or blushed slightly, and said, Oh, Mr. Bradshaw, or Oh, sir, like in an old novel, one by Fanny Burney or the like. But she did nothing of the sort, and the consequence was that he had, as it were, to change the venue of his adoration, to make it a little less romantic, in fact. Her frank and breezy treatment of the subject had let in a gust of fresh air, and blown away all imagination. For there naturally was a good deal of that, in a passion based on a single interview, and nourished by weekly stimulants at morning services. In fact, when he presented himself at Krakatoa Villa on Wednesday evening, as invited, the day after Letitia's remarks about his social position, he was quite prepared to be introduced to the young woman's fiancé, if... Only, when he got as far as the if, he dropped the subject. As soon as he found there was no such person, he came to believe he would not have been much disconcerted if there had been. How far this was true, who can say? He was personally one of those young men about whom you may easily produce a false impression, if you describe them at all. This is because your reader will take the bit in his teeth and run away with an idea. If you say a nose has a bridge to it, this directly produces in some minds an image like Blackfriars Bridge, that it is straight, the Egenetan marbles, that it is retroussé, 
the dog in that Hogarth portrait. Suggest a cheerful countenance, and you stamp your subject for ever as a Shakespearean clown. So you must be content to know that Mr. Bradshaw was a good-looking young man, of dark complexion, and of rather over medium height and good manners. If he had not been, he would never, as an article of universal provision for parties, have passed muster at Catley's. He was like many other young men such as one sees in shops. But then, what very nice-looking young men one sometimes sees there? Sally had classed him as a young whippersnapper, but this was unjust, if it impugned his stature. She repeated the disparaging epithet when, in further justification to Miss Wilson of her asking him to come to her mother's house, she sketched a policy of conduct to guide inexperienced girls in their demeanour towards new male friends. "'You let em come close to and have a good look,' said the vulgar child. "'Half of em will be disgusted and go away in a huff.' Mrs. Nightingale had known Mr. Bradshaw for a long time, as a customer at a shop knows the staff in the background, mere office secretions, who only ooze out at intervals. For Bradshaw was not strictly a counter-jumper, although Miss Wilson more than once spoke of him so, adding, when it was pointed out to her that theoretically he never went behind counters, by jumping or otherwise, that that didn't make the slightest difference, the principle was the same. Sally's mother did not share her friend's fancies, but she had not confidence enough in the stability of the earth's crust to give way freely to her liberalism, drive a coach and six through the classes, and talk to him freely about the shop. She did not know what a social seismologist would say on the point, so she contented herself with treating him as a matter of course, as a slight acquaintance whom she saw often, merely asking him if that was he, to which the reply was in the affirmative, like question time in the Commons. "'Is this the Strad? Let's have it out,' says Sally. For Mr. Bradshaw possessed a Strad. He brought it out of its coffin with something of the solicitude Petrarch might have shown to the remains of Laura, and when he had rough-sketched its condition of discord and corrected the drawing, danced a Hungarian dance on it, and apologised for his presumption in doing so. He played so very well that it certainly did seem rather a cruel trick of fate that gave him nerves in his head. Sally then said, might she look at it, and played chords and runs just to feel what it was like. Her comment was that she wished her viola was a strad. We record all this to show what, perhaps, is hardly worth the showing, a wavering in a man's mind, and that man a young one. Are they not at it all day long, all of them? Do they do anything but waver? When Sally said she wished her viola was a strad, Mr. Bradshaw's mind shortly became conscious that some passing spook of a lone nature had murmured almost inaudibly that it was a good job his strad wasn't a viola. "'Because, you see,' added the spook, "'that quashes all speculation whether you, Mr. Bradshaw, are glad or sorry you needn't lay out your instrument at this young lady's feet. Now, if immediately after you first had that overwhelming impression of her, got metaphorically torpedoed, don't you know, such a wish as hers had been expressed, you probably would have laid both your strad and your heart at her feet, and said, take my all. But now that he had been so far disillusioned by Sally's robust and breezy treatment of the position, he was not quite sure the spook had not something to say for himself. Mr. Bradshaw was content to come down off his high horse, and to plod along the dull path of a mere musical evening visitor at a very nice house. Pleasant, certainly, but not the aim of his aspirations from afar at St. Satisfax's. His amour propre was a little wounded by that spook, too. Nothing keeps it up to the mark better than a belief in one's stability, in love matters especially. He was not quite sure of the exact moment the spook intruded his opinion, so we can't be expected to know. Perhaps about the time Miss Wilson came in, just as he was showing how carefully he had listened to Joachim, and said, could he play those? She wished she could. She was thrown off her guard by the finished execution, and for the moment quite forgot Catley's and the classitudes. Sally instantly perceived her opening. She would enjoy catching Tishy out in any sort of way, so she said, 
Mr. Bradshaw will show you how, Tishy dear, of course he will. Only not now, because if we don't begin, we shan't have time for the long quartet. If you say this sort of thing about strangers in society, you really ought to give them a chance. So thought Letitia to herself, and resolved to blow Sally up at the first opportunity. As for that culprit, she completed her work, from her own position of perfect security, with complacency, at least. And she felt at the end of her evening, which we needn't dwell on, as it was all crotchets, minims and F-sharps and G-flats, that her entrenchments had become spontaneously stronger without exertion on her part. For there were Tishy and Mr. Bradshaw, between whom Sally had certainly understood there was a great gulf fixed, sitting on the very same sofa and talking about a Stradivarius. She concluded that, broadly speaking, de Brett's bark is worse than his bite, and that he is, at heart, a very accommodating character. "'I hope you saw Tishy, Mamma dear,' so spoke Sally to her mother, after the musicians first, and then Fenwick, had dispersed their several ways. Mrs. Nightingale seemed very distrait and preoccupied. "'Saw Tishy what, kitten?' "'Tishy and Mr. Bradshaw on that sofa.' "'No, darling. Oh, yes, I did. What about them?' "'After all that rumpus about shop boys?' But her mother's attention is not easy to engage this evening, somehow. Her mind seems somewhere else altogether. But from where it is, it sees the vulgar child very plainly indeed, as she puts up her face to be kissed with all its animation on it. She kisses it, animation and all, caressing the rich black hair with a hand that seems thoughtful. A hand can... Then she makes a little effort to shake off something that draws her away, and comes back rather perfunctorily to her daughter's sphere of interest and the life of town. Did Letitia call Mr. Bradshaw a shop-boy, Chick? Very nearly. At least, I don't know what you call not calling anybody shop-boy if she didn't. Her mother makes a further effort, comes back a little more. What did she say, child? Said you could always tell, and it was no use my talking, and that the negro couldn't change his spots. She has some old-fashioned ideas, but how about calling him a shop-boy? Not in words, but worse. Tishy always goes round and round. I wish she'd say. However, Dr. Vereker quite agrees with me. We think it dishonest. What did Dr. Vereker think of Mr. Bradshaw? We have failed to note that the doctor was the cello in the quartet. Now, Mamma, darling, fancy asking Dr. Prosy what he thinks. I wasn't going to. Besides, as if it mattered what they think of each other. Who? Why, men, of course. Mr. Fenwick's a man, and you asked him. Mr. Fenwick's a man on other lines, absolutely other. He doesn't come in, really. Her mother repeats the last four words, not exactly derisively, rather, if anything, her accent and her smile may be said to caress her daughter's words as she says them. She is such a silly, but such a dear little goose. That seems the implication. Well, says Sally, as she has said before, and we have tried to spell her, I don't see anything in that, because look how reasonable Mr. Fenix, Mr. Fenix. Why, of course, entirely different. I say, Mother dearest. What, kitten? What were you and Mr. Fenwick talking about so seriously in the back drawing room? The two are upstairs in the front bedroom at this minute, by the by. Did you hear us, darling? No, because of the row, but one could tell for all that. Then Sally sees in an instant that it is something her mother is not going to tell her about, and makes immediate concession. "'Where was the Major going that he couldn't come?' she asks. "'He generally makes a point of coming when it's music.' "'I fancy he's dining at the Herkaroo, says her mother. But she has gone back into her preoccupation, and from within it externalises an opinion that we should be better in bed, or we shall never be up in the morning. End of chapter 11"'Chapter Twelve of Somehow Good. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. "'Chapter Twelve. "'What Fenwick and Sally's mother had been saying in the back drawing-room. "'Opus 999. "'Back in that old garden again? 
and how Jerry could not swim. The old Tartini Sonata. As soon as ever Mr. Bradshaw touched his violin, and before ever he began to play his Hungarian dance on all four strings at once, Mrs. Nightingale and Mr. Fenwick went away into the back drawing-room, not to be too near the music, because there was a fire in both rooms. In the interval of time that had passed since Christmas, Sally had contrived to dismiss from her mind Colonel Lund's previsions about her mother and Mr. Fenwick, or they had given warning and gone of their own accord, for by now she had again fallen into the frame of mind which classified her mother and Fenwick as semi-elderly people, and, so to speak, out of it all. So her mind assented readily to distance from the music as a sufficient reason for a succession to the back room. Non-combatants are just as well off the field of battle. But a closer observer than Sally at this moment would have noticed that chat in an undertone had already set in in the back drawing-room even before the Hungarians had stopped dancing. Also that the applause that came therefrom, when they did stop, had a certain perfunctory air, as of plaudits something else makes room for, and comes back again after. Not that she would have seen anything in it if she had, because whatever her mother said or did was, in Sally's eyes, right and normal. Abnormal and bad things were conceived and executed outside the family, nor, in spite of the sotto voce, was there anything Sally could not have participated in, whatever exception she might have taken to something of a patronising tone, inexcusable towards our own generation, even in the most semi-elderly people on record. Her mother, at Sally's latest observation point, had taken the large armchair quite the other side of the rug to be as far off the music as possible. Mr. Fenwick, in reply to a flying remark of her own, she being, at the moment, a music-book seeker, wouldn't bring the other large armchair in front of the fire and be comfortable, thank you. He liked this just as well. Sally had then commented on Mr. Fenwick's unnatural love of uncomfortable chairs when he wasn't walking about the room. She fancied, as she passed on, that she heard her mother address him as Fenwick without the mister. So she did. "'You are a restless man, Fenwick. I wonder, were you so before the accident?' "'Oh, dear, there I am on that topic again.' But he only laughed. "'It doesn't hurt me,' he said. "'That reminds me that I wanted to remind you of something you said you would tell me. You know, the evening the kitten went to the music party. Something you would tell me sometime?' "'I know. I'll tell you when they've got to their music, if there isn't too much row. Don't let's talk while this new young man's playing. It seems unkind. It won't matter when they're all at it together.' But in spite of good resolutions, silence was not properly observed, and the perfunctory pause came awkwardly on the top of a lapse. Fenwick then said, as one who avails himself of an opportunity, "'No need to wait for the music. They can't hear a word we say in there. We can't hear a word they say.' "'Because they're making such a racket.' Mrs. Nightingale paused with a listening eye, trying to disprove their inaudibility. The examination confirmed Fenwick. "'I like it,' she continued, "'a lot of young voices. "'It's much better when you don't make out what they say. "'When you can't hear a word, you fancy some sense in it.' "'And then went on listening, and Fenwick waited, too. "'He couldn't well fidget her to keep her promise. "'She would do it herself in time. "'It might be she preferred talking under cover of the music. "'She certainly remained silent till it came. "'Then she spoke.' "'What was it made me say that to you about something I would tell you?' "'Oh, I know. You said, perhaps if you knew your past you would not court catechism about it, and I said that, knowing mine, I should not either. Wasn't that it?' She fixed her eyes on him as though to hold him to the truth. Perhaps she wanted his verbal recognition of the possibility that she, too, like others, might have left things in the past she would like to forget on their merits— cast off garments on the road of life. It may have been painful to her to feel his faith in herself an obstacle to what she wished at least to hint to him, even if she could not tell him outright. She did not want too much divine worship at her shrine. A ready recognition of her position of mortal frailty would be so much more sympathetic, really. A feeling perhaps traceably akin to what many of us have felt, that if our father the devil— old Nicky Ben, would only tuck a thought and mend as he ebblins might, 
He would be the very king of father confessors. If details had to be gone into, we should be sure of his sympathy. Yes, that was it, and I suppose I looked incredulous. Thus Fenwick. You looked incredulous. I would sooner you should believe me. Would you hand me down that fire screen off the chimney-piece? Thank you. She was hardening herself to the task she had before her. He gave her the screen, and, as he resumed his seat, drew it nearer to her. Mozart's Opus 999 had just started, and it was little doubtful if voices could be heard unless, in Sally's phrase, they were close to. I should believe you. Does what you are going to tell me relate to... Go on. To your husband. Yes. The task had suddenly become easier. She breathed more freely about what was to come. I wish you to know that he may still be living. I have heard nothing to the contrary, but I ought to speak of him as the man who was my husband. He is no longer that. Fenwick interposed on her hesitation. You've divorced him? But she shook her head, shook a long negative, and Fenwick looked up quickly and uttered a little sharp, Ah! as though something had struck him. The slow head-shake said as plain as words could have said it, I wish I could say yes. So expressive was it that Fenwick did not even speculate on the third alternative, a separation without a divorce. He saw at once he could make it easier for her if he spoke out plain, treating the bygone as a thing that could be spoken of plainly. He divorced you? She was very white but kept her eyes steadily fixed on him over the fire-screen, and her voice remained perfectly firm and collected. The music went on intricately all the while. She spoke next. To all intents and purposes, there was a technical obstacle to a legal divorce, but he tried for one. We parted sorely against my will, for I loved him, and now it is over nineteen years since I saw him last, or heard of him or from him, but he was absolutely blameless, unless, indeed, it is to be counted blame to him that he could not bear what no other man could have borne. I cannot possibly give you all details, but I wish you to hear this that I have to tell you from myself. It is painful for me to tell, but it would be far worse that you should hear it from any one else. I feel sure it is safe to tell you that you will not talk of it to others, least of all to that little chick of mine. You may trust me, indeed you may, without reserve. I see you wish to tell me no more, so I will not ask it. And blame me as little as possible? I cannot blame you. Before you say that, listen to as much as I can tell you of the story. I was a young girl when I went out alone to be married to him in India. We had parted in England eight months before, and he had remained unchanged, his letters all told the same tale. I quarrelled with my mother, as I now see most unreasonably, merely because she wished to marry again. Perhaps she was a little to blame not to be more patient with a headstrong, ill-regulated girl. I was both. It ended in my writing out to him in India that I should come out and marry him at once. My mother made no opposition. She remained silent for a little, and her eyes fell. Then she spoke with more effort, rather as one who answers her own thoughts. No, I need say nothing of the time between. It was no excuse for the wrong I did him. I can tell you what that was. It did not seem easy, though, when it came to actual words. Fenwick spoke into the pause. Why tell me now? Tell me another time. I prefer now. It was this way. I kept something back from him till after we were married, something I should have told him before. Had I done so, I believe to this moment we should never have parted. But my concealment threw doubt on all else I said. I am telling more than I meant to tell. She hesitated again, and then went on. That was my wrong to him, the concealment. But of course it was not the ground of the divorce proceedings. Fenwick stopped her again. Why tell me any more? You are being led on, are leading yourself on, to say more than you wish. Well, I will leave it there. Only, Fenwick, understand this. My husband was young and generous and noble-hearted. 
Had I trusted him, I believe all might have gone well, even though he... She hesitated again, and then cancelled something unsaid. The concealment was my fault, the mistrust. That was all. Nothing else was my fault. As she says the words in praise of her husband, she finds it a pleasure to let her eyes rest on the grave, handsome, puzzled face that, after all, really is his. She catches herself wondering, so oddly do the undercurrents of mind course about, where he got that sharp white scar across his nose. It was not there in the old days. She looks at him until he, too, looks up, and their eyes meet. Well, then, she says, I will tell you no more. Blame me as little as possible. And to this repetition of her previous words he says again, I cannot blame you very emphatically. But Mrs. Nightingale felt perplexed at his evident sincerity, would rather he should have indulged in truisms, we are not all of us perfect, and so forth. When she spoke again, some bars of the music later, she took for granted that his mind, like hers, was still dwelling on his last words. She felt half sorry she had, so to speak, switched off the current of the conversation. If you will think over what I have told you, Fenwick, you will see that you cannot help doing so. How can that be? Surely. My husband sought to divorce me, and was himself absolutely blameless. How can you do otherwise than blame me? Partly, only partly, because I see you are keeping back something, something that would exonerate you. I cannot believe you were to blame. Listen, Fenwick. As I said, I cannot tell you the whole, and the Major, who is the only man alive who knows all the story, will, I know, refuse to tell you anything, even if you ask him, and that I wish you not to do. I should not dream of asking him. Well, he would refuse, I know it. But I want you to know all I can tell you. I do not want any groundless excuses made for me. I will not accept any absolution from any one on a false pretense. You see what I mean? I see perfectly. I am not sure, though, that you see my meaning. But never mind that. Is there anything, Father, that you would really like me to know? She waited a little and then answered, keeping her eyes always fixed on Fenwick. Yes, there is. But at this moment the first movement of Opus 999 came to a perfect and well-thought-out conclusion, bearing in mind everything that has been said on six pages of ideas faultlessly interchanged by four instruments, and making due allowance for all exceptions each had courteously taken to the other. But Opus 999 was going on to the second movement directly, and only tolerated a pause for a few string tightenings and trial squeaks to get in tune, and the removal of a deceased fly from a piano candle. The remark from the back room that we could hear beautifully in here seemed to fall flat, the second violin merely replying, All right, passionlessly. The instruments then asked each other if they were ready, and answered yes. Then someone counted four suggestively for a start, and life went on again. Mrs. Nightingale and Fenwick sat well on into the music before either spoke. He, resolved not to seem to seek or urge any information at all, or was to come spontaneously from her. She, feeling the difficulty of telling what she had to tell, and always oppressed with the recollection of what it had cost her to make her revelation to this self-same man nineteen years ago. She wished he would give the conversation some lift, as he had done before, when he asked if what she had to tell referred to her husband. But although he would gladly have repeated his assistance, he could see his way to nothing this time that seemed altogether free from risk. How if he were to blunder into ascribing to her something more culpable than her actual share in the past? She half guessed this, then, seeing that speech must come from herself in the end, took heart and faced the position resolutely. She always did. You know this, Fenwick, do you not, that when there is a divorce, the husband takes the children from their mother, always when she is in the wrong, too often when she is blameless. I have told you I was the one to blame, 
and I tell you now that though my husband's application for a divorce failed, from a technical point of law, all things came about just as though he had succeeded. Don't analyse it now, take it all for granted. You understand? I understand. Suppose it so. And then? And then this. That little monkey of mine, that little unconscious fiddling thing in there, and as Mrs. Nightingale speaks, the sound of a caress mixes with the laugh in her voice, but the pain comes back as she goes on. My Salikin has been mine, all her life. My poor husband never saw her in her childhood. As she says the word husband, she has again a vivid éclat of the consciousness that it is he himself sitting there beside her, and the odd thought that mixes itself into this, strange to say, is the pity of it to think how little he has had of Sally in all these years. He, for his part, can for the moment make nothing of this part of the story. He can give his head the lion mane shake she knows him by so well, but it brings him no light. He is reduced to mere slow repetition of her data, his hand before his eyes to keep his brain that has to think clear of distractions from without. Your husband never saw her. She has been yours all her life. Had she been your husband's child, he would have exercised his so-called rights, his legal rights, and taken her away. Are those the facts, so far? Yes. Go on. No. Stop. I will tell you. At the beginning of this year, I should have been married exactly twenty years. Sally is nineteen. You remember her birthday? Nineteen in August. Now let me think. Just at this moment the second movement of Opus 999 came to an end, and gave an added plausibility to the blank he needed to ponder in. The viola in the next room looked round across her chair back and said, I say, mother, to a repetition of which Mrs. Nightingale replied, what did her daughter say? What she said was that her mother and Mr. Fenwick were exactly like canaries. They talked as hard as they could all through the music, and when it stopped they shut up. "'Wasn't that true?' "'To which her mother answered affirmatively, adding, "'You'll have to put a cloth over us, Chick, and squash us out.' "'Fenwick was absorbed in thought, and did not notice this interlude. "'He did not speak until the music began again. "'Then he said abruptly, "'I see the story now. "'Sally's father was not... "'was not my husband. "'There is not a trace of cowardice or hesitation "'in her filling out the sentence.' There is pain, but that again dies away in her voice as she goes on to speak of her daughter. I do not connect him with her now. She is a thing of itself, a, a thing of herself. She is... she is Sally. Well, you see what she is. I see she is a very dear little person. Then he seems to want to say something and to pause on the edge of it. Then, in answer to a yes of encouragement from her, continues, I was going to say she must be very like him, like her father. Very like, she asks, or very unlike? Which did you mean? I mean very like as to looks, because she is so unlike you. She is like enough to him as far as looks go. It's her only fault, poor chick, and she can't help it. Besides, I mind it less now that I have more than half forgiven him, for her sake, the tone of her voice mixes a sob and a laugh, though she utters neither, and is quite collected. But she is quite unlike him in character. Sally is not an angel. Oh, dear, no. The laugh predominates. But... But what? She is not a devil. And as she said this, the pain was all back again in the dropped half-whisper in which she said it and in that moment Fenwick made his guess of the whole story, which maybe went nearer than we shall do with the information we have to go upon. In this narrative, as we tell it now, that story is known only to its chief actor, and to her old friend, who is now dining at the Herkaroo Club. The third movement of Opus 999 was not a very long one, and coming to an end at this point seemed to supply a reason for silence, that was not unwelcome in the back drawing-room. The end of a trying conversation had been attained. Both speakers could now affect attention to what was going on in the front. 
This had taken the form of a discussion between Mr. Julius Bradshaw and Miss Letitia Wilson, who was anxious to transfer her position of first violin to that young gentleman. We regret to have to report that Miss Sally's agreement with her friend about the desirability had been sotto voce in these terms. Yes, Tishy dear, do make the shop-boy play the last movement. And Miss Wilson had then suggested it, saying there was a bit she knew she couldn't play. And you expect me to, said the owner of the Strad, when I haven't so much as looked at it for three years past. To which Miss Sally appended a marginal note. Stuff and nonsense, don't be affected, Mr. Bradshaw. However, after compliments, more protestations from its owner, the Strad was brought into Hotchpot, and Letitia abdicated. "'Won't you come and sit in here, to be away from the music?' said the back drawing-room, but Letitia wanted to see Mr. Bradshaw's fingering of that passage. We are more interested in the back drawing-room. Like many other athletic men, and we have seen how strongly this character was maintained in Fenwick, he hated armchairs. Even in the uncomfortable ones, by which we mean the ones we dislike, his restless strength would not remain quiet for any length of time. At intervals he would get up and walk about the room, exasperating the sedate, and then make good-humoured concession to their weakness. Mrs. Nightingale could remember all this in Jerry the boy, twenty years ago. If it had not been for that music, probably he would have walked about the room over that stiff problem in dates he had just grappled with. As it was, he remained in his chair to solve it that is, if he did solve it. Possibly, the moment he saw something important turned on the date of Sally's birth, he jumped across the solution to the conclusion it was to lead to. Given the conclusion, the calculation had no interest for him. But the story his mind constructed to fit that conclusion stunned him. It knitted his brows and clenched his teeth for him. It made the hand that had been hanging loose over the uncomfortable chair-back close savagely on something, a throat, perhaps, that his imagination supplied. How like he looked, thought his companion, to himself on one occasion twenty years ago. But his anger now was on her behalf alone. It was not so in that dreadful time she hoped he might never recollect. If only his memory of all the past might remain as now, a book with a locked clasp and a lost key. She watched him as he sat there, and saw a calmer mood come back upon him. Each wanted a raison d'etre for a silent pause, and neither was sorry for the desire each might ascribe to the other of hearing the last movement of the music undisturbed. Opus 999 was prospering, there was no doubt of it. Letitia Wilson was a very fair example of a creditable career at the R.A.M., but she was not quite equal to this unfortunate victim of a too nervous system, who could play like an angel for half an hour, mind you, not more. This was his half-hour, and it was quite reasonable for Fenwick to take for granted that his hostess would like to pay attention to it, or vice versa. So both sat silent. But as she sat listening to Opus 999 and watching wonderingly the strange victim of oblivion, of whom she knew, scarcely acknowledging it always, though, that she had once for a short time called him husband, her mind went back to an old time, when he and she were young, before the tragic memory that she sometimes thought might have been lived down had come into her life and his. And a scene rose up before her out of that old time, a scene of young men, almost boys, and girls who but the other day were in the nursery, playing lawn tennis in a happy garden, with never a thought for anything in this wide world but themselves and each other, and the scoring, and how jolly it would be in the houseboat at Henley to-morrow. And then this garden scene a little later in the moonrise, and herself and one of the players, who was Jerry, this very man, left by the other two to themselves, on a garden seat his arm hung over, just as it did now on that chair-back, how exactly he sat then as he sat now, his other hand in charge of the foot that had crossed on his knee just as now, to keep it from a slip along his lawn-tennis flannels. How well she could remember the tennis shoe, with its ribbed rubber sole, in place of that highly polished calf thing. 
and she could remember every word they said, there in the warm moonlight. What a silly boy you are! I don't care. I shall always say exactly the same thing. I can't help it. All silly boys say that sort of thing. Then they change their minds. I never said it to any girl in my life but you, Rosie. I never thought it. I shall never say it again to anyone but you. Don't be nonsensical. I'm not. It's true. Wait till you've been six months in India, Jerry. And then the recollection of what followed made it seem infinitely strange to her that Fenwick should remain, as he had remained, immovable. If the hand she could remember so well, for all it had grown so scarred and service-worn and hairy, were to take hers, as it did then, as they sat together on the garden seat, would it shake now, as formerly? If his great strong arm, her memory still felt round her, were to come again now, would she feel in it the tremor of the passion he was shaken by then, and in caresses such as she half reproved him for, but had no heart to resist, the reality of a love then young and strong and full of promise for the days to come, and now what? The perished trunk of an uprooted tree, the shadow of a half-forgotten dream. As he sat silent, only now and then, by some slight sign, some new knitting of the brow or closing of the hand, showing the tension of the feeling produced by the version his mind had made of the story half told to him, as he sat thus, under a kind of feint of listening to the music, the world grew stranger and stranger to his companion. She had fancied herself strong enough to tell the story, but had hardly reckoned with his possible likeness to himself. She had thought that she could keep the twenty years that had passed clearly in her mind, could deal with the position from a good, sensible, matter-of-fact standpoint. The past was past, and happily forgotten by him. The present had still its possibilities, if only the past might remain forgotten. Surely she could rely on herself to find the nerve to go through what was, after all, a mere act of duty, knowing or rather feeling that Fenwick would ask her to marry him as soon as he dared, it was merely a question of time, her duty was plainly to forewarn him, to make sure that he was alive to the antecedents of the woman he was offering himself to. She knew his antecedents, as many as she wished to know. If the twenty years of oblivion concealed irregularity, immorality, well, was she not to blame for it? Was ever a better boy than Jerry, as she knew him, to the day they parted. It was her fault, or misfortune, that had cast him all adrift. As to that troublesome question of a possible wife elsewhere, in the land of his oblivion, she had quite made up her mind about that. Every effort had been made to find such a one, and failed. If she reappeared, it would be her own duty to surrender Finnick, if he wished to go back. If he did not, and his other wife wished to be free, surely in the chicane of the law courts there must be some shuffle that could be for once made useful to a good end. Mrs. Nightingale had reasoned it all out in cold blood, and she was, as we have told you, a strong woman. But had she really taken her own measure? Could she sit there much longer with him beside her, and his words of twenty years ago sounding in her ears, almost the feeling of the kisses, she had so dutifully pointed out the lawlessness and allowed the repetition of in that old forgotten time, forgotten by him, never by her, was it possible to bear without crying out the bewilderment of a mixed existence such as that his presence and identity forced upon her, wrenching her this way and that, interweaving the woof of then with the weft of now, even as in that labyrinth of musical themes and phrases in the other room they crossed and recrossed one another at the bidding of each instrument as its turn came to tell its tale. Her brain reeled, and her heart ached under the intolerable stress. Could she still hold on, or would she be, after all, driven to make some excuse and run for the solitude of her own room to live down the tension as best she might, alone? The music itself came to her assistance, its triumphant strength in an indescribable outburst of hope or joy 
or mastery of fate, as it drew near to its final close, spoke to her of the great ocean that lies beyond the crabbed limits of our stinted lives, the boundless sea our rivulets of life steal down to, to be lost in, and while it lasted made it possible for her to be still. She took her eyes from Fenwick and waited. When she raised them again, in the silence Opus of 999 came to an end in, she saw that he had moved. His face had gone into his hands, and as she looked up, his old action of rubbing them into his loose hair and shaking it had come back, and his strong identity with his boyhood, dependent on the chance of the moment, had disappeared. He got up suddenly, and after a turn across the room he was in, walked into the other one, and contributed his share to the babble of felicitation or comment that followed what was clearly thought an achievement in musical rendering. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear,' said Letitia Wilson, "'was ever a poor girl so sat upon? I feel quite flat.' This was not meant to be taken too much au pied de la lettre. It was merely a method of praise of Mr. Bradshaw. "'But what a jolly shame you had to give it up!' This was Sally in undisguised admiration. But in Mr. Julius Bradshaw's eyes, Sally's identity had undergone a change. Her breezy frankness had made hay of a grand passion, and was blowing the hay all over the field. He had come close to, and had a good look, but will hardly go away in a huff, although he feels a little silly over his public worship of these past weeks. Just at this moment of the story, however, he is very apologetic towards Miss Wilson, on whom, if she reports correctly, he has sat. He tries no pretences with a view to her reinstatement, even on a par with himself. He knows, and every one knows, they would be seen through immediately. It is no use assuring her she is a capital player of her years. Much better let it alone. "'Are you any the worst, Mr. Bradshaw?' says Dr. Vereker. Obviously, as a medical authority, it is his duty to voice this inquiry, so he voices it. No, but that's about as much as I can do with safety. It won't do to spoil my night's rest and be late at the shop. It was easy to talk about the shop with perfect unreserve after such a performance as that. Oh, dear, we are so sorry for you, thus the two girls. And concurrence comes in various forms from Vereker, Fenwick, and the pianist, whom we haven't mentioned before. He was a cousin of Miss Wilson's, and was one of those unfortunate young men who have no individuality whatever. But pianists have to be human unless you can afford a pianola. You may speak of them as Mr. Watts's-name, or Miss Thingamy, but you must give them tea or coffee or cake or sandwiches, or whatever is brought in on a tray. This young man's name, we believe, was Elsley. Nobody Elsley. Miss Sally, in her frivolity, had thought fit to christen him. You know how, in your own life, people come in and go out, and you never know anything about them. Even so, this young man, in this story. I was very sorry for myself, I assure you. It is Bradshaw who speaks. When I had to make up my mind to give it up, but it couldn't be helped. He speaks without reserve, but as of an unbearable subject. In fact, Sally said afterwards to Tishy, it seemed as if he was going to cry. He doesn't cry, though, but goes on. At one time I really thought I should have gone and jumped into the river. Why didn't you? asked Sally. I should have. Yes, silly Sally, says Letitia, and then you would have swum like a fish, and the police would have pulled you out, and you would have looked ridiculous. But Sally is off on a visit to her mother in the next room. Tired, Mummy darling? She kisses her, and her mother answers, "'Yes, love, a little,' and kisses her back. "'Doesn't he play beautifully, mother?' says Sally. But her mother says, "'Yes,' absently. Her attention is taken off by something else. What is wrong with Mr. Fenwick? Sally doesn't think anything is. It's only his way. "'I'm sure there's something wrong,' says Mrs. Nightingale, and gets up to go into the front room rather wearily. "'I shall go to bed soon, Poppet,' she says, and leave you to do the honours. Is anything wrong, doctor? She speaks under her voice to Vereker, looking very slightly round at Fenwick, who, after the movement that alarmed her, a rather unusually marked head-shake and pressure of his hands on his eyes, is standing looking down at the fire on the rug with his back to her, as she speaks to Vereker. 
"'I fancy he's had what he calls a recurrence,' says the doctor. "'Nothing to hurt. "'These half-recollections will go on until the memory comes back in earnest. "'It may, some time. "'Are you talking about me, doctor?' His attention may have been caught by a reflection in the glass before him. Yes, it was a very queer occurrence, something about lawn tennis, only it had to do with what Miss Wilson said about the police fishing Sally out of the water. He looks round for Miss Wilson, but she is at the other end of the room on a sofa, talking to Bradshaw about the Strad, as recorded once before. Sally testifies. Tishy said it wouldn't work, trying to drown yourself if you could swim. No more it would. "'But why should that make me think of lawn tennis? "'It did. "'He looks seriously distressed by it, can make nothing out. "'Kitten,' says Sally's mother to her suddenly, "'I think I shall go away to bed. I'm feeling very tired.' "'She says good-night comprehensively and departs, "'but she is so clearly the worse for something "'that her daughter follows her to see that the something is not serious. "'Outside she reassures Sally, who returns.' Oh, no, she's only tired, really, nothing else. But what drove her out of the room was a feeling that she must be alone and silent. Could her position be borne at all? Yes, with patience and self-control. But that, why should it make me think of lawn tennis, was trying. Not only the pain of still more revived association, but the fear that his memory might travel still farther into the past, it was living on the edge of a volcano. Her own memory had followed on too, taking up the thread of that old interview in the garden of twenty years ago. She had felt again the clasp of his arm, the touch of his hand, had heard his voice of passionate protest, protest against the idea that he could ever forget. And she had then pretended to make a half-joke of his earnestness. What would he do now, really? If she were to tell him she preferred his great friend Arthur Fenwick to him, that was nonsense, he said, but knew she didn't. Besides, Arthur wanted Jessie Nairn. Why, didn't they waltz all the waltzes at the party last week? Well, so did we, for that matter, all, but... And just look how they had run away together. Wasn't that them coming back? Yes, it was. And an artificial calm ensued, and more self-contained manners... But then, before the other two young lovers could rejoin them, she had time for a word more. No, dear Jerry, seriously, if I were to write out no to you in India, a great big final no, then what do you think you would do? I know what I think I should do. I should throw myself into the Hooghly or the Ganges. You silly boy, you would swim about whether you liked or no, and then Jemadars or Shastras or Sudras or something would come and pull you out, and then how ridiculous you would look. No, Rosy, because I can't swim. Isn't it funny? Then she recollected his friend's voice striking in with, What's that? Jerry Pallas a swim? Of course he can't. He can wrestle or run or ride or jump, and he's the best man I know with the gloves on, but swim he can't. That's flat. Also how Jerry had then told eagerly how he was nearly drowned once, and Arthur fished him up from the bottom of Abingdon Lock. The latter went on. It was after that we tattooed each other, his name on my arm, my name on his, so as not to quarrel. You know, I suppose, that men who tattoo each other's arms can't quarrel if they try. Arthur showed A. Palliser, tattooed blue on his arm. Both young men were very grave and earnest about the safeguard, and then she remembered a question she asked, and how both replied with perfect gravity, of course, sure to. The question had been, was it invariable that all men quarrelled if one saved the other from drowning? She sits upstairs alone by the fire in her bedroom, and dreams again through all the past, except the nightmare of her life, that she always shudders away from. Sally will come up presently, and then she will feel ease again. Now it is a struggle against fever. She can hear plainly enough, for the house is but a London suburban villa, the strains from the drawing-room of what is possibly the most hackneyed violin music in the world, the Tartini, so-called Devil Sonata. Every phrase, every run, every chord an enthralling mystery still, an utterance none can explain, an inexhaustible thing no age can wither, and no custom stale. 
It is so soothing to her that it matters little if it makes them late, but that young man will destroy his nerves to a certainty outright. Then comes the chaos of dispersal. The broken fragments of the intelligible a watchful ear may pick out. Dr. Vereker won't have a cab. He will leave the cello till next time and walk. Mr. Bradshaw wants to get to Bayswater. Of course, that's all in our way, we being Miss Wilson and the cousin, the non-entity. We can give Mr. Bradshaw a lift as far as he goes, and then he can take the growler on. Then more good nights are wished than the nature of things will admit of before tomorrow. Fenwick and Vereker like something to smoke, with a preposterous solicitude to use only one tan-sticker between them, and walk away umbrella-less, from which we see that it is holding up. Then comes silence, and a consciousness of a policeman musing, and suspecting doors having been left stood open. And it was then Sally went upstairs, and indicted her friend for sitting on that sofa after calling him a shop-boy, and she didn't forget it either, for after she and her mother were in bed, and presumably better, she called out to her. "'I say, Mummy!' "'What, dear?' "'Isn't that St. John's Church?' "'Isn't which St. John's Church?' "'Where Tishy goes?' "'Yes, Ladbroke Grove Road. Why?' "'Because now Mr. Bradshaw will go there. Public worship.' "'Will he, dear? Suppose we go to sleep.' But she really meant you, not we, for it was a long time before she went to sleep herself. She had plenty to think of, and wanted to be quiet, conscious of Sally in the neighbourhood. We hope our reader was not misled, as we ourselves were, when Mrs. Nightingale first saw the name on Fenwick's arm, into supposing that she accepted it as his real name. She knew better. But then, how was she to tell him his name was Palliser? Think it over. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of Somehow Good》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter Thirteen Of a Sleepless Night Mrs. Nightingale Had, and How Sally Woke Up and Talked. Was it possible, thought Rosalind in the sleepless night that followed, that the recurrence of the tennis garden in Fenwick's mind might grow and grow and be a nucleus round which the whole memory of his life might reform. Even so she had seen, at a chemical lecture, a supersaturated solution, translucent and spotless, suddenly fill with innumerable ramifications from one tiny crystal dropped into it. Might not this shred of memory chance to be a crystal of the right salt in the solvent of his mind, and set going a swift arborescence to penetrate the whole? Might not one branch of that tree be a terrible branch, one whose leaves and fruit were poisoned, and whose stem was clothed with thorns? A hideous metaphor of the moment, call it the worst in her life, when her young husband, driven mad with the knowledge that had just forced its way into his reluctant mind, had almost struck her away from him, and with angry words of which the least was traitorous, had broken through the effort of her hands to hold him, and left her speechless in her despair. It was such a nightmare idea, this anticipation that next time she met Jerry's eyes she might see again the anger that was in them on that blackest of her few married days, might see him again vanish from her, this time never to return and it spread an ever-growing horror, greater and greater in the silence and the darkness of the night, till it filled all space, and became a power that thrilled through every nerve, and denied the right of any other thing in the infinite void to be known or thought of. Which of us has not been left, with no protection but our own weak resolutions, to the mercy of a dominant idea in the still hours, when others were near us, sleeping, whom we might not wake to say one word to save us. What would his face be like? How would his voice sound when she saw him next? Or would some short and cruel letter come to say he had remembered all 
and now, for all the gratitude he owed her, he could not bear to look upon her face again, hers who had done him such a wrong. If so, what should she, what could she, do? There was only one counterthought to this that brought with it a momentary balm. She would send Sally to him, to beg, beseech, implore him not to repeat his headstrong error of the old years, to swear to him that if he could only know all, he would forgive, nay more, that if he could know quite all, the very whole of the sad story, not only would he forgive, but rather seek forgiveness for himself, for the too harsh judgment he so rashly formed. What should she say to Sally? How should she instruct her to plead for her? Never mind that now. All she wanted in her lonely, nervous delirium was the ease the thought gave her. The mere thought of the force of Sally's fixed, immovable belief that, she was certain of, that whatsoever her mother had done was right. Never mind the exact amount of revelation she would have to make to Sally. She might surely indulge the idea, just to get at peace somehow, till, as pray heaven it might turn out, she should know that Jerry's mind was still unconscious of its past. The chances were, so she thought mechanically to herself, that all her alarms were groundless. And at the first, strange as it is to tell, Sally's identity was only that of the daughter she had now, that filled her life and gave her the heart to live. She was the Sally space was full of for her. What she was, and why she was, merged, as it usually did, in the broad fact of her existence. But there was always the chance that this what and why, two bewildering imps, should flaunt their unsolved conundrum through her mother's baffled mind. There they were, sure enough, in the end, enjoying her inability to answer, dragging all she prayed daily to be better able to forget out into the light of the memory they had kindled. There they were, chuckling over her misery, and hiding, so Rosalind feared, a worse question than any, keeping it back for a final stroke to bring her mental fever to its height. How could Sally be the daughter of a devil, and her soul be free from the taint of his damnation? If Rosalind had only been well-read in the medieval classics, and had known that story of Merlin's birth, the nativity that was to rewrite the Galilean story in letters of hell, and give mankind for ever to be the thrall of the fallen angel his father. And now the babe at its birth was snatched away to the waters of baptism, and poor Satan, alas, obliged to cast about for some new plan of campaign, which, to say truth, he must have found, and practised with some success, but Rosalind had never read this story. Had she done so, she might have felt, as we do, that the tears of an absolutely blameless mother might serve to cleanse the inherited sin from a babe unborn, as surely as the sacramental found itself. And it may be that some such thought had woven itself into the story Fenwick's imagination framed for Rosalind the evening before, that time that she said of Sally, "'She is not a devil.' The exact truth, the ever-present record that was in her mind as she said this, must remain unknown to us. But to return to her as she is now, racked by a twofold mental fever, an apprehension of a return of Fenwick's memory, and a stimulated recrudescence of her own, with the pain of all the scars burnt in twenty years ago, revived now by her talk with him of a few hours since. She could bear it no longer, there, alone in the darkness of the night, she must get at Sally, if only to look at her. Why, that child never could be got to wake unless shaken when she was wanted. Ten to one she wouldn't this time. And it would make all the difference just to see her there, alive and leagues away in dreamland. If her sleep lasted through the crackle of a match to light her candle, heard through the open door between their rooms, the light of the candle itself wouldn't wake her. Rosalind remembered, as she lit the candle and found her dressing-gown, for the night air struck cold, how once, when a ten-year-old, Sally had locked herself in, and no noise or knocking would rouse her. How she herself, alarmed for the child, had thereon summoned help, and the door was broken open, but only to be greeted by the sleeper, after explanation, with, "'Why didn't you knock?' She was right in her forecast, 
and perhaps it was as well the girl did not wake. She would only have had a needless fright to see her mother haggard with self-torment by her bedside at that hour. So Rosalind got her full look at the rich coils of black hair that framed up the unconscious face, that for all its unconsciousness had on it the contentment of an amused dreamer, at the white ivory skin it set off so well, with the one visible ear that heard nothing, or if it did, translated it into dream, and the faint rhythmic movement that vouched for soundless breath. She looked as long as she dared, then moved away, but she had barely got her head back on the pillow when, "'Was that you, mother?' came from the next room. Her mother always said of Sally that nothing was certain but the imprévu, and ascribed to her a monstrous perversity. It was this that caused her to sleep profoundly through that most wakening of incidents, a person determined not to disturb you, and then to wake up short into that person's self-congratulations on success. "'Of course it was, darling. Who else could it have been?' Sally's reply, "'I thought it was, seems less reasonable, mere conversation-making, and a sequel, as of one reviewing new and more comfortable positions in bed, follows naturally. A decision on the point does not prohibit conversation, rather facilitates it. "'What did you come for, Mummy?' "'Eau de Cologne.' The voice has a fell intention of instant sleep in it, which Sally takes no notice of. "'Have you got it?' "'Got it? Yes. Go to sleep, chatterbox.' It was true about the eau de cologne, for Rosalind, with a self-acting instinct that explanation might be called for, had picked up the bottle on her return journey. You see, she was always practising wicked deceits and falsehoods, all to save that little chit being made miserable on her account. But the chit wasn't going to sleep again. She was going to enjoy her new attitude awake. Who woke her up? Answer that. I say, mother. What, kitten? Go to sleep. All right, in a minute. Do you remember Mr. Fenwick's bottle of eau de cologne? Of course I do. Go to sleep. Just going. But wasn't it funny? What funny? Oh, the eau de cologne. Rosalind isn't really sleepy and may as well talk. Yes, that was very funny. I wonder where he got it. She seems roused, and her daughter is repentant. Oh, dear, what a shame. I've just spoiled your go-off. Poor mother. Never mind, chick. I like to talk a little. It was funny that he should have a big bottle of eau de cologne, of all things, in his pocket. Yes, but it was rummer still about Rosalind Nightingale, his Rosalind Nightingale, the one he knew. This is dangerous ground, and Rosalind knows it. But a plea of half-sleep will cover mistakes, and conversation about the pre-electrocution period is the nearest approach to taking Sally into her confidence that she can hope for. She is so weary with her hours of wakefulness that she becomes a little reckless, foreseeing a resource in such uncertainty of speech as may easily be ascribed to a premature dream. It's not impossible that it should have been your grandmother, kitten, but we can't find out now, and it wouldn't do us any good that I can see. It would be nice to know, for curiosity, couldn't anything be fished out in the granny connection? No documents? Nothing will ever be fished out by me in that connection, Sally darling. Sally knows from her mother's tone of voice that they are approaching an impasse. She means to give up the point the moment it comes fully in view, but she will go on until that happens. She has to think out what was the name of the sub-dean before she speaks again. Didn't the Reverend Decimus Ierson grab all the belongings? They were left to him, child. It was all fair, as far as that goes. I didn't grudge him the things. Indeed, I felt rather grateful to him for taking them. It would only have been painful, going over them. Different people feel differently about these things. I didn't want old recollections. Hadn't the Reverend Decimus a swarm of brats? Sally, darling! Well, yes, he had. There were two families, one of six daughters. I forget which. Couldn't they be got at, to see if they wouldn't recollect something? Of course they could. They've married a lawyer, at least one of them has, and all the rest, I believe, live with them. At another time Sally would have examined this case in relation to the deceased's wife's sister, Bill, but she was too interested now to stop her mother continuing. 
But what a silly chick you are. Why should they know anything about it? Oh, why shouldn't they? Her mother's reply is emphasised. My dear, do consider. I was with your grandmother till within a month of her marriage with the Reverend, as you call him, and I should have been ten times more likely to hear about Mr. Fenwick than ever they would afterwards. Your grandmother had never even seen them when I went away to India to be married. What's the lawyer's name? Behrman, I think, or Dearman, but why? Oh, no, by the by, I think it's Beasley. Because I could write and ask, or call. Sure to hear something. My dear, you'll hear nothing, and they'll only think you mad. Rosalind was beginning to feel she had made a mistake. She did not feel so sure Sally would hear nothing. A recollection crossed her mind of how one of the few incidents there was time for in her short married life had been the writing of a letter by her husband to his friend, the real Fenwick, and of much chaff therein about the eldest of these very daughters and her powerful rivalry to Jessie Nairn. It came back to her now. Sally alarmed her still further. Yes, mother, I shall just get Mr. Fenwick to hunt up the address and go and call on the Beasleys. This sudden assumption of a concrete form by the family was due to a vivid image that filled Sally's active brain immediately of a household of parched women presided over by a dried man who owned a wig on a stand and knew what chaff-wax meant, which she didn't. A shop-window near Lincoln's Inn was responsible, but to Rosalind it really seemed that Sally must have had other means of studying this family, and she was frightened. "'You don't know them, kitten. Not the least. Don't want to.' This reflection suggests caution. "'Perhaps I'd better write.' "'Better do nothing of the sort, child. Better go to sleep.' "'All right.' But Sally does not like quitting the subject so abruptly, and enlarges on it a little more. She sketches out a letter to be written to the lady who is at present a buffer state between the dried man and the parched women. "'Dear Madam,' she recites, "'you may perhaps recall, or will perhaps recall, which is right, mother. "'Either, dear, go to sleep.' But just at this moment Rosalind recollects, with satisfaction, that the name was neither Beasley nor Dearman, but Tresillian Treadgold. She has been thinking of falling back on affectation of sleep to avoid more alarms, but this makes it needless. "'I'm sure I've got the name wrong,' she says, with revived wakefulness in her voice. But Sally is murmuring to herself, "'Perhaps recall my mother, Mrs. Rosalind Nightingale, Rosalind in brackets.' by her maiden name of uh, by the same name who married the late mr graythorpe in india I, I say mother yes little goose how am i to put all that go to sleep i don't think you'll find that family very coming my impression is you had much better leave it alone what good would it do you to find out who mr fenwick was and perhaps have him go away to australia why australia Oh, dear, what mistakes Rosalind did make! Why on earth need she name the place she knew Jerry did go to? America would have done just as well. Australia, New Zealand, America, anywhere. But Sally doesn't mind, has fallen back on her letter sketch. Apologising for troubling you, believe me, dear madam, yours faithfully, or very faithfully, or truly, Rosalind Nightingale. No, I should not like Mr. Fenwick to go away anywhere. No more would you. I want him here for us. So do you. I should be very sorry indeed for Mr. Fenwick to go away. We should miss him badly. But fancy what his wife must be feeling if he has one. I can sympathise with her. It really was a relief to say anything so intensely true. Did the reality with which she spoke impress Sally more than mere words, which were no more than the common form of conversation. Probably, for something in them brought back her conference with the Major on Boxing Day morning when her mother was at church. What was that she had said to him when she was sitting on his knee improving his whiskers, that if she, later on, saw reason to suppose his suspicions true, she would ask her mother point-blank? Why not? And here she was with the same suspicions, quite, quite independent of the Major. 
and see how dark it was in both rooms. One could say anything. Besides, if her mother didn't want to answer, she could pretend to be asleep. She wouldn't ask too loud, to give her a chance. Mother, darling, if Mr. Fenwick was to make you an offer, how should you like it? Oh, dear, what's that child saying? What is it, Sallykin? I was just going off. Now, obviously, you can ask a Lady Sally's question in the easy course of flowing chat, but you can't drag her from the golden gates of sleep to ask it. It gets too official. So Sally backed out, and said she had said nothing, which wasn't the case. The excessive readiness with which her mother accepted the statement looks, to us, as if she had really been awake and heard. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Somehow Good. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter 14. How Millais's Huguenot came of a walk in the back garden, and how Fenwick very nearly kissed Sally. In spite of Colonel Lund's having been so betimes in his forecastings about Mrs. Nightingale and Fenwick, as we must go on calling him for the present, still, when one day that lady came, about six weeks after the nocturne in our last chapter, and told him she must have his consent to a step she was contemplating before she took it, he felt a little shock in his heart. One of those shocks one so often feels, when one hears that a thing he has anticipated without pain, even with pleasure, is to become actual. But he replied at once, "'My dear, of course!' without hearing any particulars, and added, "'You will be happy, I am sure. Why should I refuse my consent to your marrying Fenwick? Because that's it, I suppose.' That was it. The Major had guessed right. "'He asked me to marry him last night,' she said, with simple equanimity and directness. "'I told him yes.' as far as my own wishes went, but I said I wouldn't if either you or the kitten forbade the bans. I don't think we shall, either of us. It was a daughter's marriage warrant he was being asked to sign, a document seldom signed without a heartache, more or less, for him who holds the pen. But his cœur navré had to be concealed for the sake of the applicant, no wet blanket should be cast on her new happiness. He kissed her affectionately. To him, for all her thirty-nine or forty birthdays, she was still the young girl he had helped and shielded in her despair twenty years ago, he himself being then a widower, nearly forty years her senior. "'No, Rosa, dear,' continued the Major, "'as far as I can see, there can be no objection but one.' you know. The one? Yes, it's all a terra incognita. He may have a wife elsewhere, seeking for him. Who can tell? It is a risk to run, but I am prepared to run it. She was going to add, for his sake, but remembered that her real meaning for these words would be, for the sake of the man I wronged, and that the Major knew nothing of Fenwick's identity. She had not been able to persuade herself to make even her old friend her confidant. Danger lay that way. She knew silence would be safe against anything but Fenwick's own memory. "'Yes, it's a risk, no doubt,' the Major said, "'but I am like him. I cannot conceive a man forgetting that he had a wife. It seems an impossibility. He has talked about you to me, you know.' "'In connection with his intention about me?' "'Almost. Not quite definitely, but almost. "'He knew I understood what he meant. "'It seemed to me he was fidgeting more about his having so little to offer in the way of worldly goods "'than about any possible wife in the clouds.' "'Tear fellow! Just fancy! "'Why, those people in the city would take him into partnership to-morrow "'if he had a little capital to bring in.' They told him so themselves. And you would finance him? Is that the idea? 
"'Well, I suppose, as I'm your trustee, "'if the money was all lost, I should have to make it up, "'so it wouldn't matter.' "'Oh, Major, dear, is that what being a trustee means?' <laughs> "'Of course, my dear Rosa, what did you think it meant?' "'Do you know, I don't know what I did think. "'At least, I thought it would be very nice if you were my trustee.' The conversation has gone off on a siding, but the Major shunts the train back. That was what you and little Fiddlestick's End were talking about till three in the morning, then? Oh, Major, dear, did you hear us? And we kept you awake. What a shame! For on the previous evening, Sally being out musicking and expected home late, Fenwick and Mrs. Nightingale had gone out into the back garden to enjoy the sweet air of that rare phenomenon, a really fine spring night in England, leaving the Major indoors because of his bronchial tubes. The late seventies shrink from night air, even when one means to be a healthy octogenarian. Also, they go away to bed, secretively, when no one is looking. At least the Major did in this case. Of course he was staying the night, as usual. So, in the interim between the Major's good night and Sally's cab wheels, this elderly couple of lovers, as they would have worded their own description, had the summer night to themselves. As the Major closed his bedroom window, he saw, before drawing down the blind, that the two were walking slowly up and down the gravel path, talking earnestly. No impression of mature years came to the Major from that gravel path. A well-made, handsome man, with a bush of brown hair and a rally beard, and a graceful woman suggesting her beauty through the clear moonlight, that was the implication of as much as he could see, as he drew the inference a word of soliloquy hinted at. Not Millais's Huguenot so far. <laughs> but he evidently expected that grouping very soon, only he was too sleepy to watch for it, and went to bed. Besides, would it have been honourable? "'It's no use, Fenwick,' she said to him in the garden, "'trying to keep off the forbidden subject, so I won't try.' "'It's not forbidden by me. "'Nothing could be that you would like to say.' "'What's that?' she thought. "'Only what so many men say every day to so many women, "'and mean so little by. "'Or was it more? "'She could not be sure yet. "'She glanced at him as they turned at the path-end, and her misgivings all but vanished, so serious and resolved was his quiet face in the moonlight. She was half-minded to say to him, "'Do you mean that you love me, Fenwick?' But then, was it safe to presume on the peculiarity of her position, of which he, remember, knew absolutely nothing? For with her it was not as with other women, who expects what is briefly called an offer. In her case, the man beside her was her husband, to whose exorcism of her love from his life her heart had never assented. While, in his eyes, she differed in no way in her relation to him from any woman to whom a man, placed as he was, longs to say that she is what he wants most of all mortal things, but stickles in the telling of it from sheer cowardice, who dares not risk the loss of what share he has in her in the attempt to get the whole. She grasped the whole position, he only part of it. I am glad it is so, she decided to say, because each time I see you, I want to ask if nothing has come back, no trace of memory. Nothing. It's all gone. Nothing comes back. Do you remember about the tennis court? Did it go any further, or die out completely? He stopped a moment in his walk, and flicked the ash from his cigar, and then, after a moment's thought, replied, "'I'm not sure. It seemed to get mixed with my name, on my arm. I think it was only because Tennis and Fenwick are a little alike.' His companion thought how near the edge of a volcano both were, and resolved to try a crucial experiment. Better an eruption, after all, or a plunge in the crater, than a life of incessant doubt. "'You remember the name Algernon, clearly?' "'Not clearly, but it was the only name with an A that felt right, unless it was Arthur, 
but I'm sure my name never was Arthur. Sally thought it was a hypnotic suggestion, thought I had laid an unfair stress upon it. I easily might have. Why? Did you know an Algernon? My husband's name was Algernon. She herself wondered how any voice that spoke so near a heart that beat as hers did at this moment could keep it secret. Yet it betrayed nothing, and so supreme was her self-control that she could say to herself, even while she knew she would pay for this effort later, that the pallor of her face would betray nothing either. He would put that down to the moonlight. She was a strong woman for she went steadily on to convince herself of her own self-command. I knew him very little by that name, though. I always called him Jerry. He merely repeated the name thrice, but it gave her a moment of keen apprehension. Any stirring of memory over it might be the thin end of a very big wedge. But if there was any, it was an end so thin that it broke off. Fenwick looked round at her. Do you know, he said, I rather favour the hypnotic suggestion theory. For the moment you said the name Jerry, I fancied I too knew it as the short for Algernon. <laughs> now that's absurd. No two people ever made Jerry out of Algernon. It's always Algy. Always. Certainly it would be odd. I'm rather inclined to think, said Fenwick, after a short silence, that I can understand how it happened. Only then... Perhaps my name may not be Algernon at all, and here I have been using it, signing with it, and so on. What do you understand? Well, I suspect this. I suspect that you did lay some kind of stress, naturally, on your husband's name, and also on its abbreviation. It affected me somehow with a sense of familiarity. Is it so very improbable that you were familiar with the name Jerry, too? It might be, anything might be, but surely we almost know that two accidental adoptions of Jerry, as short for Algernon, would not come across each other by chance, as yours and mine have done. What is almost knowing? But tell me this, when I call you Jerry, Jerry, <laughs> there, does the association or impression repeat itself? She repeated the name once and again to try. There was a good deal of nettle grasping in all this, also a wish to clinch matters, to drive the sword to the hilt, to put an end, once and for all, to the state of tension she lived in. For surely, if anything could prove his memory was really gone, it would be this, that she should call him by his name of twenty years ago, should utter it to him, as she could not help doing, in the tone in which she spoke to him then, and that her doing so should arouse no memory of the past, surely this would show, if anything could show it, that the past had been finally erased from the scroll of his life. She had a moment only of suspense after speaking, and then, as his voice came in answer, she breathed again freely. Nothing could have shown a more complete unconsciousness than his reply, after another moment of reflection, do you know, Mrs. Nightingale, that convinces me that the name Algernon was produced by your way of saying it. It was hypnotic suggestion. I assure you that, however strange you may think it, every time you repeat the name Jerry, it seems more familiar to me. If you said it often enough, I have no doubt I should soon be believing in the diminutive as devoutly as I believe in the name itself, because I am quite convinced of Algernon Fenwick. Continually signing per prose has driven it home. He didn't seem quite in earnest over his conviction, though, seemed to laugh a little about it. But a sadder tone came into his voice, after an interval in which his companion, frightened at her own temerity, resolved that she would not call him Jerry again. It was sailing too near the wind. She was glad he went back from this side channel of their talk to the main subject. No, I have no hope of getting to the past through my own mind. I feel it is silence. And that being so, I should be sorry that any illumination should come to me out of the past, throwing light on records my mind could not read. I mean, 
any proof positive of what my crippled memory could not confirm, I would rather remain quite in the dark, unless, indeed... Unless what? Unless the well-being of some others, forgotten with my forgotten world, is involved in, dependent on, my return to it. That would be shocking, the hungry nestlings in the deserted nest. But I am so convinced that I have only forgotten a restless life of rapid change, that I could not forget love and home, if I ever had them, that my misgivings about this are misgivings of the reason only, not of the heart. Do you understand me? Perfectly. At least I think so. Go on. I cannot help thinking, too, that a sense of a strong link with a forgotten yesterday would survive the complete effacement of all its details in the form of a wish to return to it. I have none. My to-day is too happy for me to wish to go back to that yesterday, even if I could, without a wrench. I feel a sort of shame in saying I should be sorry to return to it. It seems a sort of... a sort of disloyalty to the unknown. You might long to be back if you could know. Think, if you could see before you now, and recognise the woman who was once your wife. There was nettle grasping in this. It's a mere abstract idea, he replied, unaccompanied by any image of an individual. I perceive that it is dutiful to recognise the fact that I should welcome her if she appeared as a reality, but it is a large if. I am content to go on without an hypothesis. That is really all she is now, and my belief that if she had ever existed I should not be able to disbelieve in her underlies my acceptance of her in that character. Mrs. Nightingale laughed. We are mighty metaphysical, said she. Wouldn't it depend entirely on what she was like when all said and done? I believe I'm right. We women are more practical than men, after all. You make game of my metaphysics, as you call them. Well, I'll drop the metaphysics and speak the honest truth. He stopped and faced round towards her, standing on the garden path. Only, you must make me one promise. She stopped also and stood looking full at him. What promise? If I tell you all I think in my heart, you will not allow it to come between me and you? to undermine the only strong friendship I have in the world, the only one I know of. It shall make no difference between us. You may trust me. They turned and walked again slowly, once up and down. Then Fenwick's voice, when he next spoke, had an added earnestness, a growing tension, with an echo in it for her of the years gone by, a ring of his young enthusiasm, of his passionate outburst in the lawn-tennis garden twenty years ago. He made no more ado of what he had to say. I can form no image in my mind, try how I may, of any woman for whose sake I would give up one hour of the precious privilege I now enjoy. I have no right to, to assess it, to make a definition of it, but I have it now. I could not resume my place as the husband of a now unknown wife, you know what I mean, and not lose the privilege of being near you. It may be, it is conceivable, I mean, no more, that a revelation of me to myself, a light thrown on what I am, would bring me what would palliate the wrench of losing what I have of you. It may be so. It may be. All I know is... All I can say is that I can now imagine nothing, no treasure of love, of wife or daughter, that would be a make-weight for what I should lose if I had to part from you. He paused a moment, as though he thought he was going beyond his rights of speech, then added more quietly, No, I can imagine no hypothetical wife, and as for my hypothetical daughter, I find I am always utilising Sally for her. Mrs. Nightingale murmured in an undertone the word, Sallykin, as she so often did when her daughter was mentioned, with that sort of 
caress in her voice. This time it was caught by a sort of gasp, and she remained silent. What Sally was had crossed her mind. The strange relation in which she stood to Fenwick, born in his wedlock, but no daughter of his. And there he was, as fond of the child as he could be. Fenwick may have half misunderstood something in her manner, for when he spoke again, his words had a certain aspect of recoil from what he had said, at least of consideration of it in some new light. When I speak to you as freely as this, remember the nature of the claim I have to do so, the only apology I can make for taking an exceptional licence. How do you mean? I mean I do not count myself as a man, only a sort of inexplicable waif, a kind of cancelled man. A man without a past is like a child, or an idiot from birth suddenly endowed with faculties. What nonsense, Fenwick! You have brooded and speculated over your condition until you have become morbid. Do now, as Sally would say, chuck the metaphysics. Perhaps I was getting too sententious over it. I'm sorry, and please I won't do so any more. Don't, then. And now you'll see what will happen. You will remember everything quite suddenly. It will all come back in a flash, and, oh, how glad you will be! And think of the joy of your wife and children. Yes, and suppose all the while I am hating them for dragging me away from you, from me and Sally. I wasn't going to say Sally, but I don't want to keep her out, you and Sally, if you like. All I know is, if their reappearance were to bring with it a pleasure I cannot imagine, because I cannot imagine them, it would cut across my life as it is now, in a way that would drive me mad. Indeed it would. How could I say to myself, as I say now, as I dare to say to you, knowing what I am, that to be here with you now is the greatest happiness of which I am capable? All that would change if you recovered them. Yes, yes, maybe, but I shrink from it. I shrink from them. They are strangers, non-entities. You are... you are... Oh, it's no use. He stopped suddenly. What am I? It's no use beating about the bush. You are the centre of my life as it is. You are what I... all that is left of me, love best in the world. I cannot now conceive the possibility of anything but hatred for what might come between us, for what might sever the existing link, whatever it may be. I care little what it is called, so long as I may keep it unbroken, and I care nothing. It was her eyes meeting his that stopped him. He could read the meaning of her words in them before they were spoken, and then he replied in a voice less firm than before, Dare we? Knowing what I am, knowing what may come suddenly, any hour of the day, out of the unknown, dare we call it love? Perhaps in Fenwick's mind at this moment the predominant feeling was terror of the consequences to her that marriage with him might betray her into. It was much stronger than any misgiving, although a little remained, of her feelings towards himself. What else can we call it? It's a good old word. She said this quite calmly. With a very happy face one could see the flush of pleasure and success on, even in the moonlight. And there was no reluctance, no shrinking in her, from her share of the outcome the Major had not waited to see. Millais's Huguenot was complete. Rosalind Graythorpe, or Palliser, stood there again with her husband's arm round her, her husband of twenty years ago, and in that fact was the keynote of what there was of unusual, of unconventional, one might almost phrase it, in her way of receiving and requiting his declaration. It hardly need be said that he was unconscious of any such thing. A man whose soul is reeling with the intoxication of a new-found happiness is not over-critical about the exact movement of the hand that has put the cup to his lips. The Huguenot arrangement might have gone on in the undisturbed moonlight till the chill of the morning came to break it up, 
if a cab-wheel crescendo and a strepitoso peal at the bell had not announced Sally, who burst into the house and rushed into the drawing-room tumultuously, to be corrected back by a serious word from Anne, the door-opener, that Mrs. and Mr. Fenny could step out in the garden. Anne's parade of her conviction that this was en règle, when no one said it wasn't, was suggestive in the highest degree. Professional perjury at a law court could not have been more self-conscious. Probably Anne knew all about it as well as Cook. Sally saw nothing. She was too full of great events at Ladbrook Grove Road, the sort of events that are announced with a preliminary, What do you think, N or M? and then develop the engagement of O to P, or the jilting of Q by R. There was just time for a dozen words between the components of the Millet group in the moonlight. Shall we tell Sally? It was the Huguenot that asked the question. Not just this minute. Wait till I can think. Perhaps I'll tell her upstairs. Now say good-bye before the chick comes, and go. And the chick came on the scene just too late to criticise the pose. I say, mother! This with the greatest empressement of which humanity and youth are capable. I've got something I must tell you. What is it, kitten? Tishy's head over ears in love with a shop boy. Shh, you noisy little monkey, do consider. The neighbours will hear every word you say. So they will, probably, as Miss Sally's voice is very penetrating and rings musically clear in the summer night. Her attitude is that she doesn't care if they do. Besides, they're only cats, and nobody knows who Tishy is or the shop boy. I'll come down and tell you all about it. We're coming up, darling. You see, Sally had manifestoed down into the garden from the landing of the stair which was made of open ironwork you knocked flower-pots down and broke, and you had to have a new one. That, at least, is how Anne put it. On the stair-top, Mrs. Nightingale stems the torrent of her daughter's revelation, because it's so late, and Mr. Fenwick must get away. "'You must tell him all about it another time. I don't know whether it's any concern of his.' "'Taken scrupulous, are we, all of a sudden?' says Fenwick, laughing. "'That cock won't fight, Miss Pussy. "'You'll have to tell me all about it when I come to-morrow. "'Good night, Mrs. Nightingale.' "'A sort of humorous formality in his voice "'makes Sally look from one to the other, "'but it leads to nothing. "'Sally goes to see Fenwick depart, "'and her mother goes upstairs with a candle. "'In a minute or so Sally pelts up the stairs, "'leaving Anne and the cook to thumbscrew "'on the shutter-panels of the street-door "'and make sure that housebreaker baffling bells are susceptible.' Do you know, Mamma? I really did think. What do you think I thought? What, darling? I thought Mr. Fenwick was going to kiss me. In fact, Fenwick had only just remembered in time that family privileges must stand over till after the revelation. Should you have minded if he had? Not a bit. Why should anybody mind Mr. Fenwick kissing them? You wouldn't yourself. You know you wouldn't. Come now, mother. I shouldn't distress myself, Poppet. But words are mere wind. The manner of them is everything. And the foreground of her mother's manner suggests a background to Sally. She has smelt a rat, and suddenly fixes her eyes on a tell-tale countenance, fraught with mysterious reserves. Mother, you are going to marry Mr. Fenwick. No change of type could do justice to the emphasis with which Sally goes straight to the point. Italics throughout would be weak. Her mother smiles as she fondles her daughter's excited face. I am, darling. So you may kiss him yourself when he comes tomorrow evening. And Tishy's passion for the shop-boy had to stand over. But, as the Major had said, the mother and daughter talked till three in the morning. Well... Past two, anyhow. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Somehow Good This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK Chapter 15 Concerning Dr. Vereker and his mamma, 
who had known it all along. How Sally lunched with the Sales Wilsons, and got speculating about her father. How Tishy let out about Major Roper. How there was a wedding. The segment of a circle of society that did duty for a sphere, in the case of Mrs. Nightingale and Sally, was collectively surprised when it heard of the intended marriage of the former, having settled in its own mind that the latter was the magnet to Mr. Fenwick's lodestone. But each several individual that composed it had, it seemed, foreseen exactly what was going to happen, and had predicted it in language that could only have been wilfully mistaken by persons interested in proving that the speaker was not a prophet. Exceptional insight had been epidemic. The only wonder was, to the individual speaker, that Mrs. Nightingale had remained single so long, and the only other wonder was that none of the other cases had seen it. They had evidently only taken seership mildly. Dr. Vereker had a good opportunity of studying omniscience of a malignant type in the very well-marked case of his own mother. You may remember Sally's denunciation of her as an old hen that came wobbling down on you, when her son, in the simplicity of his heart, announced to her as a great and curious piece of news that Mr. Fenwick was going to marry Mrs. Nightingale, she did not even look up from her knitting to reply, "'What did I say to you, Connie?' For his name was Conrad, as Sally had reported. His discretion was not on the alert on this occasion, for he incautiously asked, "'When?' The good lady laid down her knitting on her knees, and folded her hands, interlacing her fingers, which were fat, as far as they would go, and leaning back with closed eyes, eyes intended to remain closed during anticipated patience. "'Fancy asking me that,' said she. "'Well, but hang it, when?' "'Do not use profane language, Conrad, in your mother's presence. Can you really ask me when?' "'Try and recollect!' Conrad appeared to consider, but as he had to contend with the problem of finding out when a thing had been said, the only clue to the nature of which was the date of its utterance, it was no great wonder that his cogitations ended in a shake of the head subdivided into its elements, shakes taken a brace at a time, and an expression of face as of one who whistles sotto voce. His questioner must have been looking between her eyelids, which wasn't playing fair, for she indicted him on the spot, and pushed him, as it were, into the dock. "'That, I suppose, means that I speak untruth. Very well, my dear,' resignation set in. "'Come, mother, I say now, be a reasonable maternal parent. When did I say anybody spoke untruth?' "'My dear, you said nothing.' But if your father could have heard what you did not say, you know perfectly well, my dear Conrad, what he would have thought. Was he likely to sit by and hear me insulted? Did he ever do so? The doctor was writing letters at a desk table that he used for miscellaneous correspondence as much as possible, in order that this very same mother of his should be left alone as little as possible. He ended a responsible letter and directed it, and made it a thing of the past with a stamp on it, in a little basket, on the hall-table outside. Then he came back to his mother, and bestowed on her the kiss, or peck, of peace. It always made him uncomfortable when he had to go away to the hospital, under the shadow of dissension at home. "'Well, mother dear, what was it you really did say about the Fenwick engagement?' "'It would be more proper, my dear, to speak of it as the Nightingale engagement. "'You will say it is a matter of form, but all right, the Nightingale engagement. "'My dear, so abrupt, to your mother. "'Well, dear mummy, what was it, really now?' "'This cajolery took effect, and the widow Vereker's soul softened. "'She resumed her knitting. "'If you don't remember what it was, dear, it doesn't matter.' The doctor saw that nothing short of complete concession would procure a tranquil sea. "'Of course, I remember perfectly well,' he said mendaciously. He knew that, left alone, his mother would supply a summary of what he remembered. She did so, with a bound. 
I said, my dear, and I am glad you recollect it, Conrad, I said from the very first, when Mr. Fenwick was living at Krakatoa, it was all quite right, my dear, do you think I don't know? A grown-up daughter and two servants. I said that any one with eyes in their head could see. And has it turned out exactly as I expected, or has it not? Exactly. Very well, dear. I'm glad you say so. Now don't contradict me another time. The close observer of the actual, whom we lay claim to be, has occasionally to report the apparently impossible. We do not suppose we shall be believed when we say that Mrs. Vereker added, Besides, there was the Major. Professor Sales Wilson, Letitia's father, was the Professor Sales Wilson. Only, if you had seen that eminent scholar when he got outside his library by accident and wanted to get back, you wouldn't have thought he was the anybody, and would probably have likened him to a disestablished hermit crab, in respect, that is, of such a one's desire to disappear into his shell, and that respect only. For no hermit crab would ever cause an acquaintance to wonder why he should shave at all if he could do it no better than that, nor what he was talking to himself about so frequently nor whether he polished his spectacles so long at a time to give the deep groove they were making across his nose a chance of filling up nor whether he would be less bald if he rubbed his head less nor what he had really got inside that overpowering phrenology of brow and behind that aspect of chronic concentration but about the retiring habits of both there could be no doubt he lived in his library, attired by nature in a dressing-gown and skull-cap, but from its secret recesses he issued manifestos which shook classical Europe. He corrected versions, excerpted passages, disallowed authenticities, ascribed works to their true authors, and exposed the pretensions of sciolists with a vigour which ought to have finally dispersed that unhallowed class— only it didn't, because they are a class incapable of shame, and will go on madly, even when they have been proved to be mere, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Perhaps they had secret information about the domestic circumstances of their destroyer, and didn't care. If Yaman had had private means of knowing that Vishnu was on uncomfortable terms with his wife, a corrected version of the whole Hindu mythology might have been necessary. However, so far as can be conjectured, the image the world formed of the professor was a sort of aggregate of Dr. Johnson, Bentley, Grotius, Mezzofanti, and a slight touch of, say, Connington, to bring him well up to date, but so much of the first that whenever the raconteur repeated one of the professor's moderately bon mots, he always put sir in, as, for instance, a punster, sir, is a man who demoralises two meanings in one word, or... Should you call that fast life, sir? I should call it slow death. The raconteur was rather given to making use of him, and assigning to him mots which were not at all bon, because they only had the sir in them, and were otherwise meaningless. He was distressed, not without reason, when he heard that he had said to Max Muller, or someone of that calibre, There is no such thing, sir, as the English language. But he very seldom heard anything about himself, or any one else, as he passed his life, as aforesaid, in his library, buried in the Phoenician dictionary he hoped he might live to bring out. He had begun the fourth letter, but we don't know the Phoenician alphabet. Perhaps it only has four letters in it. He came out of the library for meals, of course, but he took very little notice of anything that passed at the family board, and read nearly the whole time, occasionally saying something forcible to himself. Indeed, he never conversed with his family, unless deprived of his book. This occurred on the occasion when Sally carried the momentous news of her mother's intended marriage to Ladbroke Grove Road, the second day after they had talked till two in the morning. Matrimony was canvassed and discussed in all its aspects, and the particular case riddled and sifted and elucidated from every point of the compass, without the professor being the least aware that anything unusual was afoot until Grotefend got in the mayonnaise sauce. "'Take your master's book away, Jenkins,' said the lady of the house, and Jenkins, the tender-hearted parlour-maid, allowed master to keep hold just to the end of the sentence. "'Take it away, as I told you, and wipe that sauce off.' 
Sally did so want to box that woman's ears. At least, she said so after. She was a great, horny, overbearing woman, was Mrs. Sales Wilson, and Sally was frightened lest Letitia should grow like her. Only Tishy's teeth never could get as big as that, nor wiggle. The Professor, being deprived of his volume, seemed to awake compulsorily, and come out into a cold, unlearned world. But he smiled amiably, and rubbed his hands round themselves rhythmically. "'Well, then,' he said, "'say it all again.' "'Say what, papa?' "'All the chatter, of course.' "'What for, papa?' "'For me to hear. Off we go. Who's going to be married?' "'You see, he was listening all the time. I shouldn't tell him if I were you. Your father is really unendurable, and he gets worse.' Thus the lady of the house. "'What does your mother say?' There is a shade of asperity in the professor's voice. "'Says you were listening all the time, papa. So you were.' This is from Letitia's younger sister, Theeny. Her name was Athene. Her brother Edgerton called her Gallows Athene, an offensive perversion of the name of the lady she was called after. Her mother had carefully taught all her children contempt for their father from earliest childhood. But toleration of his weaknesses— etymology and so on, had taken root, in spite of her motherly care, and the professor was on very good terms with his offspring. He negatived Theeny amiably. "'No, my dear, I was like Mrs. Cluppins. The voices were loud and forced themselves upon my ear, but as you all spoke at once I have no idea what anybody said. My question was conjectural, purely conjectural. Is anybody going to marry anybody? I don't know.' "'What is your father talking about over there?' Is he going to help that tongue or not? Ask him. For a peculiarity in this family was that the two heads of it always spoke to one another through an agent. So clearly was this understood that direct speech between them, on its rare occasions, was always ascribed by distant hearers to an outbreak of hostilities. If either speaker had addressed the other by name, the advent of the sergeant-at-arms would have been the next thing looked for. On this occasion, Letitia's literal transmission of, "'Are you going to help the tongue or not, papa?' recalled his wandering mind to his responsibilities. Sally's liver-wing, she was the visitor, was pleading at his elbow for its complement of tongue. But soon a four-inch space intervened between the lonely tongue-tip on the dish and what had once been, in military language, its base of operations. Everybody that took tongue had got tongue. "'Well, then, how about who's married whom?' Thus the professor, resuming his hand-rubbing, and neglecting the leg of a fowl. "'Make your father eat his lunch, Letitia. We cannot be late again this afternoon.' Whereon everyone ate too fast, and Sally felt very glad the professor had given her such a big slice of tongue, as she knew she wouldn't have the courage to have a second supply, if offered, much less ask for it. "'Do you hear, papa?' "'I'm going to make you eat lunch,' says Letitia, and her mother murmurs, "'That's right, make him,' as though he were an anaconda in the snake-house, and her daughter a keeper, who could go inside the cage. Letitia then adds briefly that Mrs. Nightingale is going to marry Fenwick. "'Ah! Mercy on us,' says the Professor, quite vaguely, and even more so adds, "'Chicken, chicken, 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 chicken.' Though what he says next is more intelligible, it is unfortunate and ill-chosen. And who is... Mrs. Nightingale? The Sphinx is mobility itself, compared with Mrs. Wilson's intense preservation of her status quo. The import of which is that the Professor's blunders are things of everyday occurrence, every minute, rather. She merely says to Europe, You see and leaves the continent to deal with the position. Sally, who always gets impatient with the Wilson family, except the Professor himself and Letitia, though she is trying sometimes, now ignores Europe, and gets the offender into order on her own account. "'Why, Professor dear, don't you know? Mrs. Nightingale's my mother. I'm Sally Nightingale, you know?' "'I'm not at all sure that I did, my dear. I think I thought you were Sally something else.' My mind is very absent sometimes. You must forgive me. Sally Nightingale, to be sure. Never mind, Professor dear. But the Professor still looks vexed at his blunder, so Sally says in confirmation, 
I've forgiven you, shake hands, and doesn't make matters much better, for her action seems unaccountable to the absent-minded one, who says, Why? first, and then, Oh, uh, yes, I see. Shake hands, certainly. On which the Sphinx, at the far end of the table, wondered whether the ancient Phoenicians were rude, under her breath. "'I'm so absent, Sally Nightingale, that I didn't even know your father wasn't living.' Letitia looks uncomfortable, and when Sally merely says, "'I never saw my father,' thinks to herself what a very discreet girl Sally is. Naturally, she supposes Sally to be a wise enough child to know something about her own father, but the Wilson family were not completely in the dark about an unsatisfactory something queer in Sally's extraction, so that she credits that unconscious young person with having steered herself skilfully out of shoal waters. But she is not sure whether to class her achievement as intrepidity or cheek. She is wanted in the intelligence department before she can decide this point. Perhaps if you try, Letitia, you'll be able to make out whether your father is or is not going to eat his lunch. But as this appeal of necessity causes the professor to run the risk of choking himself before Letitia has time to formulate an inquiry, she can fairly allow the matter to lapse, as far as she is concerned. The dragon, her mother, for that was how Sally spoke of the horny one, kept an eye firmly fixed on the unhappy honorary member of most learned societies, and gave the word of command. Take away, with such promptitude, that Jenkins nearly carried off the plate from under his knife and fork as he placed them on it. A citation from the Odyssey was received in stony silence by the dragon, who, however, remarked to her younger daughter that it was no use talking about Phineas and the Harpies, because they had to be at St. Pancras at 3.10 or lose the train. And perhaps, if the servants were to be called Harpies, your father would engage the next one himself. They were enough trouble now without that. Owing to all which, the reference to Sally's father got lost sight of, and she wasn't sorry, because Thene, at any rate, wasn't wanted to know anything about him, whatever Letitia and her mother knew or suspected. But as a matter of fact, Sally's declaration that she never saw him was neither discretion, nor intrepidity, nor cheek. It was simple nature. She had always regarded her father as having been accessory to herself before the fact, also as having been, for some mysterious reason, unpopular, perhaps a mauvais sujet, but he was ancient history now, had joined the Phoenicians. Why should she want to know? Her attitude of uninquiring acquiescence had been cultivated by her mother, and it is wonderful what a dominant influence from early babyhood can do. Sally seldom spoke of this mysterious father of hers in any other terms than those she had just used. She had never had an opportunity of making his acquaintance, that was all. In some way, undefined, he had not behaved well to her mother, and naturally she sided with the latter. Once, and once only, her mother had said to her, "'Sally, darling, I don't wish to talk about your father, but to forget him. I have forgiven him because of you, because how could I have done without you, kitten?' And thereafter, as Sally's curiosity was a feeble force, when set against the possibility that its gratification might cause pain to her mother, she suppressed it easily. But now and again little things would be said in her presence that would set her a-thinking, little things such as what the professor had just said. She may easily have been abnormally sensitive on the point, made more prone to reflection than usual by last night's momentous announcement. Anyhow, she resolved to talk to Tishy about her parentage as soon as they should get back into the drawing-room where they were practising. All the two hours they ought to have played in the morning, Tishy would talk about nothing but Julius Bradshaw. And look how ridiculous it all was, because she did call him shop-boy. You know she did, only six weeks ago. Sally didn't see why her affairs shouldn't have a turn now, and although she was quite aware that her friend wanted her to begin again where they had left off before lunch, she held out no helping hand, but gave the preference to her own thoughts. "'I suppose my father drank,' said Sally to Tishy. Well, "'If you don't know, dear, how should I?' said Tishy to Sally, and that did seem plausible, and made Sally the more reflective. 
The holly leaves were gone now that had been conducive to thought at Christmas, in this same room, where we heard the two girls count four so often. But Sally could pull an azalea flower to pieces over her cogitations, and did so instead of tuning up forthwith. Letitia was preoccupied, couldn't take an interest in other people's fathers, nor her own for that matter. She tuned up, though, and told Sally to look alive. But while Sally looks alive she backs into a conversation of the forenoon, and out of the pending discussion of Sally's paternity. Their two preoccupations pull in opposite directions. "'You will remember not to say anything, won't you, Sally, dear? Do promise.' "'Say anything? Oh, no, I shan't say anything. I never do say things. What about?' "'You know as well as I do, dear, about Julius Bradshaw?' "'Of course I shan't, Tishy. Except Mother, she doesn't count. I say Tishy. "'Well, dear, do look alive. I'm all ready. "'All right, don't be in a hurry. I want to know whether you really think my father drank.' "'Why should I, dear? I never heard anything about him. At least I never heard anything myself. Mamma heard something, only I wasn't to repeat it. Besides, it was nothing whatever to do with drink.' The moment Letitia said this, she knew that she had lost her hold on her only resource against cross-examination. When the difficulty of concealing anything is thrown into the same scale with the pleasure of telling it, the featherweights of duty and previous resolutions kick the beam. Then you are sorry when it's too late. Letitia was, and could see her way to nothing but obeying the direction on her music, which was attacka. To her satisfaction, Sally came in promptly at the right place, and a first movement in B-sharp went steadily through without a backlash. There seemed a chance that Sally hadn't caught the last remark, but alas, it vanished. "'What was it, then, if it wasn't drink?' said she, exactly as if there had been no music at all. Letitia once said of Sally that she was a horribly direct little Turk. She was very often, in this instance, certainly. "'I suppose it was the usual thing?' Twenty-four, of course, knew more than nineteen, and could speak to the point of what was and wasn't usual in matters of this kind, but if Letitia hoped that vagueness would shake hands with delicacy, and that details could be lubricated away, she was reckoning without her Turk. "'What is the usual thing?' "'Hadn't we better go on to the fugue? I don't care for the next movement, and it's easy.' "'Not till you say what you mean by the usual thing. "'Well, dear, I suppose you know what half the divorce cases are about. "'Tishy!' "'What, dear? There was no divorce. "'How do you know, dear? I should have known of it. "'How do you know that? "'You might go on for ever that way. "'Now, Tishy, dear, do be kind and tell me what you heard and who said it. "'I should tell you.' You know I should. This appeal produces concession. It was old Major Roper, told Mamma, with blue pockets under his eyes and red all over, creaks and wheezes when he speaks. Do you know him? No, I don't, and I don't want to. At least, I've just seen him at a distance. I could see he was purple. Our Major, Colonel Lund, you know, says he's a horrible old gossip, and you can't rely on a word he says. But what did he say? "'Well, of course, I oughtn't to tell you this, because I promised not. "'What he said was that your mother went out to be married to your father in India, "'and the year after he got a divorce, "'because he was jealous of some man your mother had met on the way out. Well, "'How old was I? "'Gracious me, child, how should I know? "'He only said you were a baby in arms. "'Of course you must have been, if you think of it.' Letitia here feels that possible calculations may be embarrassing— and tries to avert them. Do let's get on to the third movement. We shall spend all the afternoon talking. Very well, Tishy, far away. Oh, no, it's me. And the third movement is got under way, till we reach a pizzicato passage, which Sally begins playing with the bow by mistake. That's Pitts, says the first violin, and we have to begin again at the top of the page, and the professor in his library wonders why on earth those girls can't play straight on. The ancient Phoenicians are fidgeted by the jerks in the music. But it comes to an end in time, and then Sally begins again. I know that story's all nonsense now, Tishy. Why? Because Mother once told me that my father never saw me. So come now. 
because the new bornest babe that ever was couldn't be too small for its father to see. Sally pauses reflectively, then adds, unless he was blind, and mother would have said if he'd been blind. Well, he couldn't have been blind, because now, Tishy, you see, you're keeping back lots of things that that old wheezy squeaker said, and you ought to tell me you know you ought. Why couldn't he? You're in such a hurry, dear, I was going to tell you. Major Roper said he never saw him but once, and it was out shooting tigers, and he was the best shot for a civilian he'd ever seen. There was a tiger that was just going to lay hold of a man and carry him off, when your father shot him from two hundred yards off. The man or the tiger? I'm on the tiger's side. I always am. The tiger, stupid! You wouldn't want your own father to aim at a tiger and hit a man. Sally reflects. I don't think I should. But I say, Tishy, do you mean to say that Major Roper meant to say that he was out shooting with my father, and I didn't know what his name was? Oh, no. He said his name, of course. It was Palliser. That was right, wasn't it? Oh, dear, no. It was Greythorpe. Palliser, indeed. It was true about the tiger, though, because Major Roper says he's got the skin himself now. Only it wasn't my father that shot it. That's quite clear. Sally was feeling greatly relieved, and showed it in the way she added, Now, doesn't that just show what a parcel of nonsense the whole story is? Sally had never told her friend about her mother's name before she took that of Nightingale. Very slight hints had sufficed to make her reticent about Greythorpe. Colonel Lund had once said to her, "'Of course your mother was Mrs. Greythorpe when she came to England. That was before she changed her name to Nightingale, you know.' She knew that her mother's money had come to her from a grandfather Nightingale, whose name had somehow accompanied it, and had been, very properly as it seemed to her, bestowed on herself as well as her mother. They were part and parcel of each other, obviously. In fact, she had never more than just known of the existence of the name Greythorpe in the family at all, and it had been imputed by her to this unpopular father of hers, and put aside, as it were, on a shelf with him. Even if her mother had not suggested a desire that the name should lapse, she herself would have accepted its extinction on her own account. But now this name came out of the past as a consolation. Palliser, indeed. How could Mamma have been Mrs. Greythorpe if her husband's name had been Palliser? Sally was not wise enough in worldly matters to know that divorced ladies commonly fall back on their maiden names, and she had been kept, or left, so much in the dark that she had taken for granted that her mother's had been Nightingale that, in fact, she had retaken her maiden name at her father's wish, possibly as a censure on the misbehaviour of a husband who drank or gambled or was otherwise reprobate. Her young mind had been manipulated all one way, had been in contact only with its manipulators. Had she had a sister or brother, they would have canvassed the subject, speculated, run conclusions to earth and demanded enlightenment. She had none but her mother to go to, unless it were Colonel Lund, and the painful but inevitable task of both was to keep her in the dark about her parentage at all hazards. "'If ever,' said the former to the latter, "'my darling girl has a child of her own, I may be able to tell her her mother's story. Till then it would be impossible.' Sally had had a narrow escape of knowing more about this story, when the veteran sub-dean qualified himself for an obituary in the Times, which she chanced upon and read before her mother had time to detect and suppress it. Luckily, a reasonable economy of type had restricted the names and designations of all the wives he had driven tandem, and no more was said of his third than that she was Rosalind, the widow of Paul Nightingale. So as soon as Sally's mother had read the text herself, she was able to say to the Major, quite undisturbedly, that the old sub-dean had gone at last, leaving thirteen children. The name Greythorpe had not crept in. But we left Sally with a question unanswered. Didn't that show what nonsense old Major Roper's story was? Letitia was rather glad to assent and get the story quashed, or at least prorogued sine die. It did seem rather nonsense, Sally, dear. Major Roper was a stupid old man, and evidently took more than was good for him. Intoxicants are often of great service in conversation. 
In this case they contributed to the reinstatement of Mr. Bradshaw. Dear me, it did seem so funny to Sally. Only the other day this young man had been known to her on no other lines than as an established fool, who came to stare at her out of the corners of his dark eyes all through the morning service at St. Satisfax. And now it was St. John's Ladbroke Grove Road, and what was more, he was being tolerated as a semi-visitor at the Wilsons, a visitor with explanations in an undertone. This was the burden of Letitia, as soon as she had contrived to get Sally's troublesome parent shelved. Why Mamma always needs to be in such a furious fuss to drag in his violin, I do not know, as if he needed to be accounted for. Of course, if you ask a Hottentot to evenings, you have to explain him, but the office staff at Catley's, which is really one of the largest firms in the country, are none of them Hottentots, but the contrary. Now, I know, dear, you're going to say, what's the contrary of a Hottentot, and all the while you know perfectly well what I mean. Cut away, Tishy. What next? Well, next, don't you think it very dignified of Mr. Bradshaw to be able to be condescended to and explained in corners under people's breaths, and not to show it? He's got to lump it if he doesn't like it. Sally, you see, has given up her admirer readily enough, but, as she herself afterwards said, it's quite another pair of shoes when you're called on to give three cheers for what's really no merit at all. What does the young man expect? Now that's unkind, Sally dear. You wouldn't like me to. Anyhow, that's what Mamma does. Takes ladies of a certain position, or with expectations, into corners, and says she hates the expression gentleman and lady, but they know what it means. I know, and they goozle comfortably at her like Goody Vereker. Doesn't it make one's flesh creep to have a mother like that? I do get to hate the very sight of shot silk and binoculars on a leg when she goes on so. But I suppose we never shall get on together, Mamma and I. What does the Professor think about him? Oh, Papa! Of course, Papa's perfectly hopeless. It's the only true thing Mamma ever says, that he's perfectly hopeless. What do you suppose he did that Sunday afternoon, when Julius Bradshaw came and had tea and brought the Strad? The first time, I mean. Why, he actually fancied he had come from the shop with a parcel, and never found out he couldn't have when he had tea in the drawing-room, and only suspected something when he played Rhodes' air with variations for violin and piano. Just fancy! He wanted to know why he shouldn't have tea when everyone else did, and offered him cake. And Sunday afternoon, and a Stradivarius. Do say you think my parents trying, Sally dear. Sally assented to everything in an absent way, but that didn't matter as long as she did it. Letitia only wanted to talk. She seemed, thought Sally, improved by the existing combination of events. She had had to climb down off the high stilts about Bradshaw, and had only worked in one or two slight grundulations, a word of Dr. Vereker's, into her talk this morning. Tishy wasn't a bad fellow at all, Sally's expression, only if she hadn't been taught to strut, she wouldn't have been any the worse. It was all that overpowering mother of hers. Before she parted with her friend that afternoon, Sally had a sudden access of Turkish directness. Tishy, dear, are you going to accept Julius Bradshaw if he asks you, or not? Well, dear, you know we must look at it from the point of view of what he would have been if it hadn't been for that unfortunate nervous system of his. The poor fellow couldn't help it. "'But are you or not? That's what I want an answer to. "'Sally, dear, really, you're just like so much dynamite. "'What would you do yourself if you were me? I ask you.' "'I should do exactly whatever you settle to do if I were you. "'It stands to reason. But what's it going to be? That's the point. "'He hasn't proposed yet. "'That has nothing whatever to do with it. "'What you've got to do is make up your mind.' These last four words are very staccato indeed. Tishy recovers a dignity she has rather been allowing to lapse. By the time you're my age, Sally dear, you'll see that there are ways and ways of looking at things. Everything can't be wrapped up in a nutshell. We're not ancient Phoenicians nowadays, whatever Papa may say. But you're a dear, impulsive little puss. 
The protest was feeble in form and substance, and quite unworthy of Miss Sales Wilson, the daughter of the Professor Sales Wilson. No wonder Sally briefly responded, "'Stuff and nonsense!' and presently went home. Of course the outer circle of Mrs. Nightingale's society, for in this matter we are all like Regent's Park, had their say about her proposed marriage. But they don't come into our story, and besides they had too few data for their opinions to be of any value. What a difference it would have made if old Major Roper had met Fenwick and recalled the face of the dead shot who, it seemed, had somehow ceded his tiger-skin to him. But no such thing happened, nor did anything else come about, either to revive the story of the divorce, or to throw a light on the identity of Palliser and Fenwick. Eight weeks after the latter, or the former, had for the second time disclosed his passion to the same woman, the couple were married at the church of St. Satisfax, and having started for the continent the same afternoon, found themselves quite unreasonably happy, wandering about in France, with hardly a thought beyond the day at most, so long as a letter came from Sally at the post restant when expected. And he had remembered nothing. End of chapter 15《ハッピーバースデーリーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバー And thus it came about that Rosalind Palliser, nay Greythorpe, stood for the second time at the altar of matrimony with the same bridegroom under another name. The absence of bridesmaids pronounced and accented the fact that the bride was a widow, though as there were very few of the congregation of St. Satisfax who did not know her as such, the announcement was hardly necessary. Discussion of who her late husband was, or was not, had long since given way to a belief that he was a bad lot, and that the less that was said about him the better. If any one who was present at the wedding was still constructing theories about his identity, whether he had divorced his wife, or was divorced himself, or was dead, certainly none of those theories connected themselves with the present bridegroom. As for Sally, her only feeling— over and above her ordinary curiosity about her father, was a sort of paradoxical indignation that his intrusion into her mother's life should have prevented her daughter figuring as a bridesmaid. It would have been so jolly. But Sally was perfectly well aware that widows, strong-nerved from experience, stand in no need of official help in getting their things on, and acquiesced perforce in her position of a mere unqualified daughter. The Major, that is to say, Colonel Lund, stayed on after the wedding, under a sort of imputation of guardianship necessary for Sally, an imputation accepted by her in order that the old boy should not feel lonesome, far more than for any advantage to herself. She wasn't sure it did him any good, though, after all, for the wedding party, if it could be called one, it was so small, having decided that its afternoon had been completely broken into, gave itself up to dissipation, and went to see Charlie's aunt. The old gentleman did not feel equal to this, but said if Sally told him all about it afterwards it would be just as good, and insisted on her going. He said he would be all right, and she kissed him, and left him reading Harry Lorica, or pretending to. The wedding party seemed to have grown, thought the Major, in contact with the theatrical world, when on its return it filled the summer night with sound, and made the one-eyed piebald cat who lived at the retreat foreclose an interview with a peevish friend acrimoniously. Perhaps it was only because the laughter and the jests, the good nights mixed with the echoes of Charlie's aunt, and reminders of appointments for the morrow, broke in so suddenly on a long seclusion that the Major seemed to hear so many voices beyond his expectation. The time had not hung heavy on his hands, though. 
at least no heavier than time always hangs on hands that wore gloves with no fingers near upon eighty years ago. The specific gravity of the hours varies less and less with loneliness and companionship as we draw nearer to the last one of all, the heaviest or lightest, which will it be? The old boy had been canvassing this point with another old boy, a real major, our friend Roper, at the Herkaroo Club not long before, and, after he had read a few pages of Harry Lorica, he put his spectacles in to keep the place, and fell back into a maze of recurrence and reflection. Was he honest, or was it affectation, when he said to that pursy and purple old warrior, that if the doctor were to tell him he had but an hour to live, he should feel greatly relieved and happy? Was his heart only pretending to laugh at the panic his old friend was stricken with, at the mere mention of the word death? He who had in his time faced death a hundred times without a qualm? But then that was military death, and was his business. Death, the civilian, with paragraphs in the newspapers to say the worst was feared, and fever being kept down, and the system being kept up, and smells of carbolic acid and hourly bulletins, that was the thing he shrank from. Why, the Major could remember old Jack Roper at Delhi, in the mutiny, going out in the darkness to capture those sepoy guns. What was the place called? Ludlow Castle? And now— "'Oh, damn it, Colonel! Why, good lard! Who's dying or going to die? Time enough to talk about dying when the cap fits. You take my advice and try a couple of cockles anti-bilious. My word for it, it's liver!' And then old Jack followed this with an earthquake attack of coughing, that looked very much as if the cap was going to fit, but came out of it incorrigible, and as soon as he could speak, endorsed his advice with an admonitory forefinger— you do as I tell you and try em. But the fossil, who was ten years his senior, answered his own question to himself in the affirmative as he sat there, listening to the distant murmur of wheels on the Uxbridge Road, and the music of the cats without. Yes, he was quite honest about it. He had no complaint to make of life, for the last twenty years at any rate. His dear little protégé, that was how he thought of Sally's mother, had taken good care of that. But he had some harsh indictments against earlier years, or rather had had, for he had dismissed the culprits with a caution, and put the records on a back shelf. He could take them down now, and look at them without flinching. After all, he was so near the end, what did it matter? There they all were, the neglected chronicles, each in its corner of his mind of his school days, a record with all the blots and errors worked into the text, and made to do duty for ornaments, not a blemish unforgiven. It is even so with us, with you, we all forgive our schools. Of his first uniform, and his first love, two records with a soil on each, for a chemical brother spilt sulphuric acid over the first, and the second married a custom-house officer. Of his first great cloud, for, if he did not quite forget his first love, he soon got a second, and even a third, a cloud that came out of a letter that reached him in camp at Rawalpindi, and told him that his father, a solicitor of unblemished character till then, had been indicted for fraudulent practices, and would have to stand his trial for misdemeanour. Of a later letter, even worse, that told of his acquittal on the score of insanity, and of how, when he went back two years after, on his first leave, he went to see his father in an asylum, who did not know him, and called him my lord, and asked him to bring his case before the house. Then of a marriage, like a dream now, with a wife who left him, and a child that died, and then of many colourless years of mere official routine, which might have gone on till he fell down in harness, but for the chance that threw in his way the daughter of an old friend in sore trouble and alone. Not until her loneliness and want of a protector on her voyage home suggested it did the harness come off the old horse, and then, as we have seen, followed the happiest fourth part of his life, as he accounted it, throughout which he had never felt so willing to die as he had done before. 
Rosalind Graythorpe grew into it as a kind of adopted daughter, and brought with her the morsel of new humanity that had become Sally, that would be back in an hour from Charlie's aunt. And now Rosie had found a guardian, and was provided for. It would be in no way amiss now for the Major to take advantage of death. There is so much to be said for it when the world has left one aching. His confidence that his protégé had really found a haven was no small compliment to Fenwick, for the latter, with his strange unknown past, had nothing but his personality to rely on, and the verdict of the Major, after knowing him twelve months, was as decisive on this point as if he had known him twelve years. "'He may be a bit hot-tempered and impulsive,' said he to Sally, "'but I really couldn't say if I was asked why I think so. It's a mere idea.' Otherwise, it's simply impossible to help liking him. To which Sally replied, borrowing an expression from Anne the housemaid, that Fenwick was a cup of tea. It was metaphorical and descriptive of invigoration. But the Major's feeling that he was now at liberty to try death after life, to make for port after stormy seas, had scarcely a trace in it of dethronement or exclusion from privileges once possessed. It was not his smallest tribute to Fenwick that he should admit the idea to his mind at all, that he might have gained a son rather than lost a daughter. At least he need not reject that view of the case, but it would not do to build on it. Unberufen, the Major tapped three times on the little table where the lamp stood, and Harry Lorica lay neglected. He pulled out his watch, and decided that they would not be very long now. He would not go to bed till he had seen the kitten. He usually spoke of her so to her mother. He had to disturb the kitten's cat, who was asleep on him, to get at the watch, who, being selfish, made a grievance of it, and went away piqued after stretching. Well, he was sorry, of course, but it would have had to come some time, and he hadn't moved for ever so long. "'I wonder,' half said, half thought he to himself, "'I wonder who or what he really is. If only we could have known.' Was I right not to urge delay? Only Rosie was so confident. Could a woman of her age feel so sure and be misled? It was her certainty that had dragged his judgment along a path it might otherwise have shrunk from. He could not know her reasons, but he felt their force in her presence. Now she was gone, he doubted. Had he been a fool, after all? "'Well, well, it can't be altered now, and she would have done it just the same, whatever I said. I suppose she was like that when she was a girl. I wish I had even seen that husband of hers. So odd that they should both be Algernon. Does he know, I wonder, that the other was Algernon?' For the Major had religiously adhered to his promise not to say anything to Fenwick about the old story. He knew she had told it or would tell it in her own time. Then his thoughts turned to revival of how and where he found her first, and as it all came back to him you could have guessed, had you seen his face, that they had lighted on the man who was the evil cause of all, and the woman who had abetted him. The old hand on the table, that had a little more strength in it than when it wore a hedger's glove nearly eighty years ago, closed with the grip of all the force it had, and the lamp-globe rang as the tremor of his arm shook the table. "'Oh, I pray God there is a hell!' came audibly from as kind a heart as ever beat. "'How I pray God there is a hell!' Then the stress of his anger seemed to have exhausted him, for he lay back in his armchair with his eyes closed. In a few moments he drew a long breath, and as he wiped the drops from his brow, said aloud to himself, "'I wish the kitten would come.' He seemed happier only from speaking of her, and then sat on and waited, waited as for a rescue, for Sally to come, and fill up the house with her voice and her indispensable self. Something of an inconsistency in the attitude of his mind may have struck across the current of his reflections, something connected with what this indispensable thing actually was, and whence. 
for his thoughts relented as the image of her came back to him. Where would those eyes be, conspirators with the lids above them and the merry fluctuations of the brows? Where would those lips be, from which the laughter never quite vanished, even as the ripple of the ocean's edge tries how small it can get but never dies outright? Where the great coils of black hair that would not go inside any ordinary oilskin swimming cap? Where the incorrigible impertinence and flippancy be we never like to miss a word of? Where, in short, would Sally be, if she had never emerged from that black shadow in the past? Easy enough to say that had she not done so, something else quite as good might have been. Very likely. How can we limit the possible to the conditional praetor pluperfect tense? But then, you see, it wouldn't have been Sally. That's the point. Sally's mother had followed such thoughts to the length of almost forgiving the author of her troubles. But she could not forgive him considered also as the author of her husband's. The Major could not find any forgiveness at all, though the thought of Sally just sufficed to modify the severity of his condemnation. Leniency dawned. Yes, yes, I was wrong to say that. But I couldn't help it. So said the old man to himself, but quite as though he spoke to some one else. He paused a little, then said again, Yes, I was wrong, but, oh, what a damned scoundrel, and what a woman! Then, as though he feared a return of his old line of thought, I wish Sally would come, and a dreadful half-thought came to him. Suppose there were a fire at the theatre, and I had to wire... Why, that would be the worst of all! So, almost without a pause between, he had prayed for a hell to punish a crime, and for the safety of the treasured thing that was its surviving record, a creature that but for that crime would never have drawn breath. His reading-lamp had burned out its young enthusiasm, and was making up its mind to go out, only not in any hurry. It would expire with dignity and leave a rich inheritance of stench. Meanwhile, its decadence was marked enough to frank the Major in neglecting Harry Lorica for the rest of the time, and also served to persuade him that he had really been reading. Abstention from a book under compulsion has something of the character of perusal. Gibbon could not have collected his materials on those lines, certainly, but the Major felt his conscience clearer from believing that he meant to go on where he had been obliged to stop. He cancelled Harry Lorica, put him back in the bookcase to make an incident, then began actively waiting for the return of the playgoers. Reference to his watch at short intervals intensified their duration, added gall to their tediousness, but so convinced was he that they would be here directly, that it was at least half an hour before he reconsidered this insane policy, and resumed his chair with a view to keeping awake in it. He was convinced he was succeeding, had not noticed he was dozing, when he was suddenly wrenched out of the jaws of sleep by the merry voices of the homecomers, and the loss of the piebald cat's temper, as aforesaid. "'Oh, Major, dear, you haven't gone to bed. You will be so tired. Why didn't you go?' "'I've been very happy, Chick. I've been reading Harry Lorica. I like Charles Lever, because I read him when I was a boy. What's a clock? He pulled out his watch with a pretense, easy of detection, that he had not just done so ten minutes before. It was a lie about Harry Lorica, you see, so a little extra didn't matter. It's awfully late, Sally testified, very nearly as late as it's possible to be, but now we're in for it we may as well make it a nocturnal dissipation. Anne, don't go to bed, at least not before you've brought some more fresh water. This will take years to hot up. Oh, Major, Major, why didn't you make yourself some toddy? I never go out for five minutes, but you don't make yourself any toddy. I don't want it, dear child. I've been drinking all day. However, of course, it was a wedding. But you must have some now, anyhow. Stop a minute. There's someone coming up on the doorsteps, and Anne's fastened up. No, it's not the policeman. I know who it is. Stop a minute and then presently the Major hears Sally's half of an interview, apparently through a keyhole. "'I shan't open the door. Two bolts and a key and a chain. The idea!' "'What is it? My pocky-anky? 
keep it. It won't bite you. Send it to the wash. No, really, do keep it if you don't mind. Keep it till Brahms on Thursday. Remember, good night. But it isn't quite good night, for Sally arrests departure. Stop! What a couple of idiots we are! What for? Why, because you might have stuffed it in the letterbox all along. And the incident closes on the line indicated. It was only my medical adviser, Sally says, returning with explanations. Found my wipe in the cab. Dr. Vereker? Yes, Dr. Him, exactly. We bawled at each other through the keyhole like Pyramus and Trilby. She becomes so absorbed in the details of the toddy that she has to stand a mere emendation over until it's ready. Then she completes. I mean, Thisbe. I wonder where they've got to. Pyramus and Thisbe? No, mother and her young man. No, I won't sit on you. I'll sit here, down alongside. So. Then I shan't shake the toddy overboard. Her white soft hand is so comforting as it lies on the Major's, on the chair arm, that he is fain to enjoy it a little, however reproachful the clock face may be looking. You can pretend your toddy is too hot almost any length of time, as long as no one touches the tumbler. Also, you can drink as slow as you like. No need to hurry. Weddings don't come every day. Was it very funny, Chick? Oh, wasn't it? But didn't Mamma look lovely? I've seen it twice before, you know. This last is by way of an apology for giving the conversation a wrench, but the Major didn't want to talk over the wedding, seemed to prefer Charlie's aunt. He dresses up like his aunt, doesn't he? Oh, yes, it's glorious fun. But do say you thought Mamma looked lovely. Of course she did. She always does. But, but had the others seen Charlie's aunt before? Tishy and her Bradshaw. Oh, yes, at least I suppose so. And Dr. Vereker? Of course he had, twice at least. The times we saw it, Mother and I, he went too. Well, there's nothing in that. We can only hope again our spelling conveys the way the word well was prolonged. Nothing at all. Why should there be? What a nice fellow Vereker is. My medical adviser. Oh, he's all right. Never mind him. Talk about mother. They must be very nearly at Reims by now. This is mere obedience to orders on the Major's part. He feels no real interest in what he is saying. How rum it must be, says Sally, with grave consideration. And the Major's what evolves that it means marrying a second husband. Going through it all over again when you've done it once before, continues this young philosopher. The Major thinks of asking why it should be rummer the second time than the first, but decides not to, and sips his toddy, and pats the hand that is under his. In a hazy, fossil-like way, he perceives that to a young girl's mind the rumness of a second husband is exactly proportionate to the readiness of its acceptance of the first. Unity is just as intrinsic a quality of a first husband as the colour of his eyes or hair. Moreover, he is expected to outlive you. Above all, he is perfectly natural and a matter of course. We discern in all this a sneaking tribute to an idea of a hereafter, but the Major didn't go so far as that. "'She looked very jolly over it,' said he, retreating on generalities. "'So did he.' Gaffer Fenwick, I should think so indeed. Well, he might. Then, after a moment's consideration, he looked like my idea of Sir Richard Grenville. It's only an idea. I forget what he did. Elizabethan, Johnny. What do you call him? Gaffer Fenwick? You're a nice, respectable young monkey. Well, he's not half a bad-looking fellow. Well set up. But none of this, though good in itself, is what Sally sat down to talk about. A sudden change in her manner, a new earnestness, makes the Major stop an incipient yawn he is utilising as an exordium to a hint that we ought to go to bed, and become quite wakeful to say, I will tell you all I can, my child. For Sally has thrust aside talk of the day's events, making no more of the wedding ceremony than of Charlie's aunt, with... Why did my mother and father part? You will tell me now, won't you, Major dear? Lying was necessary, inevitable, but he would minimise it. 
There was always the resource of the legal fiction. All babes born in matrimony are legally the children of their mother's husband. Can't men. He must make that his sheet-anchor. You know, Salikin, your father and mother fell out before you were born. And the first time I saw your mother, why, bless my soul, my dear, you were quite a growing girl. Yes, able to get a staff officer's thumb in your mouth and bite it. <laughs> Indeed you did. It was General Pellew. They say he's going to be made a peer. The Major thinks he sees his way out of the fire by sinking catechism in reminiscences. I can recollect it all as if it was yesterday. I said to him, Who's the poor pretty little mother, General? Because he knew your mother and I didn't. Don't you know, said he, she's Mrs. Graythorpe. I asked about her husband, but Pellew had known nothing except that there was a row and they had parted. The Major's only fiction here was that he substituted the name Graythorpe for Palliser. Next time I saw her, we picked up some acquaintance, and she asked if I was a Lincolnshire Lund, because her father always used to talk of how he went to Lund's father near Crowland when he was a boy. Stop a bit, said I, what was your father's name? Paul Nightingale, says she. Observe that nothing was untrue in this, because Rosie always spoke and thought of Paul Nightingale as her father. That was my grandfather. Sally was intent on accumulating facts, would save up analysis till after. The Major took advantage of a slight choke over his whisky to mix a brief nod into it. It was a lie, but then he himself couldn't have said which was nod and which was choke, so it hardly counted. He continued, availing himself at times of the remains of the choke to help him slur over difficult passages. He was the young brother of a sort of uh, <coughs> sweetheart of mine, <coughs> silly boyish business, a sort of calf love. She married and died, but he was her great pet, a favourite younger brother. One keeps a recollection of this sort of thing. The Major makes a parade of his powers of oblivion, and his failure to carry it out sits well upon him. Of course, my romantic memories. The Major smiles derision of love's young dream. Had something to do with my interest in your mother, but I hope I should have done the same if there had been no such thing. Well, the mere fact of your father's behaviour to your mother. He stopped short, with misgivings that his policy of talking himself out of his difficulties was not such a very safe one after all. Here he was, getting into a fresh mess, gratuitously. "'Mamma won't talk about that,' says Sally, "'so I suppose I'm not to ask you.' The Major must make a stand upon this, or the enemy will swarm over his entrenchments. Merely looking at his watch and saying it's time for us to be in bed will only bring a moment's respite. There is nothing for it but decision. "'Sally, dear, your mother does not tell you, because she wishes the whole thing buried and forgotten. Her wishes must be my wishes.' He would like to stop here, to cut it short at that, at once and for good. But the pathetic anxiety of the face from which all the memories of Charlie's aunt have utterly vanished is too much for his fortitude, and at the risk of more semi-fibs he extenuates the sentence. One day your mother may tell you all about it. She is the proper person to tell it, not me. Neither do I think I know it all to tell. You know if there was or wasn't a divorce? The Major feels very sorry he did not let it alone. I'll tell you that, you inquisitive chick, if you promise on honour not to ask any more questions. I promise. Honour bright. Honest Injun. That's right. Now, I'll tell you. There was no divorce, but there was a suit for a divorce instituted by him. He failed to make out a case. Note that the expression, your father, was carefully excluded. She was absolutely blameless, to my thinking at least. Now, that's plenty for a little girl to know, and it's high time we were both in bed and asleep. He kisses the grave sad young face that is yearning to hear more, but is too honourable to break its compact. "'They'll be at Reims by now,' says he, to lighten off the conversation. End of chapter 16
Chapter Seventeen of Somehow Good. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Chapter Seventeen. Sally's lark and how she took her medical adviser into her confidence after divine service. Though Sally cried herself to sleep after her interview with her beloved but reticent old fossil. Nevertheless, when she awoke next morning, and found herself mistress of the house and the situation, she became suddenly alive to the advantages of complete independence. She was an optimist, constitutionally, for it is optimism to decide that it's rather a lark to breakfast by yourself when you have just dried your tears you have been shedding over the loss of your morning companion. Sally came to this conclusion as she poured out her tea, after dispatching his toast and coffee to the Major in his own room. He sometimes came down to breakfast, but such a dissipation as yesterday put it out of the question on this particular morning. The lark continued an unalloyed, unqualified lark quite to the end of the second cup of tea, when it seemed to undergo a slight clouding over, a something we should rather indicate by saying that it slowed down passing through a station than that it was modulated into a minor key. Of course we are handicapped in our metaphors by an imperfect understanding of the exact force of the word lark used in this connection. The day before does not come back to us during our first cup at breakfast, whether it be tea or coffee. A happy disposition lets what we have slept on sleep, till at least it has glanced at the weather and knows that it's going to be cooler, some rain. Then memory revives, and all the chill inheritance of overnight. We pick up the thread of our existence, and draw our finger over the last knots, and then go on where we left off. We remember that we have to see about this, and mustn't be late at that, and that there's an order got to be made out for the stores. There wasn't, in Sally's case, certainly, because it was a Sunday. But there was tribulation awaiting her as soon as she could recollect her overdue analysis of the Major's concealed facts. She had put it off till leisure should come, and now that she was only looking at a microcosm of the garden seen through the window, and reflected upside down in the tea-urn, she had surely met with leisure. Her mind went back tentatively on the points of the old man's reminiscences as she looked at her own thoughtful face in the convex of the urn opposite, nursed in two miniature hands whose elbows were already becoming unreasonably magnified, though really they were next to nothing nearer. Just to think, the Major had actually been in love when he was young. More than once he must have been, because Sally knew he was a widower. She touched the shiny urn with her finger to see how hideously it swelled in the mirror. You know what fun that is. But she took her finger back because it was too hot, though off the boil. There was a blue bottle between the blind and the window pane, as usual. If he was the same blue bottle that was there when Fenwick was first brought into this room, he had learned nothing and forgotten nothing, like the old regime in France. He only knew how to butt and blunder resonantly at the glass, but he could do it as well as ever, and he seemed to have made up his mind to persevere. Sally listened to his monotone, and watched her image in the urn. "'I wish I hadn't promised not to ask more,' she thought to herself. "'Anyhow, Tishy's wrong. Nobody ever was named Palliser. That's flat. And if there was a divorce suit ever so, I don't care.' She had to stop thinking for a moment to make terms with the cat, who otherwise would have got her claws in the beautiful white damask and ripped. Besides, if my precious father behaved so badly to Mamma, how could it be her fault? I don't believe in Mother being in the least wrong in anything, so it's no use. This last filled out a response to an imaginary indictment of an officious Crown prosecutor. I know what I should like. I should like to get at that old Scroop, or whatever his name is, and get it all out of him. I'd give him a piece of my mind, gossipy old humbug. It then occurred to Sally that she was being unfair. No, she wouldn't castigate old Major Roper for tattling, and at the same time cross-examine him for her own purposes. It would be underhand. 
but it would be very easy if she could get at him to make him talk about it. She rehearsed ways and means that might be employed to that end. For instance, nothing more natural than to recur to the legend of how she bit General Pellew's finger, that would set him off. She recited the form of speech to be employed. "'Do you know, Major Roper, I'm told I once bit a staff officer's finger off,' etc. "'Or would it be better not to approach the matter with circumspection, but go straight to the point? "'You must have met my father, Major Roper,' etc., and then follow on with explanations. "'Oh, dear, how difficult it was to settle. "'If only there were any one else she could trust to talk to about it. "'Really, Tishy was quite out of the question, "'even if she could take her mind off her Bradshaw for five minutes, "'which she couldn't.' "'Of course there's prosy, if you come to that,' was the conclusion reached at the end of a long avenue of consideration, on each side of which referees who might have been accepted but had been rejected were supposed to be left to their disappointment. "'Only fancy making a confidant of old prosy. Why, he'd feel your pulse and look at your tongue just as likely as not.' But Dr. Vereker, thus dismissed to the rejected referees, seemed not to care for their companionship, and to be able to come back. At any rate, Miss Sally ended up a long cogitation with, "'I've a great mind to go and talk to Prosy about it, after all. Perhaps he would be at church.' Now, if this had been conversation instead of soliloquy, Sally's constitutional frankness would have entered some protest against the assumption that she intended to go to church as a matter of course. As she was her only audience, and one that knew all about the speaker already, she slurred a little over the fact that her decision to attend church was influenced by a belief that probably Dr. Vereker would be there. If she chose, she should deceive herself and consult nobody else. She looked at her watch as the open-work clock with the punctual ratchet movement had stopped, and was surprised to find how late she was. "'Comes of weddings,' was her comment. However, she had time to wind the clock up and set it going when she came downstairs again, ready for church. St. Satisfax's reverent vicar prided himself on the appropriateness of his sermons. So, this time, as he had yesterday united a distinguished and beautiful widow to her second husband, he selected for his text the parable of the widow's son. True, Mrs. Nightingale had no son, and her daughter wasn't dead, and there is not a hint in the text that the widow of Nain married again or had any intention of doing so. On the other hand, the latter had no daughter, presumably, and her son was alive. And as to marrying again, why? There was the very gist and essence of the comparison, if you chose to accept the cryptic suggestions of the reverend vicar and make it for yourself. The lesson we had to learn from this parable was obviously that nowadays widows, however good and solvent, were mundane and married again, while in the city of Nain, nineteen hundred years ago, they, being in holy writ, were, as it were, Sundane, and didn't. The delicacy of the reverent suggestion to this effect, without formal indictment of any offender, passes our powers of description. So subtle was it that Sally felt she had nothing to lay hold of. Nevertheless, when the last of the group that included herself and the doctor, and walked from St. Satisfax towards its atomic elements respective homes, had vanished down her turning, it was the large Miss Baker, as a matter of fact. Then Sally referred to the sermon and its text, jumping straight to her own indictment of the preacher. "'Why shouldn't my mother marry again if she likes, Dr. Vereker, especially Mr. Fenwick?' "'Don't you think it possible, Miss Sally, that the parson didn't mean anything about your mother, didn't connect her in his mind with—' "'With the real widow in the parable? Oh, yes, he did, though, as if mother was a real widow.' Now, the doctor had heard from his own widowed mother the heads of the gossip about the supposed divorce. He had pooh-poohed this as mere tattle, asked for evidence, and so on. But having heard it, it was not to be wondered at that he put a false interpretation on Sally's last words. They seemed to acknowledge the divorce story. 
He felt very unsafe, and could only repeat them half interrogatively, as if Mrs. Nightingale was a real widow. But with the effect that Sally immediately saw clean through him, and knew what was passing in his mind. "'Oh, no, Dr. Vereker, I wasn't thinking of that.' She faced round to disclaim it, turning her eyes full on the embarrassed doctor. Then she suddenly remembered it was the very thing she had come out to talk about, and felt ashamed. The slightest possible flush that framed up her smile and her eyes made her at this moment a bad companion for a man who was under an obligation not to fall in love with her, for that was how the doctor thought of himself. Sally continued, but I wish I had been, because it would have done instead. The young man was really, at the moment, conscious of very little beyond the girl's fascination, and his reply, instead of what, was a little mechanical. I mean, instead of explaining what I wanted you to talk about special. But when I spoke, you know, just now, about a real widow, I meant a real widow that... that wids. You know what I mean. Don't laugh. "'All right, Miss Sally, I'm serious.' The doctor composes a professional face. "'I know perfectly what you mean.' He waits for the next symptom. "'Now, Mother never did wid, and never will wid, I hope. She hasn't got it in her bones.' And then Miss Sally stopped short, and a little extra flush got time to assert itself. But a moment after she rushed the position without a single casualty— "'I want to know what people say, when I'm not there, about who my father was, and why he and mother parted, and I'm sure you can tell me, and will. It's no use asking Tishy Wilson any more about it.' Observe the transparency of this young lady. She wasn't going to conceal that she had talked of it to Tishy Wilson, not she. Dr. Vereker, usually reserved but candid with all, becomes— under the infection of Sally's frankness, candid and unreserved. "'People haven't talked any nonsense to me. I never let them. But my mother has repeated to me things that have been said to her. She doesn't like gossip, you know.' And the young man really believes what he says, because his mother has been his religion. Just consider. "'I know she doesn't.' Sally analyses the position, and decides on the fib in the twinkling of an eye. She is going to make a son break a promise to his mother, and she knows it, so she gives him this as a set-off. "'But people will talk to her, of course. Shall I get her to tell me?' The doctor considers, then answers. "'I think, Miss Sally, unless you particularly wish the contrary, I would almost rather not—' Mother believed the story all nonsense, and was very much concerned that people should repeat such silly tattle. She would be very unhappy if she thought it had come to your ears through her repeating it in confidence to me. "'Perhaps you would really rather not tell it, Doctor?' Disappointment is on Sally's face. "'No. As you have asked me, I prefer to tell it. Only you won't speak to her at all, will you?' "'I really won't. You may trust me.' "'Well, then, it's really very little, when all's said and done. "'Somebody told her. "'I won't say who it was. "'You don't mind?' "'Sally didn't. "'Told her that your father behaved very badly to your mother, "'and that he tried to get a divorce from her, and failed, "'and that after that they parted by mutual consent, "'and he went away to New Zealand, when you were quite a small baby. "'Was that quite all?' "'That was all mother told me.' I'm afraid I rather cut her short by saying I thought it was most likely all unfounded gossip. Was any of it true? But I've no right to ask questions. Oh, Dr. Vereker, no, that wouldn't be fair. Of course, when you are asked to tell, you are allowed to ask. Everyone always is. Besides, I don't mind a bit telling you all I know. Only you'll be surprised at my knowing so very little. And then Sally, with a clearness that did her credit, repeated all the information she had had, all that her mother had told her, what she had extracted from Colonel Lund with difficulty, and lastly, but as the merest untrustworthy hearsay, the story that had reached her through her friend Letitia. In fact, she went the length of discrediting it altogether as 
only Goody Wilson when all was said and done. The fact that her mother had told her so little never seemed to strike her as strange or to call for comment. It was right that it should be so, because it was in her mother's jurisdiction, and what she did or said was right. Cannot most of us recall things unquestioned in our youth that we have marvelled at our passive acceptance of since? Sally's mother's silence about her father was ingrained in the nature of things, and she had never speculated about him so much as she had done since Professor Wilson's remark across the table had led to Letitia's tale about Major Roper and the tiger-shooting. Sally's version of her mother's history was comforting to her hearer on one point. It contained no hint that the fugitive to Australia was not her father. Now the fact is that the doctor in repeating what his mother had said to him, had passed over some speculations of hers about Sally's paternity. No wonder the two records confirmed each other, seeing that the point suppressed by the doctor had been studiously kept from Sally by all her informants. He, for his part, felt that the bargain did not include speculations of his mother's. "'Well, doctor?' Thus Sally, at the end of a very short pause for consideration. Verica does not seem to need a longer one. You mean, Miss Sally, do I think people talk spitefully of Mrs. Nightingale? I suppose I must say Mrs. Fenwick, now. Behind her back? Isn't that the sort of question? Sally, for response, looks a little short nod at the doctor instead of words. He goes on. Well, then, I don't think they do and I don't think you need fret about it. People will talk about the story of the quarrel and separation, of course, but it doesn't follow that anything will be said against either your father or mother. Things of this sort happen every day, with fault on neither side. You think it was just a row? Most likely. The only thing that seems to me to tell against your father is what you said your mother said just now, something about having forgiven him for your sake. Sally repeats her nod. Well, even that might be accounted for by supposing that he had been very hot-tempered and unjust and violent. He was quite a young chap, you see. You mean like... like supposing Jeremiah were to go into a tantrum now and flare up? He does sometimes. And then they were both to miff off? Something of that sort. Very likely they would have understood each other better if they had been a little older and wiser. Like us? says Sally, with perfect unconsciousness of one aspect of the remark. And then they might have gone on till now. Regret that they did not do so is on her face, till she suddenly sees a new contingency. But then we shouldn't have had Jeremiah. I shouldn't have fancied that at all. She doesn't really see why the doctor smiled at this, but adds a grave explanation. I mean, if I'd tried both, I might have preferred my step. But there they were at Glenmoira Road, and must say good-bye till Brahms on Thursday. Only the doctor did, as a matter of history, walk down that road with Sally as far as the gate with Krakatoa Villa on it, and got home late for his midday Sunday dinner, and was told by his mother that he might have considered the servants, she herself was, meekly, out of it. End of chapter 17